then set it to 1080p. And hopefully it remembers that. Hopefully it remembers it and or keeps the content in cache.
Uh, if people could, you know, don't be shy. Come fill in seats in the front. You don't need to hang out in the back. There's lots of room. And we're going to start in a minute. All right, all right. We're going to get started. So the really exciting thing um, for me about this year's JuliaCon is that I am not speaking at all. <laughs> so this is, this is the first time I've been up, up here and on a mic. Um, and I think it's a real you know, testament to the maturity of the project that we've gotten to the point where, you know, uh, None of the people who started the project have to be involved in the state of Julia. Like, this is, this is good. Um, well, also makes my week less stressful, so that's wonderful. Um, I mean, the, the, the people who are, the three guys who are giving this talk, I think they, they don't need much introduction. They're very, you know, prominent pillars of our community. Um, you know, Tim somehow runs a research lab and then some, and also hacks on, you know, Julia internals all the time. And he did a ton of work on the 1.9 release. Um, Valentin is at the MIT lab uh, and has, you know, been involved in getting releases out and supporting unusual platforms and doing all sorts of really interesting compiler work for, for many years now. Uh, and of course, Jameson is, you know, he was uh, at MIT and one of the first people forced to use Julia in Alan's class and somehow we suckered him into becoming a compiler expert instead of a physicist. Um, so I'm just gonna hand it over to them. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Tim Holy. I'm Valentin Shuravi, and we should say all three of us are not CS people originally. That's true. So we have <laughs> one neuroscientist, one cognitive scientist, and one physicist uh, doing compiler work. <laughs> also, uh, happy 10th uh, JuliaCon. We're very excited to be presenting, presenting that here. So. <clears throat> And in light of the fact that there may be members of the audience who are um, uh, less uh, familiar with some of the features of Julia, oh, I'm going to have to exit presenter view. Shoot, sorry, Jameson, uh, sorry. come to the rescue. Uh. <laughs> How do we start the video? <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> now it's decided to do. Yes. Okay, so uh, for, maybe for some, especially on YouTube, who aren't familiar with Julia, uh, the very bare basics, one of the most exciting things about Julia is it's an interactive language. That means we have a REPL that you can launch from the command line prompt. We also have an outstanding IDE based around VS code. And the interactivity of Julia makes code development a joy, right? So you can load packages, um, either that come from the rest of the world or ones that you've written yourself. You can get those packages to give you some data. You can inspect bits of data by printing the information about it at the REPL. You can also engage very, very powerful visualization tools to see your data in ways that would be extremely hard in a statically compiled language. If your code you discover at the moment of sort of playing with things has a bug in it, as long as you've loaded a package called revise, 
You can just hit a line in the stack trace that you think might contain the error, hit control Q, be taken immediately to the spot in the source code where the bug occurs, fix your error, save the file, go back the REPL, relaunch it, and then after a greatly zoom exasper or, or exaggerated delay, uh, your code reruns and you see the uh, final outcome of, of the operation. So it makes interactive, uh, organic development of your code uh, a real pleasure. One of the great things uh, that we see in the Julia Lab when we engage with scientists and engineers is uh, that they come to Julia first um, because they hear of the speed and then they stay for the community, for the language, and for the rest of the feature sets. So we need to talk briefly about speed. Um, despite being a dynamic language, Julia is fast. Um, it has been successfully used for large-scale HPC applications. Um, even 2017, Julia joined the Petaflop Club. Um, one of my favorite quotes of all time is from Katie, where she bemoans the fact that uh, porting her code from C++ to Julia on this GPU was too easy. Um, and of course, you can actually compete with native language with C, C++. You can write fast matrix multiply codes um, in Julia directly without having to go to a native language. Another noteworthy big picture feature of Julia is it's an extremely expressive language, and that lets you move mountains relatively easily. One of the favorite examples of mine that I've encountered in my own work is a task of taking a one terabyte uh, movie over time of three dimensional uh, volumetric images, um, and uh, what you're looking at moves over time, and so you want to uh, dynamically align it. You want to be able to send this aligned movie to a, to a, a visualizer. It would take you hours if you had to write that out to disk, but in Julia you can do this lazily. You can in other languages too. Um, and in, for example, in Python, there's a truly impressive, outstanding library called Dask. It's the work of hundreds of people, has received a lot of funding. It's about 12,000 lines of code excluding comments and all those kinds of things. Um, you can do the same thing from bare metal Julia in 12 lines of code. And I promise you, you'll be much happier with the Julia version because it runs about 40 times faster and is more flexible for future computations that you want to do on that, on that data set. Oh, sorry. No, this one's <laughs> me too. Sorry. Another one. Um, and then. I think one of the things that I'm really excited about as somebody who teaches especially newcomers to program is that I think Julia is getting easier and easier to recommend to newcomers. So it's always had some really exciting, or, or at least recently had really wonderful features, the ease of installation, a package manager to die for. Um, what has been a historical problem, which was l latency and sort of sluggishness, is getting a lot better. Um, and so, you know, I think that's lowering the barrier for people who have undemanding compute needs as well and being able to say, no, Julia's starting to get to be good even for that group of people. Um, it's getting, I think, increasingly easy to learn. There are more good learning materials. We're improving our error messages and things like that. One of the biggest areas I think that's still holding it back is that you can't always easily use Julia to write deployable code. And I think once we overcome that barrier, I don't think there will be any technical reason anymore not to say this should be the language of CompSci 101. And uh, Julia is a parallel language, so we will promise in this talk um, race conditions and uh, interruptions from multiple tasks running at the same time. <laughs> so let's talk about the new Julia features uh, that are coming. Um, it's been really interesting also to look at the um, development cycle of Julia. Um, some might know that in February 14, 2012, Viral published a blog post, Julia 1.0, that then quickly got renamed to Julia 0.1. <laughs> um, then over the many years, uh, you might look and think about when did you start using Julia. Um, we then had our first 1.0 release for real now, this time in 2018. And it was a long time support release. Then over the years, Releases have been coming at a steady rate. To, uh, 2021 is 1.6. It feels much longer ago. Like I feel like I've been living with 1.6 for like a decade now, um, which is the current um, long-term support release. Um, the most recent release was in May um, this year, 
And hopefully we'll see at least another release this year for 1.10. It's currently working its way through the um, release process, stabilization, making sure that we catch as many bugs as we can before we put it out to you. One of the interesting graphs to look at, this is the Julia uh, commit frequency on GitHub. And you see that there is a increase in contribution and then suddenly there's a decrease. And that sudden decrease is 1.0. And what it really meant is that the language was stable enough that we felt confident in saying, hey, by the way, we don't need to change this syntax or uh, that core feature every other day. Um, and people started building large-scale software projects on top of Julia. And that doesn't mean that Julia core development is unhealthy. It just means that a lot of the development has moved out of this repository into the ecosystem and in, uh, into all of the package work that the people have been doing. One of the big things we've heard from people over time is that latency is a really big issue. And so it's something we put a lot of work into in this release to make a lot better. There's kind of two, ki two types of latency that we were looking at. One is the time to load. So if you have a bunch of packages, whether or not you're using them, it costs some amount of time to get them loaded and into the REPL uh, so that you can start whatever process you're doing. And then the second part of that is once you've got all that loaded, actually starting to solve whatever problem you want. And so these were kind of the two key benchmarks that we were looking at this release. And you can see from the graph, we've made a really big increase uh, in a reduction in time for both of those. Um, so 1.8 loading plots uh, was 11 seconds. So it's kind of a lot to try to restart the REPL. Now in 1.10 alpha, we're looking at 1.5-ish seconds. And so it's just so much quicker, so much snappier to restart things. But even once that was started, in 1.8, it took another almost 10 seconds before you could see your plot. And that's come down even more to 0.3 seconds. So it's almost just right there as soon as you need it. Uh, this has been a bunch of different things that we've had to do to really get this to work. And so one of the major contributors to the latency was LLVM. We use LLVM because it's really effective at taking whatever high-level code people have written and turning it into something fast. But it takes a little while to do that, and that was a big contributor to the latency, and we didn't have a mechanism to store all of those results. So every time you restarted Julia, it would have to restart from no uh, context. Um, and now that we can... Uh, uh, save those in the background without any change in workflow, we can start up the packages much quicker, and then once they're started, the code is already ready to go. Uh, so that has been a really big reduction in the latency bottleneck. Uh, those are per package, so as you load and add new packages, uh, you only pay the incremental cost of the places that have changed, and then the rest of it is still there. So you can also develop things, have all of that loaded, and then only pay the cost for the additional compilation at the end. Uh, so this does come with some cost. There's additional latency when you install a package. You have to actually do all of this pre-compilation work. And there's been work to make that parallel so that you can get use of all of these big computers that we now have to do all of that work in parallel. And so um, in addition to all of that work, then because we made it harder for the compiler, we had to go make it easier, for, uh, faster to load all of that in. So someone created this package called Omni Package. It's not a functional package. It just loads nearly 500 packages from the ecosystem that all of you have written and it combines them together and just stresses out the load time and the runtime system as much as we can. And so uh, stressing it a lot was the uh, amount of time you could probably go make a coffee uh, in 1.8. Now uh, in 1.9, we should see about 37 seconds. Uh, but in 1.10, that's coming out uh, hopefully in the next couple months. Uh, we've cut that time down again, and we're still working on cutting it down some more. Uh, so we may be changing Jeff's workflow again. We'll see if he has time for email anymore. <laughs> All right. Now, um, it is worth saying that while the, the sort of core features that Julia needs to get rid of latency are starting to be fully in place. There is a little more work that can be done in core Julia, but I want to emphasize that the community can also play a big part in helping, especially pe people who don't know Julia, have a pleasant first user experience with Julia. And the idea basically is that packages should specify what they want to be fast.
fast for their users, right? And so, for example, if you're a, a, a developer or a user and you're discovering that 1.9 or 1.10 aren't solving the problem for you, you should take a look and see, spend a little time looking and see why. If a key package isn't loading a particular pa a package called pre-compile tools, that's a bit of a tell. Most packages that do demanding things should be using pre-compile tools to shorten latency. It's fairly simple to use. The idea is you include this package, it's really tiny, in as a dependency of your package. Towards the end of your module, typically at least, you put in a small snippet where you're essentially exercising the functionality of your package, right? And that's all you need to do. So this is an example from the data frames package where they just created a data frame and then did some stuff that many users do with data frames. And this took the latency of data frames down by something like, I believe, 20 to 30 fold just by adding these you know, 30 lines exercising 30 different things you could do with a data frame. So if you haven't looked at this for your packages and you're still unhappy with Julia's latency, you should look into the documentation and pre-compile tools. There are a lot of other tricks and uh, uh, that it can do. Uh, even as a user, if you're not going to contribute to packages or you're using very unusual combinations of packages, there are still things that locally you can do to improve uh, uh, your experience. So check the documentation for details on that. Another um, uh, exciting thing that has greatly contributed both to, I think, the quality of the Julia experience, but also helped reduce latency as well, is a new uh, feature uh, contributed by Christopher Carlson called package extensions. So these are sort of a mini package that gets loaded when some combination of packages um, is created. And these are designed to help different bits of, Ju of Julia code interact well together. Julie, one of Julia's sort of uh, a great contributions is the composability of the Julia ecosystem. It's a really extraordinary thing to behold. It's sort of hard to believe before you, know, before you start seeing it in action, but it's a really fantastic thing. But you, nevertheless, there are occasions where you have to do something custom for something you might not want to, including your package. So for example, you might have one package that has some cool things you can do, and another package that creates some nice objects. Um, these packages are completely independent of each other. Many times they can just be put together just fine, but if you need something special to be done and you try to, try to execute that and it throws you an error, um, then now, thanks to these package extensions, you can very pleasantly fix this. What you can do is you create a small mini package, in this case added to package A, that gets conditionally loaded if you happen to have package B in the system. So the user doesn't have to know what extra thing needs to be added, it just happens automatically. And now, um, uh, and, and now when you try this, it automatically works for the very first time. Now, in addition to just simply making things work as you might naively expect or hope. The other nice thing is, is that these package extensions have also greatly contributed to latency reduction. There was an older solution for this called requires.jl that some of you might have used, and, and it worked to solve the same problem, but package extensions really make things just a lot better. You can pre-compile the code that you want for this extension. It also loads more quickly. And so in, in many circumstances, we've gotten several fold accelerations just simply by switch migrating from requires to, to package extensions. One of the reasons why I'm really excited about package extensions is we, in the GPU ecosystem, we have many big uh, packages, and uh, it became really unpleasant to load AMD GPU, Metal.gl, OneAPI.gl, and uh, CUDA.gl into the same uh, project and uh, have to install them on the user's machine, and some of these come with, like, 500 megabytes, two gigabytes downloads that you need to have everything working. And with package extension, we now have the ability to let the user opt in into GPU acceleration and then automatically use it, but you can still write the code that you need to do in order to extend your package for GPU computing. If you want to learn more about this, there's a package called diffiqgpu.gl where we basically wrote a little blueprint of this and um, it now supports all of the different GPU packages without having to have them in the project .toml and load them unconditionally. Um, one other uh, great thing um, also Christopher has been working on is um, freeing our standard libraries. You might have had this exper experience um, of uh, uh, wanting to contribute to Julia and you looked at the standard library and you're like, oh, this could be a really easy fix, but it would take six to nine months for me to get that feature. 
Um, oh, I'm gone, just going to fork the standard library, <laughs> add my fix here, and uh, it's fine. No, we, what we really would like to be able to do is um, have standard libraries that come with Julia, bundled with Julia still, batteries are included, but they can be upgraded independently of Julia. And also faster bug fixes, all the Julia versions will get the bug fixes. Um, it will hopefully lower the barrier of entry to contributing. Um, they're no longer in the system image, so you don't have an unconditional cost there anymore. Um, and right now, we only have one example of this, but hopefully over the next couple of releases, and this is a call for contribution, um, we can get to a place where uh, Julia will eventually have all standard libraries, um, and even more, I have evil plans, be uh, rechargeable instead of run it, becoming stale over time. Um, who wants to type this one? I, yeah, I don't know what happened to that. Uh, so one of the other features that we have included in the new release, is, this is going to be 1.10, so not yet out, but is a new parser. The old one was, uh, has been great. It's been there since the beginning. Uh, but it had some lacking features that we really wanted. So one of them, the, one of the main reasons we wanted to do this is the old parser, if you had a syntax error, such as a missing, or a missing operand before your parenthesis, it didn't tell you which parenthesis it hit when it thought things were no longer parsable. The new one will print out exactly what line of code you had and then draw this little arrow that says, this is the parenthesis that you shouldn't have had there. Uh, go fix this point in your code. So that should really help uh, developers, uh, new and old, uh, to get into the language. And then additionally, there's new tools that are being developed on top of this. Because we have this ability to track exactly which statement and which uh, part of the statement went into the code, we can take code like this that you've written, you wonder, like, what is this code doing? And so uh, we have this tool uh, that you can use. It's several, uh, I don't know when it came out. Several years ago it came out. Uh, so it's called Cthulhu. It's a package that allows you to introspect the code but the way it introspected the code was this rather complicated, like whatever this core dot partial struct. Like there's things going on in here that you may not recognize from the original code. And now with the new parser, it allows it to figure out, okay, this expression that was generated internally actually mapped right back to the syntax that you had typed in. And so you can see it's the original code, but also with all of the types added. And you can see it returned any. And so then you could try to look back into why did this code return any, why is it slow, or what is it doing? Is this, is this also me? Yes. Okay. Um, not the only thing that uh, improved in the REPL, it turns out, this release. We've got new key bindings, so if you hit Alt-E, it'll take whatever you had currently typed into the REPL and say it was some very long, complicated expression you didn't think was going to get that big, and then it now suddenly is too big for your terminal. That pops open your favorite editor, and you can finish editing that using all of the normal features, and then when you save and close that, it puts it right back into the REPL where you were, so you can run that. You can change the contextual module, so if you're developing some package, you want to jump into that package so you can tweak it at the REPL. Uh, you can now do that if there's, uh, if you've used some notebooks in the past, you'll notice, you may have noticed they have a numbered prompt. Uh, Julia usually just has the, the word Julia as its prompt. You can now activate that in Julia so that you have a record of all of your past outputs, just has a global dictionary that stores all of the past outputs and you can index that. Uh, and finally, if you want an even fancier REPL, oh, my REPL has now gotten even more features. Uh, and so you can load that up, and it will extend some of the REPL things even further. Uh, tab completion is now powered up even more by Julia's inference system. So if you look closely at this code, there's a lot of dynamic behavior here. It's a dictionary. You can go and change this anytime you want. It's a dictionary any. So you have no idea what object type it has in it, and it has arrays of type any in there. And yet, when you index into this d1 of 2 dot, it knows that that was an imaginary number. And so it tells you what fields that imaginary number has and what methods it has without needing to assign temporary variables. Like, it's, it's very cool and clever. Uh, and a few more highlights. Uh, we're now at the point where uh, most or all of our binaries are developed and distributed through the Igrisil builder. So we have this custom cluster set up that we can 
manage and provide all of these binaries. And if you've ever looked at the build matrix for this, it is quite crazy how many different versions of combinations of packages and platforms that this has to build for. Uh, so shout out to them for maintaining all of that. Uh, and another cool feature that uh, has landed is now uh, getting globals and setting globals is just a function in the language. So you can poke into the language even more. It's just more friendly to uh, reflection and, and changes in testing and uh, so. Right, yes. Um, one thing that um, has been asked a lot um, and uh, was a lot uh, of work by uh, a bunch of people um, over the last two releases um, is improving the debugging and the profiling experiences. We have better integration with external tooling. So there's a tool called Tracy that you can uh, um, use to get timelines of what the runtime and what your program is doing. You can even instrument your own code and you can see, okay, the Julia scheduler is messing up here and here I'm mess um, my own code is messing up. Um, the similar integration, uh, better integration with into ViewTunes. Um, we are now disabling frame pointer optimization because it turns out they don't matter and they just make debugging and profiling worse. Um, you can get runtime insights, so uh, if your program is hanging, you can uh, send a SIG info, a SIG user one signal to the process. It will take a profile for a couple of seconds and then print out that profile the soonest possible moment. Um, if you are in GDB, you can even ask for, I want to see all of the backtraces that my tasks are having. And um, uh, with a lot of work, uh, the type system has gotten better, which powers our static analysis tools, jet.gl or our dynamic code exploration tool, Cthulhu. And so we try to make those more user friendly, but also we now have more information and we can tell you more about your code. Um, one of the other tools that we've worked on is a heap snapshot. Um, it's, it answers the question, where did all my memory go? So you say, you've been running the code for two weeks and you're wondering why do I have so much memory usage? You can ask for a heap snapshot, you can load it up in uh, the Chrome Dev tools. It's not the most pleasant experience, but you are able to answer the question. Um, the allocation profiler, um, I've seen a couple of talks during this conference where people even used it to figure out where are they creating memory allocations. One of the reasons why we needed this was that the previous tool that we had, track, dash dash track allocations, had false positives. And so people were look, using it and then coming to me and asking me, why is there an allocation? I'm like, there is no allocation. Okay. Well, but track allocation tells me there is an allocation. So it changed the generated code, the ch changing the generated code changes the optimization and therefore you get false positives. Um, it's a sampling profiler because otherwise we slow down your program too much. Um, but you can set the sampling rate to one and get every allocation, but be warned that will create gigantic profiles. I think it is the default. Though. No, 0 0.0.01. <laughs> <laughs> I think it changed. Um, uh, there's a, a library called pprof that you can use to generate these, um, uh, these flame graphs uh, to analyze it. and. Coming soon, TM, in Julia 1.11, we finally will have types for all allocations and you will no longer see unknown allocation for some types. Look familiar? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, for, for, for many uses, Julia has had, yeah, I would say, reasonable stack traces, but it's Julia's expressiveness and deep nestedness and specialization occasionally gave us real problems in our stack traces. And this is a pretty famous example uh, due to Chris Rikaukas. I'm actually showing you the first frame of the stack trace. <laughs> And only a third of the signature fits on this slide in five-point font, okay? So I, some people who are real Lisp aficionados may really like braces, but, <laughs> you know, the deep nesting here makes this, I think, a challenge for just about anybody. And we're pleased to report that in Julie 1.10, the entire first frame of that stack trace will look like this. You see the dot, dot, dots inside of the curly braces. It doesn't truncate the information all the time, only when it would be really big. Um, and so, and this is done in a nested way so that you can, it goes as deep as it can without filling up your REPL buffer, basically. Um, and so Jeff Bizanson um, uh, is, is the implementer of this feature. 
I want to talk a little bit now about things that aren't done. I want to talk about one of the most discussed at this Julia Khan. I think as we've sort of checked off other features, the discussions about what else we're missing keep going. They just shift in new topics. And one of the biggest new topics is static compilation. So to be clear, this is not yet done in Julia proper, at least. There is an excellent package called Static Compiler, which will do this in limited circumstances now. You can use it today. But I want to talk a little bit about what maybe at least some of the preliminary thoughts we're having about what this might look like in the future of Julia. So first of all, even the defining static compilation is a little hard because it means different things to different people. Um, what it means to me personally, at least, uh, if I wanted to say it in just a few words, it means shipping Julia without a compiler. Right? So the ability to ship Julia code that can run without the ability to, to compile on the user's machine. So what that means, of course, is you have to compile the code ahead of time and deploy that to your users. There are a number of possible uses of this, which is why there is so much discussion about this. One is, for instance, if you need to ship working applications to customers and you don't want to share your raw source code with them, that's one thing you can do. Another option, um, and I think many of us in the Julia committee look at some of the amazing work that's getting done in older languages to uh, provide fast things for slow languages. And it's really hard to look at some of those efforts and, and without thinking, gosh, it would be so much easier to develop all that code in Julia, right? And the big problem is we can't deploy it very easily from Julia to other languages yet. But you know, we want to be able to help our fellows, uh, you know, tool users of other languages write libraries that they can use that are really fast using Julia, and that keeps them productive using the tools that they're comfortable with. There are some things that, have, that people occasionally hope about static compilation that I want to assure you it's not. It's not a magical way to make Julia code super, super fast, right? Um, it's the same Julia code you know, that, that you would have in, you know, today. And it's not a way to avoid memory allocation. Currently, that's a limitation in the static compiler.jl. You have to have no me memory allocation for that to work, but that's not a feature that it contributes, nor is it necessarily a requirement of a future vision of static compilation. So again, there are many choices we could make about what we want static compilation to be. And I think one of the biggest ones is just, do we want to ship this small library that we call the Julia runtime? It's the thing that supports memory allocation, garbage collection, runtime dispatch, tasks, and other things like that. And the and you know basically everything but the compiler. Um, and you know, the static compiler.jl package has decided to go with the version without even the runtime. Um, I think the place that Julia proper, if I were to make a prediction, we're probably going to go with the Julia runtime library so that we can do things like allocate memory and collect the garbage and dispatch at runtime. There are certain elements of this vision which, at least in principle, don't seem too hard to pull off, right? And the reason for that is because Julia 1.9 already writes shared libraries for all of the package code, right? And so um, we could leverage that capability to write shared libraries that aren't Julia packages, right? And so what we would need is some sort of interface wrapper, a few, maybe, maybe more than a few changes to the actual core Julia source code. But but in the end, you could load a package that creates standard libraries. You could load your package that you want to turn into a standard library. And then simply by specifying a couple of essentially entry points into the library, um, th this instructs what you want to make callable by other languages or other applications then the code needed to support these operations could be written to the standard library. This is all, again, this is science fiction. This is in principle where I think it might go. Now, it's not sufficient just to add these entry points to the standard library because these things depend upon other functions, right? The, the my function that you're adding to the library might call a helper function, which, and many others, which in turn might call their own you know, utility functions, et cetera. And you need all of these to be inserted into that shared library if if it's to actually run successfully. Now, in a few circumstances, we think we can already do this, because when your code is fully inferable, we can use type inference to discover all of these helpers that are needed to support your code. So in principle, I think many of the pieces are nearly in place you know, for this vision already. There is, though, a hard problem. And the hard problem is, what do you do when inference fails, 
right? So when you don't know what type of argument is being passed to helper function, there might be you know, two, three, four, a hundred different methods of helper function, which methods should, should be inserted into that shared library, with what specializations if you want your code to run fast. And each one of the different methods of this thing might call their own different set of helper functions. So how do you go about discovering what needs to go into the shared library? And this is a much, much harder problem. And I think it's one that we're still having lots of discussions about what strategies do we have available to do the discovery needed here. Um, just to see, get a sense of why this is a pretty serious problem, right? Is what I did was I took a, a very well-developed Julia package. Uh, I stripped out its pre-compile workload and I copied four instructions from it um, as the four entry points to a fictitious shared library I wanted to deploy. And I recorded something called the inference frame gra uh, flame graph. Without going into details, each one of these stacks of boxes is a separate entrance into inference from runtime dispatch. So for each one of these vertical columns, you didn't know what that entire uh, stack of boxes was. Altogether, there were 192 separate entrances into inference via runtime dispatch and an unknown number of, of uh, 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 executions of previously inferred code from runtime dispatch. So the conclusion is that the vast majority of the code that you need to turn this into a shared library cannot be discovered from the entry points via inference. That's why this is a hard problem, but we have a few interesting ideas. It's going to take some time to develop those ideas, but stay tuned. I'm optimistic that we're going to make uh, maybe not, you know, complete progress on all aspects of this problem, but I think there will be a substantially good thing that will eventually arise from this, but we will see. Okay, let's... Let's change tag a little bit, little bit and let's uh, take uh, an update from the accelerated computing ecosystem. Um, the GPU ecosystem has seen a lot of development over the last year or so. Um, we now have much more robust um, support for a lot of the vendor libraries. Um, AMD GPU has done a lot of latency work and performance improvements. Um, CUDA got easier to install. Um, and uh, we now have um, major support in kernel abstractions for all of these backends so that you can write device independent code in Julia and then choose to deploy to whichever supercomputer you want. One caveat is, um, and we noticed this in a big uh, recent HPC application, is the latency improvements that are equivalent to what package image is now for Julia proper. They are yet to come. Hopefully they will materialize, but that is a lot of work, and we will see when that will happen. Viral is uh, uh, saying that um, the, one of the nice things about the GPU ecosystem in Julia is that it's the easiest to install. And I have heard this from multiple engineers within those companies that for the f they tried it out and they were surprised that they it just worked. None of the other stacks just work. One thing I'm really excited about, and there was a talk at the StudioCon um, about this, is that uh, Julia now runs on IPUs. This is a new kind of processor developed by Craftpore. It's a multi-instruction, multiple data processor with many cores. Um, we now have a working prototype of writing code in Julia and then compiling it to that target architecture and executing it. And we are the first programming language that is outside this Graphcore maintained ecosystem that is capable of doing that. And it's really a success story of how we are using and leveraging LLVM to make these kinds of targeting new and weird architectures possible. <laughs> and as uh, Chris is saying, one of the really nice things is that we can take in non-trivial packages from the Julia ecosystem and actually run it on the IPU without having to port them. Uh, one of them is being differential, uh, differential equations, um, and even you can do AD on these devices. All right, so a quick update to our threading roadmap. This is the slide that Jeff showed last year of where we felt like we were in progress. And then you can watch the checkbox checks change here. So we've taken some of the work that we did, and we feel like we did even more work, even better too. And other parts we've uh, finished that we didn't even have on the roadmap last year. 
And uh, so I think the one place we're still looking to improve is with the thread safety of the runtime system. We've gotten a lot done in the last few years, but we think there's still a few bits that we're still working on to get there. Uh, one of the significant improvements to multi-threaded code now has been garbage collection is multi-threaded. So if you're running a multi-threaded benchmark, in the past it would just switch to single-threaded to do the garbage collection. And if you have a bunch of threads allocating, it can take a lot of work for one thread then to do all of the garbage collection. With all of the threads working on it, that's no longer the bottleneck it used to be. We see some really significant improvements in performance on uh, a handful of benchmarks that we created basically just to stress the garbage collector and see how slow could we make it. Uh, and so there was versions of the code where you were getting 70 plus percent of your code was just spent running the garbage collector. And now that's down to 30% of the code. So much, much more reasonable. Now actually it's doing whatever the intended functionality of that code was. Um, Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, some very biased highlights um, uh, to finish out these talks. Um, we should congratulate all of you because you've been writing code and pushed, publishing packages, and um, we have 1,700 new packages since last year, 22,000 versions. What are you all doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we, uh, if you want to look into those details and if you want to figure out how we come up with these numbers, uh, there's a great uh, discourse post um, about the package download stats. And I think Mose also gave a talk um, about like, looking at the package ecosystem at this conference. Um, one highlight that I want to make is we now have Julia codes that are running at scale on some of the largest supercomputers in the world, targeting very diverse GPUs. So on the left graph here, we are targeting NVIDIA's GPU ecosystem, going up to about 2,000 GPUs. On the right-hand side, this is Europe's newest supercomputer, Lumi. Um, we are running on AMD's hardware. Um, we're up to 512 GPUs, and we are getting very nice parallel efficiency. That means we're making good use of the resources and we're not losing t um, time. Um, one of the things that has gotten me the most excited is when I see unintentional um, combi combinations of my projects. Um, so Paul Teed uh, gave this fantastic talk about um, accelerating black hole imaging. You might re remember the bus a couple of years back about this picture here on the left-hand side. And he mentioned that it take, took them about a week of compute on a cluster um, in C++. And then due to Julia and due to the availability of differentiable programming, he was able to get this down to a laptop, one thread, one hour. <laughs> Of course, it's, it's not just that Julia is magically faster, but um, more that it allowed for the development of better algorithms and using better tools to solve the problem. And uh, apparently, this is something new that I hadn't seen before, is that he's now going the next step and saying, well, now I have so much more compute time that I can waste. Uh, can we make the pictures even prettier? <laughs> and um, as I said, we only gave a very thin slice um, of what is happening in Julia. There are a lot of Julia organizations um, that work on different parts of the ecosystem where people come together and collaborate, and this is just some of them. Uh, at some point, they will no longer fit on a slide, and I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, so you mentioned a lot of things around, you know, improving, uh, uh, improving latency through pre-compilation, right? But one of the bigger issues, uh, one of the new issues that's come up because of that is increased pre-compilation times, right? So are there things in the pipeline for profiling pre-compilation and understanding what is taking time to pre-compile to be able to help packages to improve the pre-compilation times? Yeah. Yeah, so there are two things that happened. One of them is in Julia 1.10, we paralyzed um, the pre-compilation, which reduced the time if you have a parallel computer. If, you don't, if you're on a two-core laptop, I'm sorry. Um, and then uh, some of the work that Cody has been doing is about giving visibility into what we are actually doing at the runtime and what uh, methods are getting compiled and how much time is being spent. 
and um, I think we will get more and more insights, but the question is also how do we make those insights useful and actionable? Hi. Uh, like you mentioned, it's been, it feels like a decade since 1.6, right? <laughs> and uh, there have been quite a few releases since then in just uh, a few years. Uh, I use Julia in an enterprise uh, setting, and we need to stay on the long-term re uh, support release. So when do we get all these cool features in the next LTS release? No comment. <laughs> we, we've been having internal discussions, and Stefan is eager to jump in. Um, I think there will be one in the next couple of releases, but we will see which one precisely. So my, my comment is you don't use the LTS. It's, it's fine to use the LTS, but I think people are way too conservative about it. It's, it's very reasonable to be on the like, latest, you know, one of the latest releases. <laughs> the comment from the audience was that we had a user who has just moved from 0 0.4 to 1.0, uh, 1.6. <laughs> so uh, the performance improvements are important to everyone else in the room. Um, as a small-scale hobbyist programmer, the couple of things that I care about are being able to uh, have my documentation and my testing I'll work from a single environment rather than having to keep multiple manifests in sync. And um, the improvements to macro hygiene that Dave Moon suggested. I mean, so one of the things that has happened in 1.9 is there are actually additional tools for um, limiting the upgradability of versions of packages and their dependencies, so where it prioritizes reusing previously compiled versions of that. This is a user setting, so you can do some things yourself to try to, um, to, 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 try to uh, uh, you know, reduce that, that amount of pre-compilation time. With respect to changes in macro hygiene, I'm not really qualified to comment on that. I think that, I mean, one comment is simply is that deep changes like that don't sound like a Julia 1.0 feature because we do insist on backwards compatibility. Yeah. 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 This is Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Just yet to answer the second part of your question, the improvements to macro hygiene that David Moon suggested, uh, I don't know, years and years ago, uh, I have a prototype of macro expansion which does that. <laughs> there, there's a draft PR on juliasyntax.jl if people want to look. Um, it might work if you try it, but it might not. <laughs> Uh, hi, you said about freeing standard libraries, uh, so could we, uh, in the future, if we, if we don't want them, can we delete them? And will there be all numbered versions that, um, so that com you, you put in compat in your project to mode, so, and you, all, you also keep the compatibility for new Julia versions? So yes, um, we, they will just be like normal Julia packages. They will come with Julia because that's part of what um, users expect. They expect that using statistics actually works. Um, they will come with Julia, but they will be upgradable. You can pin them independently. You can switch versions independently, um, and that should all work, just like normal Julia packages. Uh, Last question. Uh, I'd, I'd like to know if there's been some plans for the debugger, because I, I, I've, I've used it and I find it a bit brittle <laughs> compared to other languages. It would be great to have a more user-friendly debugger. Yeah, so, okay, I, I, first of all, I fully agree with that. So, um, so, one of the, so one of the challenges with the debugger is the debugger is, in, is interpreting a intermediate stage of the compilation chain. And from a standpoint, so there, I would, I would say that there are two big problems with our current debugger. One is it's slow, and the second one is that it, um, it sometimes has a level of granularity that you probably don't want, right? And in particular, one of the most famous examples is all of the internal machinery for keyword arguments. You occasionally, sometimes step through. Now, I assure you. 
on every single new Julia release, I have gone through and updated a pattern matching algorithm that attempts to detect is this next blob of code probably due to handling keyword arguments, in which case I'm gonna lie to you about, I'm just gonna jump over the whole dang thing, basically. But that breaks with every single Julia release and sometimes misses specific patterns. And so, first of all, file bug reports if that pattern matching isn't working. I know it isn't working on 1.10 right now because I just got bit by it myself, um, but uh, we, if that, will, that one will be updated. I'm super excited about Claire's work on, on Julia syntax because it's the first step in the process to being able to annotate the code at different stages of the compiler pipeline to say exactly which bits of source code this came from. And if that gets integrated, all of that complicated reverse engineering of this lower code probably came from this can just go away. And we can reliably step through the code as you, the creator of the source code, would be expecting. That does not solve the other problem with performance, but I think, again, once those annotations are in place, we may be able to write faster debuggers that work on an even later stage of the compiler pipeline, like after type inference and maybe after Julia's own optimization passes, in which case I think we, I'm, I'm hoping we'll get at least a several-fold improvement in speed. It's still not anything like compiled code, but you know, I, I do think there is a path forward to making it a better experience. It's, 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 a, it's a pretty mixed experience right now. I'll, I'll grant you that. But, uh, but I do think there are ideas there. They're just hard. It, there's a lot of engineering that has to happen first, but I think we're on the trajectory to make that happen. Um, I wanted to just make a quick comment about this slide that you know we have a lot of beautiful art in the Julia ecosystem, yes. and a lot of it is thanks to Cormulian, who's here for his first JuliaCon. <laughs> so, thank you. Thanks, Viral. I This concludes our morning session, but before you go, we have a few announcements. So firstly the, uh, firstly, the purple track changes rooms again. So it was in 082 yesterday. It's going to be a different room today. Make sure you check the schedule online and on, our, and on the various notice boards to make sure you're in the right room. Secondly, this is an open invitation for, to lunch. Uh, please join me for lunch. Uh, if you're interested in discussing a venue for the next JulioCon, by interested in discussing, I mean you have a venue in mind, you know how to get it, you have some idea of the local logistics. Um, I mean, these are, these are really important. I mean, like the, this is how th these things get done. Um, if you'd like to join uh, the volunteers, if you'd like to volunteer for the next JulioCon, please do join me for lunch. Uh, we'll, discuss, uh, we'll discuss that uh, as well and show you how things are done. And if you're part of a committee or you're, you know, used to be part of the committee, please join us for lunch so that we'll have your expertise in you know, deciding how to steer Julia Con, you know, lessons from this year, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, we have a sort of packed schedule for lunch there, so please do join us. And in the evening, we'll have the closing ceremony at five o'clock in this room, and we'll announce the uh, winners of the Julia Community Prize. Thank you, and enjoy the... Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. We uh, session start at 10 o'clock. Yeah, hackathon is tomorrow, by the way. The, ha the hackathon is tomorrow on the fourth floor. We'll tell you more details at the closing ceremony.
yeah, I've got USB C. I meant like for a microphone. Do we have like the laptop microphone instead of like that? I'm not sure. Okay. I, I think we'll have to use yeah. the Yeah. Can I take it off the stand? Is that okay? Yeah. 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 Um, cool. How do you use the yeah. I don't know who's this. I don't know. I'll just leave that there for now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's maybe get it ready first. Um, University of Sydney in Australia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to whoever is not attending this session, we would gladly ask to move the discussions outside the room so we can get started. So, hi everyone again. Uh, welcome to the last morning session. So, we'll get started. Um, our first speaker is Nicolas, and he'll be talking about learning smoothly, machine learning with your robust neural networks at Yale. He comes from the University of Sydney, and let me welcome Nicolas.
Um, I'm going to detach this microphone because bending down here is a little, a little difficult for me. Um, so yeah, hello everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Nick. I'm from Sydney in Australia. Um, I'm actually with the Australian Centre for Robotics in Sydney. Um, and I'm not uh, really kind of like a Julia Dev. I'd consider myself more of an end user. And I have a background in control engineering. So most of my life I've been doing things like robotics, aerospace engineering, um, control stuff. And it's really only in the last few years that I've kind of discovered the world of machine learning. And Julia has been fantastic for that. And the tools and you know packages provided for that just make it really, really easy. So what I'm going to uh, present on today is actually this new package uh, myself and our lab have created called robustneuralnetworks.jl. Basically, this package takes some kind of really cool ideas that we've had in control engineering for the last like 60 years and sticks it inside neural networks. And that's something that we originally had the idea for for the purposes of robotic control and learning with robotic control. But it turns out it translates really well to all sorts of robust, robustness problems in machine learning. So this is more like a general kind of machine learning talk with a bit of a kind of uh, control flavor to it. So hope you'll enjoy. So we'll start with just a little bit of motivation. Why do we want robust neural networks? Well, that's generally because neural networks are, in their current state, not super robust. So the classic example is something like an image classifier. Maybe you have like a convolutional neural network that you've trained to take images of animals, and it can tell you what type of animal it is. So in this case, we've got a classifier on the left that tells us that this is a panda. But the problem with these neural networks is that they're very brittle. They're very sensitive to changes to the inputs that can completely destroy the outputs. So in this case, we add just little bits of noise to the image. And in fact, on the right-hand side, you can barely see that the image is perturbed with the human eye. And yet, that tricks the classifier into thinking it's a given. So it's completely changed the classification just with small tweaks to the inputs. Why do we care about that? Let's think of something like a self-driving car. Maybe you've got some classifier or some segmentation algorithm some neural network that takes this image of pedestrians walking in front of the car, and then on the top right-hand side, it can kind of identify in red what are pedestrians. So these are obstacles that it obviously wants to avoid. Now, with just a small perturbation to the image again, so down the bottom left, I don't know if you can actually see on the projector, but it's slightly perturbed, a little bit more grainy, uh, but we can still clearly see there are pedestrians in that image. The segmentation is completely broken. It thinks it's a completely different scene. The neural network is completely tricked and cannot see the pedestrians anymore. That's really dangerous, right? That's something we don't want our self-driving cars to do. We want our self-driving cars to avoid hitting people. So that kind of robustness is something that we want to carry into our neural networks so we don't have these problems all the time. And in particular, this is not just a problem for those static neural networks, things like convolutional neural networks, multi-layer perceptrons, whatever. It's also the case with dynamic neural networks, neural networks that have some sort of memory associated with them, so like an RNN, recurrent neural network. So this is a great example from back in 2018, uh, this paper by Kalini and Wagner. They effectively showed that uh, with one of the great, like deep, it was called deep speech, one of these great um, voice recognition neural networks at the time, uh, so it would take in some sort of audio waves of people talking and then be able to reproduce speech. They could design really, really simple and really efficient adversarial attacks to completely change the output of the neural network, again, with just small perturbations to the inputs. So our problem at the moment is that neural networks are not in general robust. And while there are ways of making them slightly more robust, there's no kind of like really efficient way of doing it until we came up with our robust neural networks and in particular, this package, like I said, it's kind of for general machine learning, but with a bit of a control engineering flavor, which we'll get to towards the end of it. And it includes two types of neural networks at the moment, static networks and dynamic or memoryful um, recurrent networks. In particular, we satisfy two properties. First, these networks naturally satisfy some sort of built-in robustness and stability guarantees. So what I mean by that is we've taken these ideas from robust control, and we've encoded them into the construction of the neural network. So we don't have to impose extra constraints. We just build neural networks that naturally are constructed to satisfy some robustness properties, which I'll get into in a little bit. And in particular, we wanted to make sure that these were still usable for our daily machine learning purposes. So we didn't want to have special solvers or special gradient descent methods that we had to apply. We just wanted this to kind of work, which is, I guess, a very Julia way of thinking about things. And so we tried to make sure these networks are compatible with standard machine learning tools, things like order differentiation or I guess Flux, the machine learning library in Julia, is something we've built this around, and just like things like stochastic gradient descent. So we have our robustness properties in this package, and in particular, we've tried to make it usable. So that's kind of an overview of why we've made this package. Um, I'm going to take you through three things now. I'm going to first go through a little bit on what the neural networks are, what they actually look like, 
This will get a little bit theoretical, a little bit of maths, but I'll try not to go too deep into it. Then I'll talk about a little bit about the package structure itself, how I've built it, what it's kind of defined on. Quite simply, it's a few abstract types and multiple dispatched over that. Um, so it's nice and intuitive, wraps around Flux. And then I'll talk about a few use cases of this. This is something, this, these neural networks is something we've really only come up with in the last few years at my lab. Uh, so we're very much looking for use cases for this. So if you think this is relevant to you and something you can apply in your research or your work, please come chat to me afterwards. I'm happy to uh, talk you through it as well. So we'll start with the model structures. Like I said, we've got two types of neural networks in our package. We've got these static ones and dynamics ones. So the static ones are kind of simple. We'll start with them. We call them Lipschitz bounded deep networks. I'll talk about what a Lipschitz bound is a little later. But basically the structure is something like this. We've got a neural network that has some inputs X, some outputs Y, goes through a bunch of weight matrices with activation functions, so your tan H's, your relus, whatever. And it's pretty, pretty standard structure. So convolutional neural networks look like this. Deep, dense networks look like this. Pretty standard structure. Um, it's not so much the structure that's important for us, it's the way we encode the robustness, which I'll get to in a bit. But what allows us to encode the robustness is actually thinking about this in a very different way. Instead of just thinking it as like a straightforward, feed-forward neural network, we actually pull apart the weights and the activations, and we draw it as something like this. So if you're used to looking at maths, look down the bottom right. If you're used to looking at diagrams, look down the bottom left. And if you want a bit of both, you can flick between the two. Mathematically and pictorially, these are exactly the same as the top image of my feed-forward neural network. I've just kind of moved the pictures of the weights around here. But it turns out that by thinking about a single layer neural network with feedback in the loop, so that's what all the kind of like loop arrows are here, that's exactly equivalent to a multi-layer neural network that just connects things in series. So connecting in parallel with one layer is the same as connecting in series with many layers. And in fact, thinking about it this way, we can actually then group the linear and the nonlinear parts of our network and simplify our block diagrams even more and write our dense neural network as something like this where our G here is a linear system, so it's just a linear operation of matrices, and that's in feedback with some sort of nonlinearity. So this is your activation function, your relus, your tan h's, your sigmoids, whatever. And it's actually by looking at things in this structure where we separate the linear and the nonlinear components, this is where it ties back into the kind of robust control theory, if anyone's familiar, familiar with that kind of stuff. But basically, that's a very common way of looking at nonlinear systems in control. You basically isolate the linear stuff, which we understand very well, and then you group all the complicated nonlinear stuff, which we don't understand, and we sort of just approximate what's going on there. And that leads me to the second neural network structure that we have in our package, which is the recurrent equilibrium network. So this is actually a more general case, the static case that LBDNs fit within this structure. And it basically looks the same, and I've got my you know, Julia logo superimposed on this. But effectively, we have some linear system G, so this is now a dynamical system, and we've got some uh, nonlinear part, which is the green stuff up the top, which are our activation functions. Mathematically, it looks like this. Basically, this is just one big matrix multiplication fed through a ReLU or a tan H. Everything in purple there, corresponds to our linear system, so it's just a bunch of matrix multiplications, and you can kind of group things together into like weights and biases as we're used to thinking about neural networks. Um, the only restriction on our activation functions is we have to have this sort of monotone slope restricted property. In plain English, that just means the maximum slope of the activation function has to be one. So if it's less than one, you can scale it up to one. It's not hard to do. So something like a sigmoid, you could make work with this as well. So most common activation functions fit this criteria anyway, so it's not really a uh, restrictive um, condition. So that's the structure of our networks. And in fact, you might ask, why do we use these? Because these, these kind of neural networks, you know, it sort of looks like a recurrent neural network if you're familiar, to looking at, uh, familiar with looking at those kind of things. It turns out this model structure, this architecture, is very, very general. And inside it, if you set some of these A's, B's, C's, and D's to zero in a particular structure, you can actually reproduce all of these neural networks. We can have dense networks, convolutional networks, residual networks, uh, recurrent neural networks. We can actually replicate all of those structures with our equilibrium network uh, framework. So we're not actually restricting the model class. This kind of encompasses most of the stuff we're used to using in our daily machine learning lives. We've just got a general model structure that we can group everything under, which is useful because then when we do our kind of robustness stuff, we have one model structure that we're trying to parameterize, not half a million that we have to do special things for. So that's what our models actually look like. 
the really interesting part about this package is that we have built-in stability and robustness guarantees. And this is where the ideas from kind of robust control theory come into it. So what do I mean by stability and robustness? This is where things get a little bit extra abstract, but it actually has a pretty intuitive uh, um, interpretation as well. The first, when I say stability for a dynamical system, so something with memory, so recurrence, uh, what I mean by stability is that things converge over time, basically, which is kind of intuitive. You know, if things are stable, we expect signals to converge over time. Fundamentally, it's this thing called contraction, which is a property uh, that people use for uh, nonlinear dynamical systems. It basically just means if I start my system at two different initial states and I give it exactly the same input sequence, then the outputs con or then the states converge to exactly the same thing. And in fact, this is actually one of my recurrent equilibrium networks that I've used to create this GIF. I've just started it at two initial conditions, given it some sinusoidal input, and you can see the signals converging over time. So when I say stability, that's what I mean. And that's a pretty general notion and something that we use quite a bit in our like, control theory stuff. Works pretty well for machine learning as well. When I talk about robustness, there's a few different metrics. The most important and the one I guess I can relate most easily to some of the motivation I showed you at the start is this thing called a Lipschitz bound. So for those that don't know, Lipschitz bounds are just this variable gamma over here. Basically, it means that if I have small changes to the input of my network, then the changes to the output of the network will be bounded and also small. So a small Lipschitz bound means the model is in some ways more smooth. That's what this GIF is kind of showing just for like a function on the left. So basically the shaded regions are kind of quantifying the Lipschitz bound, which is in this case just like the maximum slope of the function. So on the left, I've got a nice smooth function and I've got kind of like lots of white space. That basically means if I change the X value a little bit, then F of X doesn't change a huge amount. So it's nice and smooth. So if you think about our classifiers at the start, if I perturb the image with some random noise just a little bit, then it doesn't tell me that I have a gibbon instead of a panda, or it doesn't tell me that there are no pedestrians on the road instead of four. Whereas if I have a really noisy function or some kind of complicated unsmooth function, small changes to the inputs can cause really large changes to the outputs. And that's where that brittle behavior on neural, neural networks kind of comes into it more. So by imposing small Lipschitz bounds on our models, we can actually make them more smooth and in that way more robust. There's a few other definitions of robustness we use, which I won't go into, but if you're interested, again, come chat to me afterwards, and I'm happy to go into detail. So we've got our stability and our robustness, and the way we encode them in our neural networks is actually through this idea, what we like to call a direct parameterization. Basically, we construct the model parameters in such a way that they automatically satisfy robustness constraints. So we're not taking our model and then imposing constraints, we're constructing our model such that it already satisfies constraints. The way we do this, if you think about our kind of recurrent equilibrium network structure, we've got our weights and our biases there. We basically define some mapping from this theta, which is sort of some set of free, learnable, trainable parameters, whatever you want to call it. Those are, if you're used to using flux, if you go your flux.params, that's what these are. So they're something free in, you know, anything in real space, and you can just choose some real number and then that's what we do our learning over. Then we do some mapping that actually takes these free, uh, free parameters and puts them in this complicated mathematical formula which basically makes sure that the event eventual model satisfies some sort of robustness properties. So these pictures here are kind of showing what I like a visualization, I guess, of what the sets look like. So if you think of our free parameters are basically anything in space, so you can choose any real number. Uh, and whereas our kind of like explicit model structure might be this really complex set that defines what a robust neural network actually looks like, but we don't have to worry about defining that complex set. We've just got this function mapping between the two. So basically we train with our free parameters, we map into our robust space, and then we can use our networks like that. So that's kind of how the theory works out, and that's actually pretty closely related in how I've structured the package as well. So I'll take you through that now and you'll get to see a little bit more Julia code from now on. So the package structure as well, basically, like I said at the start, we do multiple dispatch over some abstract types. Those abstract types are effectively these params. So I have one for our recurrent equilibrium networks, or RENs, these are the dynamic ones. And then we also do it separately for the static ones, even though mathematically they're within the structure of the recurrent ones, it's much faster if you just want like a dense network that has no memory uh, to just keep it separate. So very fast, efficient for code. So we have a model parameterization. We have some constructors that basically take uh, 
instances of these parameterizations and convert them to our explicit models, which are all subtypes of our abstract REN or abstract LBDN. So some of the model parameterizations we support, we've got our contracting RENs, our Lipschitz RENs, like I mentioned before, and then a few others as well. And on the LBDN side, uh, the L in LBDN stands for, well, the LB stands for Lipschitz bounded. So all of those satisfy our robustness properties. And we've got this thing called the sandwich FC, basically the paper where we introduced this, we called it the sandwich layer, because when you look at the, the maths, it kind of like actually sandwiches layers together. Anyway, that sandwich layer is basically, you could take a flux dense layer, for example, remove it from your code, stick in your sandwich layer, the interface is exactly the same, except you get a free Lipschitz bound, which is pretty cool because that means you have robustness built in straight away. How do we actually build these models? It effectively amounts to, you define some sort of inputs and outputs. So I'll say I want one input, 10 internal states, 20 neurons and an output. Then I can construct my parameterization, which I do separately. So this is, I am saying I want a contracting REN in this case, and then I stick it in uh, the REN wrapper and basically that constructs the model that we can then evaluate on data. So the first thing here, the parameterization describes everything about the model and its parameterization. Whereas when I have my variable model here, that is the thing that we'd actually evaluate on data. So one is the thing we train on, the other is the thing that we actually evaluate on data. Um, and you can see here that yeah, the model parameters, that are subtypes of our REN params and the model itself is a subtype of our abstract REN. In terms of training a model with our package, it's, so I'm just gonna take you through, I guess, like simple syntax in Flux, and it's gonna be basically exactly the same thing. So if I was using Flux, I'd maybe create some dense network. So this is just a network with one input, one output, and 10 hidden neurons. Um, let's say I create a loss function, which is the mean squared error, and I know I've got blank spaces in there, but you'll see why shortly. Um, so maybe I just have the mean squared error on some data and some outputs create some random training data and you could call this whatever you want and put any sort of complicated training data you want in here, but the general structure is the same, then we just kind of train it. That's how you do things with a flux dense model. This is how you do things with our package. You can see here, there's not a lot of difference. Basically, the only thing that changes is that we actually have the model construction inside the loss function. The reason for that is when we construct our model using this LBDN wrapper or the REN wrapper or whichever one, that's what takes our parameterization, so our free parameters that we can do our training on, and it maps it to our model structure which we evaluate on data. Now that mapping is something we want to differentiate through because that's where kind of all the magic happens. So we need to include it inside the loss function just so that when we take uh, our gradients, when we do flux.train, the auto diff engine knows to actually search through that path and uh, you know, take derivatives through um, that mapping from our trainable parameters to the actual model that gets evaluated on data. Now, that can be annoying for a few people who are used to using Flux and not having to create models inside their loss function. So we actually have a wrapper, which means you don't have to do that. You can create the model outside. The only caveat is that we've just kind of hidden where the mapping actually occurs. So now every time you call the model, then it creates that mapping from our free parameters to uh, the explicit model that you evaluate on data. Um, this method is really useful if you do sort of standard machine learning, any sort of supervised learning, I just use this because the syntax is then identical to Flux. If you're doing things like reinforcement learning, often you want to evaluate your model many, many times before you update the parameters. So it doesn't make sense to make the same mapping from your free parameters to your explicit model every time you call it. That's where I'd go back to the other method here. Uh, you can just kind of create the model once, run it a bunch of times, then update the parameters and then recreate it again. So we've kind of separated those two things just to allow flexibility. And if you are training recurrent equilibrium networks with the dynamics, then it's basically the same structure as you would use to train an RNN or an LSTM in Flux. So we've tried to keep it pretty user-friendly in that regard. So that's kind of the general package structure. I've got about five minutes left or so. So I'm gonna go through a few examples of what we've actually used this for so far. And like I said, I think there's a lot of use cases for this. So if you have any suggestions, please let me know at the end of this talk. I'd be happy to help out or take any suggestions on board. The first thing we did was just robust image classification. I guess the, most, the, the motivation for this, as I said at the start, when you have uh, images and you add some kind of pixelated disturbance to it, then we change the classification. So we thought, all right, let's see if we can do that properly. Here's an example just with the MNIST data set. So for those unfamiliar, MNIST is just a bunch of handwritten numbers, and the typical problem is figure out what the number is based on the pixel data. So in this case, I've trained one of my LBDNs, the static models with a Lipschitz bound. I've trained it to classify these numbers, 
and it figures them out pretty well. And it actually performs reasonably similarly to just like a flux dense network. The cool part is what happens when I perturb the image. So this graph here on the x-axis, I have basically a perturbation size. So I'm just adding like random noise to the image as a percentage of like image pixel strength. So the 0.8 here means the maximum, so it's just like a uniform random sampling. So the 0.8 means that the largest disturbance is 80% of the original pixel data. Oh, sorry, 80% of like a full pixel data. So what we see here is the test accuracy, so high is good, um, of our OBDN stays pretty constant even as we increase the perturbation size. So as I add more and more noise to the image, the LBDNs are still pretty good at classifying the MNIST data set. If I just take a flux dense model though, it drops off immediately and it gets down to absolutely unusable performance within, let's say, you know, half the perturbation size. So just by having these Lipschitz bounds inside, we can already make sure that our models are much more robust to image classification. For those of you that work in the field, you'll know that, uh, sorry, and also I should mention here, the smaller Lipschitz bound is kind of more robust here because it means the model's smoother, like I described at the start. For those of you that are kind of used to working in image classification, you know MNIST is not a very difficult problem. Uh, we've also done this on things like SciFi 10, SciFi 100, Tiny ImageNet, uh, kind of more interesting problems, and we've seen the same results. So here, we've actually got like a convolutional version of our LBDN, which I haven't written in our Julia package yet. It's in Python, sorry, uh, but going to be translated soon. And you can see, so the x-axis there is the Lipschitz bound we've imposed on the model, and as we make the Lipschitz bound smaller, so the network smoother, then in this perturbed case, the accuracy improves because it's more robust to disturbances. And down the bottom right here is a convolutional neural network, which again, can't do anything as soon as you perturb it a little bit. So that's one cool use case. Another really cool use case, and this is actually basically like my entire PhD in like one and a half slides, so um, is robust reinforcement learning. So I won't go into huge amounts of detail here, but this is, this is super interesting stuff. Basically, it's possible to do reinforcement learning over just stabilizing controllers uh, for a dynamical system if you use a particular controller structure. That we, I won't go into the theory, but it's called the Euler controller. Basically, if you have a contracting neural network, which is our stability property, property in this package, if you have a contracting neural network and you use this controller framework, you can guarantee that any controller you try, uh, you try in your reinforcement learning kind of trial and error strategy, it's always going to be stabilizing. So the way we tend to use this is, let's say we have some system, you might have seen like the uh, rotary arm pendulums on the Julia Hub desks uh, up in the main area. Let's say we've got some controller that allows it to stabilize, but it's not super high performance. Uh, we can do some learning over that to make sure that it improves its performance without losing any stability. So if I poke it, it's not more likely to fall over, it's just better, it's gonna respond better when I do poke it. And we've shown that we can actually do some pretty interesting stuff. So this is on a particular system where the optimal solution for the controller is actually very close to an instability bound. So it's very unrobust by definition. If I train things with my special Euler controller and a contracting network, I get pretty close to the optimal bound. And this is a really simple linear problem. So we can easily write down the optimal bound, but it's kind of just to demonstrate the point. The red X's on this other method here are to show when it trials an unstable controller. And it turns out that it trials it pretty early on in the training process and it get, can't get unstuck from that region. It finds something that's reasonably good and it turns out that it performs pretty similarly over the training horizon compared to our special controllers. But the catch is when you evaluate it for a longer time horizon. So a big thing in reinforcement learning is often people will train something over say, let's say like, I don't know, 100 seconds, but then they want it to run on a robot for like two days. Now you need it to be stable over the two days, not just the 100 seconds. And this here shows that both of our controllers are fine in the region they've been trained. But as soon as we take it into a further time horizon beyond where it's been trained, this other controller goes completely unstable, whereas our Euler controller is completely stable still because of this contraction property that's built into the neural networks. So this is some really interesting stuff. If you're interested, again, come chat to me afterwards. Uh, but it's only because we've got these stability properties built into our robust neural networks that I can actually do this kind of stuff. The last case, and this is, I guess, for people interested in uh, estimation, um, this is an interesting case we've figured, uh, if you've ever heard of like a Kármán filter or an extended Kármán filter, these are what we call observers or state estimators. Basically, it's a way of figuring out what the state of a dynamical system is based on just measurements. So for example, I might want to figure out what position and velocity my little rover is at just based on like bearing measurements or some camera sensor. Turns out you can design uh, 
observers or uh, state estimators that are guaranteed to converge to the true solution if you have this contraction property in your neural network. So a really simple case is like a box on two, mounted on two springs that kind of oscillates back and forth. And just by observing the position, it, my neural network can actually figure out what the velocity should be over some sort of finite time. So you can see all the velocity signals down the bottom right. The velocity error actually converges pretty nicely um, to the true solution. So that's pretty cool. And we can also do this on really complicated stuff like PDEs. So this was a reaction diffusion equation. Basically, by like sampling just a few sites in our uh, grid space, we could figure out what the entire state of the PDE was just with these contracting neural networks. And in fact, all we actually had to train this on was the one step ahead prediction error, and then it's guaranteed to be stable and, and converging for the entire thing. So that's, that's pretty cool stuff. So that kind of brings me to the end of my talk. Basically, this is our new package, robustneuralnetworks.jl. Like I said, it's a package for general machine learning with a kind of control twist and flavor to it. Um, and we've got these robustness guarantees built into the models, and I think that's what the interesting thing about it is. It's easy to use with existing machine learning tools like the Flux library and Julia, and it's all written in native Julia, and it's available on the general package registry if you want to check it out. Uh, we've got a paper on archive that I plan to submit to the JuliaCon proceedings as well, so if that's kind of got a tutorial of how to use it if you'd like to check it out, or if you're more comfortable looking at the docs, it's there too, so you can scan the QR codes and have a look. But uh, thank you for coming, and look forward to answering your questions. Yeah, thanks very much uh, for a very interesting talk. Um, I have a couple of questions. I'll probably speak to you offline as well. But uh, if I understand the mapping part correctly, it's essentially just a very clever form of regular, regular, uh, regularizing the, the, the weights, or not, not quite? <laughs> uh, not quite. So we can go into detail later. But basically, um, there's kind of a linear matrix inequality that has to be satisfied for certain robustness properties to exist. And we basically do the mapping so that the eventual structure of the network fits that linear matrix inequality. So rather than solving a semi-definite program or whatever, we just kind of construct it so it's automatically satisfied. So it's not like a, it's, I guess, sort of a regularization, but it's kind of a bit more involved than that. Yeah. Do we have more questions? How fast does this converge? How fast does it converge? Uh, in, in what problem? <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes very slow, sometimes very quickly, but that's no, no slower or faster than any other kind of stuff. It depends how you set it up. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> my question is because um, next to Flux, there's also Lux. Mm. Uh, do you support also this neural network framework? Um, not yet. I only became aware of Lux like maybe a couple of months ago, um, and it's basically just me writing this package. So when I get time, I'm going to increase support to that. But at the moment, yeah, just Lux. But I think our framework could work quite well with Lux as well because they separate cool. like parameterizations. Thank you. We can take a very quick question. Uh, so uh, j just uh, imposing the uh, the bounds you have on robustness. I assume that would have the cost, uh, has some computational cost yeah. uh, for the training. Yes. Uh, so can you give us just a, like a ballpark, you know, how, how, much, how much does that cost in terms of you want to build a neural network? You know? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. It actually it kind of depends on which constraint you want to impose. Um, it is going to be slower. I, a ballpark may be like five times slower for the static case. For a recurrent neural network, maybe like a couple of times slower. Like it's not like an order of magnitude slower, but it is a little bit slower um, because yeah, there's there's some kind of matrix inverses that have to happen there. Working on speeding that up, um, but it's the kind of thing like if you want to impose stability guarantees, this is faster than any other method. If you don't want to impose stability guarantees, then don't use this. So, yeah. All right, let's sing again, Nicholas. Thank you. And next we have Patrick. Altmiller. He comes from Delft University and he'll talk with a, uh, about a topic very relevant for mach applied machine learning to science and engineering, which is uncertainty quantification. So let's welcome Patrick. Yes, thanks very much.
So this is great. I don't actually have to introduce myself anymore. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, there we go. It looks different on this screen, but better. Um, yeah, I'll talk about something called uh, conformal prediction today. It's a one universal way to uh, quantify predictive uncertainty uh, for machine learning models in Julia. Uh, here's the agenda. Um, I think you want to probably focus on the links here, so there will be a short demo in, in Pluto. Uh, I recommend you to just download the notebook if you want to follow along and run it locally using this uh, link, tinyurl.com slash cpjcon 2023. If you feel particularly daring this morning, you can try Binder, but in my experience, especially with this Wi-Fi, it doesn't work so well. Um, and if you just want to follow along the slides, you can use this alternative link down there. So what is conformal prediction? Uh, it involves uh, turning heuristic notions of predictive uncertainty into rigorous ones, and I'll go on to explain this in some more detail. Um, but why I'm motivated to work on this, or what originally brought me to this, is this idea that if we want to build trustworthy AI systems, then sort of as a minimum requirement for these systems uh, in the context of machine learning, where prediction is kind of still the holy grail, I want to at least know how certain or uncertain the model is about its predictions. And I won't go into this too much, but one of the simplest versions of conformal prediction essentially relies on data splitting. So if we are in the context of uh, deep learning, for example, we would uh, split our data into a proper training set uh, and then a calibration set and then probably also a validation set and a test set. So a lot of splitting, um, but it, it does help us to, to quantify predictive uncertainty. And essentially uh, what, what the, the term calibration set already implies is that we will use part of the data to understand how uncertain uh, my model is locally about certain predictions, and then we use that information at the test phase to generate uh, something called prediction sets in this context. Uh, if you go to the slides, there's a couple of uh, blog posts um, that I host on various uh, forums uh, that you can use to, to yeah, dive a bit deeper. I want to just illustrate this uh, process visually here for you. So we have in the top left just the uh, predicted softmax output for the target class uh, one in this case. Then on the top right, we have uh, calibration scores. Uh, in, in the context of classification, a standard go-to is just one minus the uh, softmax output uh, of the true class. What we then do, and again, this is just the simplest form of conformal prediction, is we we take um, the one minus alpha quantile. Uh, one minus alpha here is just the user-specified coverage rate. So it is the uh, probability that you want to specify um, that the test label is included in the prediction set at test time. And this holds provably, um, but I won't do any proofs. <laughs> uh, and what you can see on the bottom right is the resulting uh, prediction set for the test point that is illustrated as this uh, little yellow star in the top left chart. Uh, and you can see already this idea of prediction sets as opposed to just one softmax output for the top, uh, top one label. Um, and in particular, in cases where the uh, test point is perhaps between two classes near the decision boundary, you will realize that the prediction set is typically larger. So in, in some cases here we have two labels, in some cases where the classifier is quite certain, we just have one label included. So the package, um, just uh, yeah, a few high level points, it's built on top of MLJ, so basically any supervised machine learning model that you can find in MLJ is compatible with this package, uh, including uh, deep learning models uh, that are built in Flux, through MLJ Flux. And we have, at this point, implemented many state-of-the-art uh, approaches to conformal prediction uh, for regression classification and also time series modeling. So I'll start off with a couple of uh, applications and examples. 
by show of hands, anyone who attended the symbolic regression talk this week? Quite a few people, that's great. Um, so I attended that talk as well. I thought it was very interesting. And since Miles uh, mentioned that the package is also interfaced to MLJ, I thought, let me try this out. And so I put together this slide uh, to, to illustrate how easy it is really to, to use conformal prediction. Um, so we have our standard MLJ workflows here. So that line 4 to, five, four to 8 is um, Miles Kramer's package uh, for symbolic regression. So we train a symbolic regression, regression model here on some synthetic data. We'll see it works remarkably well. Uh, to conformalize that model, we have to do this. So essentially, one line of code if we don't account for the uh, using conformal prediction part. And then we continue on with our standard MLJ workflows. And this is what we get. So instead of just having uh, point predictions, we get a prediction interval uh, at the, which, which, depending on the coverage rate that we determined, um, varies in, in width. And we'll see more examples now in the uh, demo. Just another quick example. Um, I don't know if you heard about LLMs, uh, kind of a bus term right now. Uh, we, uh, uh, in, during ING experiment week, uh, which was a month ago, we, we tried to apply conformal prediction uh, in the context of something called intent recognition. So here you have a chatbot um, that essentially tries to understand uh, what, what kind of intent users have. So user might be asking, my credit card is not working, and then you want to be able to help them as efficiently as possible with that problem. Um, so we used a pre-trained model uh, on some, some banking-related data, um, and we, we built a small uh, chatbot that uses conformal prediction on top of that to, to generate uh, intent sets that incorporate predictive uncertainty. So if the initial prompt is very ambiguous, these, these uh, intent sets will be larger, uh, and if the uh, prompt is very clear, the intent set will be quite small. We have a paper currently under review um, where we show that uh, this outperforms uh, many existing approaches. And again, there's also links to uh, further material. I'll probably skip over this, but it also works with uh, image classifiers. Um, so here we have an image of a seven a handwritten uh, MNIST image, which could also maybe be a two, but it's probably a seven. Uh, the conformal prediction set addresses this predictive uncertainty. So it tells you, yes, seven is the most likely answer, but there's also a small probability that it's two or four. And there's, a, there's certain digits that you typically uh, see uh, come up together in prediction sets because they're similar. And finally here, a quick um, shout out to Mochtaba Famanba, a colleague at ING who recently implemented uh, conformal prediction to time series modeling. Uh, I won't go into details here, but uh, feel free to ask me after the session. Now moving on to the interactive session. So I want to use this mostly to, to illustrate the workflows a bit more, and this time in the context of regression. So first here, we, we bring the chart that we saw before to life, and just see what happens if we uh, change the coverage rate or move across the domain. So let's see uh, what happens if I move over. So now we're in a, the, the yellow uh, star is now in a region um, where things look pretty certain, like we're close to, uh, to this orange, orange class, and in fact, our model pretty confidently predicts class one in this case, and uh, this is the only class that is included in the prediction set. So we have a, a single value in the prediction set, which again expresses that in this case, predictive uncertainty is very low. And you can play around with this in your, in your own time a little more if you want. Um, you can change the coverage rate. In this case, if I go very high, um, then we will start including also other possible labels in the, in the uh, prediction set because a very high coverage set essentially implies that if we want 100% coverage, or the, the best thing we can do is just to include every label. Now, if you come from a domain where regression is more common, um, that's actually the case for myself, 
then this next part of the uh, demo might be easier for you to follow. So here I just uh, simulate some synthetic data. Uh, you can use this notebook to uh, kind of define the functional form uh, that you like. So we can also use cosine here or whatever function you want. Uh, and then from this uh, ground truth data generating process, I generate noisy observations. We can play here again with a uh, domain. We can play with the number of observations. Let's keep it at this for now. Then we'll start off with, uh, and if you're familiar with MLJ, this will be uh, something that you you find quite easy to understand. Um, we'll start with standard uh, machine learning workflows using MLJ. So we just partition our data into a train and test set. We then wrap our model in data. So this is uh, machines in, in MLJ. And then we finally uh, fit this machine uh, to the data, in this case, the, the training rows. And what we get is, uh, in this case, fairly uh, accurate uh, point predictions. So that's the, the orange line here. But of course, in many contexts, a point prediction is not enough. Uh, I have a background in economics, for example, and if, uh, used to work at the Bank of England. If the Bank of England was to uh, publish inflation forecasts uh, that only include a point estimate, that's, that's not enough. We want to have some sense of uh, the predictive uncertainty. So inflation could be 2.5% in the next quarter. It could be 2% at the lower bottom. So once again, Simple, simple API call, we just conformalize the model here using the standard uh, split conformal method. We follow MLJ workflows again, and here's our resulting predictive interval. And we can play around with the uh, coverage rate here. Again, you see that, of course, if I increase the coverage rate, the, the interval width um, will widen. So this is the equivalent to the prediction set in, in classification increasing in size. If we go very low, then, yeah, sure, we have a more precise forecast, but we, we uh, commit the risk of, of uh, yeah, committing more errors. Um, yeah, we, I really try to, to maximize the compatibility with MLJ, so we can also use standard evaluation workflows, um, and there's links here in, the, in, the, uh, in this notebook to the tutorial uh, in the MLJ documentation. So here we actually test, uh, in this case on a simple holdout set, the empirical coverage. So we specify beforehand, okay, I want to have 50% coverage. Uh, this holds in expectation um, up to sort of a yeah, concentration inequality, um, but it doesn't, it won't sort of exactly hold. We won't uh, always get exactly 50% coverage. And in this case, here we now have 46% uh, uh, coverage instead of 50%. Uh, mm, that's pretty far away of, of the 50% the that we wanted, but it has to do with the fact that we're dealing with a fairly small data set here. Um, we can, for example, increase this. Where was it? Up here. Then we should get closer to what we're asking for. Yeah, so now we're pretty close to the, to the 50%, right? We're still slightly below, but there you go. Um, there are, as I promised earlier, uh, many other ways to, uh, to approach conform prediction. I won't go into many details here, but you can play around with any of these approaches. Essentially, what they try to address is different sort of desirable properties of these uh, prediction intervals. You can imagine that one desirable property is that the prediction interval is adaptive. So it's wide in regions where predictive uncertainty is actually high and much narrower in regions where predictive uncertainty is low. And we have some standard plotting methods that uh, make this easy to, to understand and visualize. Um, so there are certain uh, methods in conformal prediction that, that just produce standard, uh, sorry, uh, constant intervals. Um, those are obviously not adaptive. But then, for example, jackknife uh, min max here produces uh, interval widths of le uh, varying lengths, and, and that's something we want to observe. So this was a very quick tour of the package. Now I want to finish that tour off with a quick uh, yeah, caveat, pointer to, some of, to, to one of the uh, limitations of conformal predictions. 
Uh, it does rest on the notion of exchangeability, so that's uh, broadly uh, similar to, to the IID assumption that some of you may have heard of in, in machine learning statistics. So what happens if I move out of domain here? And to, to illustrate this, I use this chart here. The whole thing kind of doesn't perform so well anymore. <laughs> Um, so when I first observe, observed this and, and, and visualized this, I was a bit disappointed and uh, uh, opened a, a discussion on my own repo, uh, kind of uh, tagging uh, people who are working on this field, pushing this field, uh, which I'm not one of those people, by the way. Um, but I compared this to uh, the same graph, uh, the same chart or same result, uh, but using, using a plus redox, another package um, that I presented last year, actually. Um, which is a very simple way to do Bayesian deep learning. Uh, here, this epistemic uncertainty is covered uh, much in a much better way, right? The interval, the prediction interval just explodes far away from the training data, which is something that you would typically observe in, the, in a Bayesian context. Um, and the answer I got was, was very nice uh, from, from uh, Anastasios Angelopoulos, um, that this, this shouldn't be disappointing news because we can just use our Bayesian uh, predictions, our predictive uh, posterior as a, uh, as a heuristic. So earlier I was saying, let's just use one minus uh, softmax. If we have a better heuristic notion of predictive uncertainty, let's just use that. Um, and that's actually one of the things that I'm uh, working on. We're not quite there, but we have uh, Laplace Redux now interface to MLJ flux, um, which should then also make uh, that package compatible with uh, with conformal prediction. So in this case, um, and this is actually, uh, they elaborate on this in, in this really great tutorial on conformal prediction, uh, what you end up conformalizing is not one minus the softmax output, but the predictive density. So you're, you're kind of shrinking the, the prediction set based on the predictive posterior. And then this is kind of summarizing my PhD in one slide. <laughs> so I'm actually working on something uh, not totally unrelated, but, but I'm working on something called counterfactual explanations, which is a way to uh, try and explain um, these uh, sometimes very uh, instable neural networks, try and understand how they behave, how they make their decisions. Um, and one, it turns out that one thing that is very useful in this context is, a, is an understanding of the predictive uncertainty of models. Um, basically, counterfactual search involves uh, changes in the, in the input space. So we, we tweak the inputs, we move to a counterfactual state that flips the label in some, some targeted uh, way. Um, and then we can read off the, the necessary changes or these feature perturbations as an explanation for how the class in, the, in, the classifier, in the classifier's view, uh, an input needs to change for the prediction to change. But if we just um, do that in the, in the kind of baseline way, just gradient descent in the feature space, we end up sometimes with these uh, cases where we move across the decision boundary, but then we're, then we're done. So we're at the decision boundary, which is kind of the region of, of maximal predictive uncertainty. And uh, this, this counterfactual here, I mean, it's, it does the job. It's a valid explanation, but it looks nothing like the, uh, the, the original samples in the, in the training population. Um, yeah, and it turns out you can use predictive uncertainty to, to ensure that we move to a counterfactual state that is characterized by low predictive uncertainty. Um, and we thought, okay, let's, let's try and use conformal predictions in this context. And the reason was that conformal prediction is so universally uh, applicable to, to all kinds of machine learning models. The problem was that what you, what you get from conformal prediction uh, as your sort of uncertainty metric, metric is, is a set size, which is a discrete, non-smooth function. So in the context of uh, gradient-based uh, counterfactual search, you can't really work with that. Uh, but it turns out that some other very smart people from uh, Google, Google DeepMind, I think they're called now, um, have worked on uh, differentiability in the context of conformal training. So slightly different motivation here, but essentially they propose smooth versions of the uh, set size, set size loss, um, also a smooth uh, classification loss. And they use that to, to train models to generate efficient, adaptive conformal predictions. 
And we've just taken this in the context of counterfactual explanations for our own purposes in some work that is currently under review. Uh, the full kind of conformal training implementation is uh, still a, working, a work in process. Um, and everywhere in the slides where there is uh, room for contributions, I, I added some pointers. And finally, uh, I think we actually have quite a bit of time for, for questions. I rushed through this, so if we, we have 10 minutes now, if there was anything unclear, I can go back to, to certain points in the slides. Um, here's a couple of pointers. Uh, so since the beginning of my PhD, I've been yeah, working on a, on a couple of packages that all broadly fall under this umbrella of uh, trustworthy AI, responsible AI, whatever you want to call it. And I've started uh, collecting them in, in a GitHub organization. Um, it's a very loosely defined home of trustworthy AI. So if you have anything that you think fits into this framework, feel free to contribute. As I said, I'm still very new to Julia myself, so always very open to contributions. But now time for questions. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I made the question, yeah, a little bit related to the comparison you gave to the Bayesian. Like, uh, what does conformal prediction actually do? So how, how is this interval um, computed? Especially if you think, for, some, for example, like if we get a full coverage, I guess that some sampling is going on, so you always are bounded by the number of samples. So you never really know what the hundred percent really is. Like, can you say a little bit around this? What's actually the computation which leads to the um, normalization? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so that's probably one of the parts I I did rush a bit too much in the end. Um, so let me go back to this slide that we had here, uh, and maybe I'll just take this bit by bit now. So. In, again, this is the, the most trivial, but I think the most easy to understand approach to conformal prediction, which relies on, on, on this calibration data set, data splitting. And what ends up happening is you just you fit your, your model, uh, whatever kind of predictive model, on your training data. And then you, lose, you use the, the trained model on the calibration data set to compute something called uh, non-conformity scores. So in the simplest case, that's just in, in, the, in the classification setting, one minus the, the softmax output of the true class. And then you just compute the whatever uh, user-specified uh, quantile uh, of, of that population, of that emp empirical distribution of non-conformity scores. And you use that quantile value to eventually define your, your prediction set. You're asking about 100% uh, coverage. Uh, in my mind, the only way to truly achieve 100% coverage is to just always include all labels. But you can get to, like the proof holds, probably also to 100%, to I'm not so sure, but something very close to 100%. Do we have any other question? Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering if you could compare, because when I looked at the plots, it looked to me a lot like Gaussian processes. So if you could compare um, the differences between your approach and the general GP's uh, framework. Do you mean the, the plot on the, the GitHub issue that I opened, or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one second. You mean this one, I guess, right? Yeah, generally, that you have Gaussian uh, processes in order to estimate the uncertainty, right, given yeah. the dataset. And how is your um, approach different in what uh, cases? So, so here I'm just using a, a Bayesian neural network, which is, I guess, comes comes close in, in spirit to Gaussian process, but I'm not super familiar with GPs. Um, so. So I'm, yeah, I'm not, so 
I guess the, the difference between Gaussian processes and, and, and this approach is that um, you don't really, in this context, make any assumptions about the distribution of the data, and also not on, on the model itself. So you can, it's purely based on the, uh, on the data itself, so you just can apply it to, to any machine learning model. Okay, yeah, see, so it's about this uh, split, splitting of the data that you said about yeah. in the previous question. Yeah. Okay, I see. And, and that splitting approach is, is the simplest approach, as far as I'm aware. Um, other approaches, typically, that don't rely on data splitting, they just sift through your training data set repeatedly, which means that there's a little bit more of a tax on, on, on training because you have to retrain your model more. Okay, often. but in no way you make any assumptions about the underlying modeling uh, no. distribution or something? Okay, no, and that's what, to me, makes this approach very appealing. So yeah, the only yeah, assumption so. that you really make is this assumption of exchange exchangeability, which, which I tried to illustrate with this example here, that that's perhaps a stronger assumption than, than some people like to, okay, to present. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you a lot. We had another question here. Oh, okay, it was the same question, so does anybody else have another question? Uh, so using this method, what fraction of the data do you need to split off and then later analyze to get the good result? Yeah, good question. Um, so it's basically not so much about the fraction, but you need at least a thousand calibration points for split conformal prediction to get, ni to get close to a nice concentration inequality. Um, in this paper that I've linked uh, somewhere in the slides, uh, which I really recommend, by the way. Uh, they show, they have some charts here, where they show um, how the, the expected error um, of the empirical coverage rate depends on the calibration set size. But this is in absolute terms. You can see here that pretty quickly, for N1000, um, the, the error gets pretty small very quickly. Uh, awesome. So this is on the x-axis you have the user-specified coverage here, 90%, and then for different choices of n, which is the calibration set size, you have the distribution of the uh, empirical errors, the empirical deviation of that specified coverage rate. Mm, awesome, thanks. Do you know how that scales? So for example, if I'm doing classification, do you know how that scales uh, based on number of classes? Yes, yeah, so that's also a good question. <laughs> so um, I've been talking about this, mostly thinking about binary classification. Um, you, if you want class conditional coverage, so that this coverage actually holds for every class, essentially what you have to do is to run the calibration step by class. But it, while this obviously adds a computational burden, there are some approaches now coming out um, that essentially involve uh, clustering as a pre-processing step to reduce the number of classes. Um, the, the computational burden is still not very high because all you essentially need to do, even in the context of deep learning uh, for split conformal prediction, is to, to you just run a forward pass, right? You're just computing predictions and then conformity scores based on that. So that there's not really much retraining and yeah, it's really not that, that bad in my experience. Even with the LLM, it, it worked. All right, let's take our speaker again. So next we have Vin Marwick. Uh, uh, this is probably the second example today. Uh, yeah, HDMI. Uh, sh oh, yeah. Showcasing MLJ somehow. Excellent. Uh, no, no audio or anything, that's no, just a presentation. 
Um, all right, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, machine learning, property loans for fun and profit. This is a uh, very applied talk, really, about how we can use the MLJ framework um, on a data set and how we'll actually uh, end up hopefully making some money out of it. So quickly, just about me. Uh, I'm a quant at a big bank during the day, and I've been using Julia since about uh, 2015, so version 0.3.6. Uh, and in my old job, I was using Julia uh, professionally as well. We had a lot of uh, analytics written in Julia, so I've got a decent amount of experience in using it. Um, so I'm going to give you some of that experience, hopefully today, uh, with a talk on Julia, machine learning, and finance, uh, a little bit of everything. So the financial part, um, we're looking at a data set of property loans and uh, trying to explore really how uh, when a company wants some money, uh, what happens when we give it to them and do they pay us back or not. There's this company called estateguru.co and they give you the opportunity to invest in different loans um, based on different properties around the European area and then you're hopefully going to earn a return. So the interest rate here is uh, one of the columns. That's what you'll get back after you give them some money if they pay the money back. So the interest rate that you're going to get is related to the amount of risk you're taking. A high interest rate means that you're taking on a lot of risk, so there's a high chance that you might not get that money back. And this is when that loan defaults. That's the technical term. Uh, you don't get your money back, so the loan's defaulted. So what we want to try and do is use the data Estate Guru provide to try and predict what loans are actually going to default using all the information. And actually, is the data got any more additional information in it and how we can use machine learning to help us? Uh, Estate Guru are nice enough to provide us a CSV of all their loans historically um, and lots of different information behind those loans and uh, what describes them. This is a few rows of the example of that data. And we can see that we've got, say, the country, the interest rate, the actual type of loan, and lots of other variables that tell us uh, what actually is happening underneath. So you can sign up to Estate Guru today and download, download that data yourself. We're going to use MLJ, so it's been mentioned a few times already in this talk, um, and it's your one-stop shop for machine learning. It gives you all the tools that you need just in one package, um, and you can do your entire machine learning workflow um, using MLJ functions, and it gives you a really nice interface to do all the tasks. So things such as pre-processing the data, so when we've got categorical data and numerical data that we need to transform into something a bit more machine readable by scaling it or encoding it, all done in MLJ. Um, actually fitting the models and all the different type of models, be it a linear regression, some tree models, or k-nearest neighbors that I'll go through in a bit, but there's one interface. You don't have to worry about how someone's implemented that machine learning um, model. You can just load up the MLJ package, and it's all there for you. This goes for tuning the hyperparameters as well. Um, it's a simple interface. You just say what different ranges you want and let the models work out how, uh, what the actual hyperparameters need to be. And then also, finally, evaluating the model. All of that really can be described in some simple Julia code. So to start with, we're using MLJ, so we're going to import that package. And then we're deciding what the actual uh, function or the machine model we're going to use for, for, to start with. Uh, to begin with, we'll use logistic regression. So we're going to load the logistic classifier from the MLJ linear models package. And that brings it into our environment, uh, the ability to do logistic regression. On the next line, we're going to create the machine of the logistic classifier with a lambda equals zero. This is one of those hyperparameters that we set to zero. Um, we're not going to do any tuning at the minute. It's just a simple logistic regression. And we're going to pass in our data, which is the x data, just the interest rate, and then our y outcomes, which is whether the loan defaulted or not. And this gives us our machine that we're going to make learn. We make it learn by calling the fit function and telling it to just use the training rows no uh, outputs, and then this is able to then just learn the correct weights of all those different uh, inputs, and then we evaluate the machine, yet again, using the training data and the various metrics that we pass in, and we do some cross-validation uh, shuffling and resampling to evaluate how good that model is. So this is the general concept of MLJ. We're going to be loading in packages, training them, and then evaluating them, and all that really changes is the type of model we're um, pulling in, and hopefully someone has written uh, a package that is covering all the different and new machine learning models. What metrics are we going to use today for trying to evaluate whether our models are good at predicting this defaults of the loans? Well, we've got the log loss and the Breer loss for our loss functions. We want to make these as low as possible. 
And then we've got our accuracy functions, so how often is the model correct? Uh, the Kappa metric, which is how often is the model better than just a null model? And then the AUC, which is checking whether we're ranking defaulting loans higher than other ones. And for these metrics, we want higher values. So on the left-hand side, lower values. On the right-hand side, higher is better. What does our data actually look like? So like I said, we've got lots of different variables coming in from Estate Guru. Uh, one of those being the interest rate that we can see on average is around 10%, ranging from the maximum of 14 to a lower of 8. So this is the actual interest rate we're going to get on the um, uh, property if we invest in it, and we're going to be expecting the higher ones to default more often, but we'll be able to see if that's true from the model outputs. We've got the loan to value, so how much money they're actually asking for relative to that property. Again, distributed quite uh, neatly around 60%. And then we've got the actual property value and the funded amount that they're asking for. These are on the log scale here, but again, nicely distributed, so hopefully these will give us some information on default rates. We've then got the qualitative variables, so more uh, descriptive variables of the different uh, loans. Uh, the actual property type, most of them are residential, and we've got the odd summer cottage cropping up there as well. And also the countries, we can see that they're mainly European countries and some other descriptions as well. So first, we're going to have to actually convert our raw data into something that MLJ will expect by telling it what the data classes are, or the data types are in this case. So for the uh, qualitative ones, we're going to tell them that they're multiple or multi-class because they're factor variables. And then this allows us to then do the one-hot encoding slightly later. Before that, we're going to unpack the data and separate it into the Y and X variables. And then we're going to split into a train and test set by doing a 70-30% split and doing some shuffling as well so it's all mixed up. Now, even pre-processing the data, these are still machines using the MLJ framework, so everything is a machine in MLJ. We create the continuous encoder, we create the machine from it and fit the machine on our data, and then we transform our X variables to give us our X encoded data. So now we've gone from uh, columns that are factor variables to now additional columns from the one hot encoding. If for the uh, numerical values, we're going to do the shift and scaling, so minus in the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. Again, loading in the standardizer machine, fitting it on our uh, data, this time passing in the features that we're interested in shifting and scaling. And this gives us our, finally our X trans, so the, uh, all the data are now encoded and transformed and ready to model using MLJ. So the very first model that we're going to fit, this is going to be the null model, and this is what we expect all of our other models to try and beat. Um, it's a constant model, so we're just going to predict a constant default rate, and this is coming up from the overall average default rate of the loans in the data set, which when we look at the accuracy is about 91.8%. So on average, these loans default uh, about, say, just under 10%. All our other models we hope should beat this, otherwise what are we actually doing? Um, and so, yeah, make sure this is, uh, everything is better than this. Now, I said at the start that taking on a higher amount of interest means that you're probably more likely to not get your money back. So we can test that by fitting a single variable linear model just by passing in interest rate from the transform data set, fitting that model, and then seeing what those metrics look like. No real changes. The log loss goes slightly lower. Um, but the accuracies and the cappers and all the other ones don't really change too much. But what is interesting to see is that the interest rate, as that increases, the default rate of those loans does increase. So what we said at the start, higher interest rate leads to a higher default, does appear to be uh, at least true in practice. OK, we've got all our variables. Let's throw them into the logistic regression and see how well we do um, as a prediction. So again, creating our logistic machine, passing in all the data now, training it on the training set and evaluating it in the exact same way, we get a 2% increase in accuracy. Happy days, it's doing slightly better. Uh, the machine learning is actually doing something here. The loss scales have gone down slightly and the AUC has gone up as well. So this basic linear regression is helping us predict what loans are doing and whether they're going to default or not. So there is some information in all the variables that we've chucked in. Do we actually need all those variables, though? We can start penalizing the regression, so trying to let the machines work out whether uh, a certain coefficient does have an effect on the default or not. And this is where we're going to start tuning the hyperparameters using MLJ. This time, we're creating a tuned model and passing it in the ranges of the two different uh, variables that we've got, gamma and lambda, in this elastic net regression. And then we iterate through 25 different combinations of those parameters and find out what 
variables give us the best model. So we've got a final tuned elastic net regression model that we evaluate again using those same metrics. Doesn't really do too much to the accuracy or the other metrics. And this is because the data isn't really that big and there isn't really that many variables being included. There's only about 2,000 loans in this data set and all the previous variables I've shown hasn't made it too much of a bigger problem. But you can imagine as time goes on and there's more loans and we start including more variables, this is where this might become more important. Right, let's move on to some non-parametric models, the uh, big fancy word that hopefully improves our accuracy. K nearest neighbors is where we're trying to separate all the different loans into their own clusters and try and work out which loans are similar to other ones and then look at the uh, overall uh, default rate of those ones, of those loans together. The default value of K is five, so each of the loan will try and find five other similar loans and then we'll look at those, uh, it's those default rates there. And we can see that the accuracy does slightly better than the null model, but similar to the linear regressions, no real uh, improvements. And the log loss actually gets a lot worse where this is a slightly different approach to the model. But why five? Five is just a default value. We should probably tune this model and see what the optimal number of nearest neighbors are. And this is what we do again using the tuning uh, phrase or tuning state of the models. We're going to go from K from five all the way up to 100 and then see what the AUC looks like and then use that to dictate what we should actually use. This is the AUC on the graph and then the best one is about K equals 14 for some reason. So there's a bit of a uh, interpretability problem. Why should we trust this K equals 14? Who really knows? But it's more of a demonstration of how we tune these types of models. The accuracy, again, slightly better than the null model, but no real uh, major changes. Random forest models and XG boost models, uh, again, these are fitted in the exact same way. You don't need to see more code of me loading in the packages and things like that. We can go through, tune their hyperparameters and come up uh, with their results in the exact same framework using MLJ because someone's done the hard work of writing the interfaces uh, beforehand and I can just benefit from using the simple functions. But most importantly, this is where we start getting some good accuracies. 95%, much better than the null model, much better than what we've seen before. And also the log losses and the Brier losses much lower as well. So it looks like what the random forest models and the XG boost models are doing here is good and this is how we should proceed. We've got lots of different independent models now. We've got linear regression, we've got the K and N, we've got the forest models. We can combine them all into something that we call a stacked model. Um, and you'll find if you've ever been on Kaggle or done some of their competitions, this does uh, work quite well for lots of different problems. And MLJ make it very easy for you to do that as well. So you just use the stack function, tell it what the meta learner is. So in this case, logistic regression, because we're predicting the default rates, how we're going to resample, and all the different models that get inputted into this big model. Um, and then again, create the machine, fit it, evaluate it. So exactly the same process. You just need the previous models. And this is an easy way to combine all that different uh, information that we get from the other models. So all the previous evaluation has been on the training set. So it's always seen the data. It's probably not great. We should really be evaluating these models on our test set, 30% of the data that the models have never seen before. And we can see that our stack model is the best, at a 61% kappa, better than the average, and a decent AUC as well. And the XG boost and the random forest models do very well as well. So everything that we saw in the train set previously seems to be true on the test set as well. So all that we've done, hopefully I've convinced you that we can model the default rate using the data and get a decent model coming out of it. So now we can think about what the outputs look like. So in this case, on the x-axis, this is our predicted default rate. And on the y-axis is the actual default rate. And we seem to be increasing our predictions with the uh, actual default rates true. So we can say that these models appear to be well calibrated. So we can go forward and hopefully use the model output to try and predict what loans will default, let that guide our investment decisions, and hopefully make some money. So making bets. I've done the Julia bit. I've done the data bit. Now onto the finance bit. Using our model, we're going to now invest in any of our loans if the model thinks there's less than a 50% chance of defaulting. A very basic strategy, but we're essentially saying we've got some information. Let's use that to guide our investment process. And this gives us four different outcomes. Uh, to start at the top, the missed opportunities. This is where we haven't invested because the model has predicted that it's going to default, but it hasn't defaulted after all. And that has happened seven times, and this has cost us a profit of 0.675. Because when each we make the decision, we invest one unit, and then afterwards we get uh, one bit back. Yeah, go on, question? Wait, it defaults, you lose everything. 
You lose everything. If, if successful, you're only earning the interest rate. Yes. Right? So it should be, the, the chance of it defaulting should be related to the interest rate. Well, that's where, where um, so the question was, if it defaults, we lose all our money, but if it pays anything back, we'll get our money back plus some interest rates. Um, but a very basic strategy is what we're doing here is we're just going to invest based off the model output rather than the, uh, what the interest rate is. We're not really concerned. It's a very dumb uh, approach, but we're just trying to see if the model knows. Yeah, well, like for the model prediction, if you're going to make money, shouldn't the default rate be a lot less than the given what the payoff is? Uh, potentially, potentially. I think we'll... Uh, well, we could probably talk about it after right, if I've missed something uh, fundamental there. Hopefully not. Um, but the, yeah, so the missed opportunities in this case, uh, we would have, we've lost out an opportunity of uh, 0.765. The bad loans that we've correctly avoided, um, where we haven't invested because that probability of default is less than 50, and it has actually defaulted. There was 30 of them, so we've managed to avoid 30 problems. Uh, and this has meant we haven't lost 30 units. And then into when we've actually made money, our money-making loans, where we have invested and it hasn't defaulted, has given us a profit of 66.48, so roughly 10% of the number of ones we've invested in, because the average interest rate is around 10%. And then the ones that have actually lost money, our model thought they wouldn't default, but they have defaulted, and that's cost us 35 units. But at the end of the day, 66 minus 35, we're up. This strategy seems to have uh, made some money. But the actual uh, strategy of investing everything based on the um, output probably isn't optimal. We're throwing away a lot of information in this case, um, and we need to resize our bets based off what we think the model is. So the model is giving us an outputted probability, and this is where we're going to use the Kelly betting formula to size what, how much we're actually going to invest. Now, a very famous theorem that is used in lots of different places, we have some fraction of our capital, of our total capital that we're going to bet, based off the probability of winning and the payoff that that uh, loan is going to come in. So if we do some maths and rearrange our data, we come out with our model output, which is the probability of default, and the interest rate to give us our optimal bet size for each of those individual loans. So if we go through again and we look at the ones where we made money, this hasn't actually changed um, whether we're going to invest in something or not because uh, we're still going to make our investment decision based on that 50% rule. It's just going to change how much we are betting on each of the loans. And the money makers, they've reduced their profit from 66 to about 59. So slight reduction in profit there. But more importantly, the losers have gone from costing us 35 units to now only costing us 20 units. Now, this is because where we've not been certain in our prediction, we've had a uh, lower probability of default versus the actual interest rate that we're going to get. This is where um, we've adjusted our bet size down, and so it's not cost us as much by betting just one unit each and every time. And the actual final profit gives us 39 and 11 units compared to the 31 units uh, previously. So Kelly betting here has improved the actual outcomes of our overall uh, performance. So happy days. So in summary, um, there's some fun data out there if you know where to look. So I stumbled across the State Guru, um, saw that they gave their data available and thought it would be an interesting problem. Uh, I wrote the blog post and ended up doing this talk on it. So yeah, there's uh, fun things to do with the data in Julia. MLJ is a great little package that does everything you want in just one interface. So I would really recommend anyone uh, to get really involved in it and just yeah, explore all the different machine learning there. Um, and I should, probably should highlight and understand the risks in these types of problems as well. Estate Guru is just a simple company operating out of Europe. It could go bankrupt one day. It's not the uh, only risk happening. And uh, you can't machine learn away those types of risks at the end of the day. Uh, if you want to read the blog post, that's the link uh, where I've written more in depth, a bit more code as well. Um, and it's probably interesting to note, really, on the notes of the risks. Uh, generally, the default rate was fairly stable. I published the uh, blog post in July last year, and then as the macroeconomic conditions have changed, uh, the default rate's gone up quite a bit. So I wonder if my model would have carried on doing as well, or would have things gone uh, very wrong very quickly afterwards. So just goes to show uh, you can't always predict what's going to happen just from the data in front of you. Thank you. Any questions?
Did you actually try it? Like, no. did you actually put the money down? <laughs> no, it would have been a nightmare for compliance reasons with my job and things like that. So, yeah, no, I uh, didn't decide to, unfortunately. But, yeah. So the, the Kelly bet fraction is like for treating each um, loan individually, but are any of them contemporaneous? Because then like to bet that fraction on each one would assume they're all uncorrelated, but if they are correlated, you have to, I mean, or, or you could just average the bet fraction. I just want to know like. Each, yeah. no, each bet gets, each loan gets its own Kelly bet. So, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but if you have like 10 of them at once, it's like, if you apply that fraction, all of them, like add it up, that would be assuming they're all Yeah, yeah, there, right? there's an additional, yeah, you can't, you, when you're doing multiple bets, there's additional formulas that you have to take into account. I have written about that previously as well, actually, uh, a long time ago, but yeah. Um, typically, you don't do the full Kelly bet as well. It's typically a half Kelly bet in practice, which reduces down the variance and things like that. But yeah, there's other considerations that have uh, been simplified away in this blog post, definitely, and this talk. But yeah, mm -hmm. definitely more optimizations there. Mm -hmm. So as far as I understand, on Kaggle, um, random forests do well, and also neural networks. But there was no neural network here. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, I saw MLJ Flux is a package, though, so I could probably uh, increase it there. Um, but I, I generally tend to stay away from neural networks in this type of problem. Like I said, there's only 2,000 loans, and uh, the amount of data or the amount of predictors involved as well was very small. So I, I struggled to see if there would be that much of a benefit in neural networks, but uh, I could be proven wrong. I think one thing that would work really well, and you could add to the list of models is the symbolic regression, actually, because then you can verify that the, the equation is simple enough. And you can also do that conformal um, technique to, to get the probability range. Oh, yes, I've made notes. Don't worry about that. I've, uh, yeah, we'll be exploring both of them. So yeah, thanks, thanks to the other talkers. Or, all right, if there are no more questions, we can give a, <clears throat> Dean another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we have around seven minutes if you want to stretch your legs or so. Take advantage of this time.
So unfortunately, our ne next speaker couldn't make it for visa reasons, but we have a close collaborator who, give, who will give a probably a shorter talk. No, I have one. Wait just one second. Oh. I don't know, does it work here? Yeah, well, uh, welcome everyone. And yeah, well, we have a bigger than expected technical issue. My collaborator, who should have presented the talk, couldn't make it, and then had um, other issue which avoided him to um, kind of hand in the actual talk material. But, well, I mean, since you're here, and I guess uh, you're interested in basically um, differential differentiable programming on, on GPUs. Um, I will just, maybe a bit shorter than you have an hour, but can give you an overview of basically what was the topic in the talk that should have been given, combining quickly two things. So I'm sorry that the title is not the one that's on the program, but it's kind of the essence. And well, I guess I can give you um, a higher level overview, maybe not to the exact point what, what's in the abstract, but I'm kind of open to discuss afterwards uh, yeah, with you, or we can then discuss what should have been in the talk. But um, the, the kind of material is, is the same. So kind of that's something that I presented yesterday at the Julia for HPC. So well, who we are, we are kind of uh, in a glaciology lab and uh, collaborating, so myself, Ludovic, and Ivan, uh, who was the original presenter of the talk, we're in Zurich at the Glaciology Lab, um, and we're collaborating with Sam and other people uh, in Julia and supercomputing. And so what we are interested after is to kind of bring Julia to kind of um, at scale and use Julia to tackle, well, GPU computing and GPU supercomputers, but yeah, to do science with it. And um, yeah, the, so the science uh, we do uh, is, or currently we're interested in, in ice flow model and so like large scale model. Uh, the way we do it, we kind of work on different tools, but one of the current tool we're developing is called Fast Ice. Uh, it's a um, kind of fluid dynamic stoke solver like in 3D, it works also in like lower dimension, but so we're doing CFD type computation, but 
for viscous fluid with application to uh, earth and environmental sciences. Um, but yeah, the domain we tackle are pretty big, so it kind of makes it impossible to do it on a single laptop or even on a, just a server node. So that's why we need to scale out and go on supercomputers. Um, one reason why Julia is interesting for us, maybe just briefly, is that it really reduces the, or makes the development cycle more easy. So with Julia, it's easy to prototype. When we have a prototype, we try to develop our tools that they kind of scale, or directly the same code, could we, we could scale it up, like developing on the laptop while commuting, uh, fixing things, and then while go to work and kind of can launch things on a server, on a supercomputer, and with the idea that there is a single code that does all, because that's kind of really uh, improves the um, kind of, well, avoids bug, make the kind of development cycle kind of less costly. And so we got like recently a flagship project, which is um, of the biggest European supercomputing allocation, which is like running Julia on GPU on the Lumi supercomputer. And for this, we got about 5 million GPU hours to actually resolve uh, ice flow in 3D over Greenland. And well, there just ice flow modeling is nothing new, but what we're really after is like for uh, long story short, is the map here that you see is a flow speed over Greenland. Where it's red, it doesn't move. Where it's blue and purple, it moves at kilometer per day. And so there are a couple of so-called ice streams where most of the ice is lost of Greenland. So, Actually, the, the, the major outlet, the major loss of mass of, uh, of ice that then ends up in the um, ocean and well, contributes to sea level rise is uh, only by a couple of few outlets where kind of it goes super fast. Mm. And then well, the question is like, okay, we really would need to better understand why it's happened there and not there. And like for this, there are models that exist, but they, they use parametrization, and now the goal is really to try to get more, more physics inside. And to get this physics, well, one needs uh, models that actually resolve this physics, uh, physical processes, which is like strain localization, heat localization, spontaneous localization, and these processes, well, they need to be resolved at an accurate, like in space and time, which requires like, small time steps, so one needs to take small snapshots, which means many snapshots to kind of cover a finite time. And one also needs to kind of have an actual, like a high enough spatial resolution because well, otherwise we, well, if, yeah, basically, uh, if you want to see small features on a TV screen that has a bad resolution, it's not that they're not there, it's just like you cannot, you will miss it. Like, and so that's a bit uh, the challenge. And so, the good news with all this, and maybe also the exciting step that I will now cover a bit more, is really the, so we have data. Huh? There is some, this map here is mostly satellite data, so kind of one has data for a surface, what's happened on the surface, but what we're interested after, obviously, is rather what happens at the interface with the bedrock. So, uh, and there it comes, so we'll try to uh, make some use, use this data, which is usually the case when you have data, you have a model, then you would need to kind of make some procedure to integrate those data in the model. And well, that's kind of UQ and optimization. And so, well, now we are trying, we are after trying to combine some tools that would work good for us to make that happen in parallel, massively parallel on GPUs. So yeah, well, the kind of global um, framework where we do it. So it's like full stoke simulation and coupled some multi-physics. So it's not only the formation and mechanics, but it's also like heat. So temperature evolution, how temperature is coupled back to the deformation, how deformation may impact back the temperature, and uh, potentially also uh, like the uh, fluid flow. So well, when you heat up the ice, at some point it would, even before really melting, it would still increase the moisture level in the ice, so you generate water content, and this water content would impact also the mechanical behavior of the ice, and so on, and that's, those are tightly coupled processes, so uh, yeah, obviously there is kind of some multi-physics uh, going on. So maybe just to kind of show what those things look like, so that's a, that's a synthetic case where we have a valley-like, um, 
um, bedrock, and then there is ice here, and here we were looking, well, we are investigating like the effect of basal roughness, so the, how the basal topography basically would impact uh, flow localization. So if I run the movie, um, so the arrows here, they show like how the, it's inclined, so over time, basically the ice flow would, would accelerate, and at some point when it gets uh, suffic oops, sufficiently fast, I don't know if I can, I can pause it. When it goes sufficiently fast, you will see there's some lentils here that are contoured that appear, and that's basically where um, it heats up enough because of what's so-called, so one sees it here, so it heats up enough on the bumps by so-called shear heating, so uh, internal deformation of the ice would kind of lower the, like would make it easier to flow, and then those uh, patches would start to connect like it's displayed here and create some internal shear zone or some some layer where it slides easily, and that would act like a, yeah like a preferential uh, slip layer. And with this, we well that's kind of the things we're after because those well those would lead to if that happens locally then you would get like instead of having the ice to viscously deform like uh, honey flowing down a slope, it can just slide like a, like a plug much faster. And those type of things we're, um, we're interested to kind of tackle and resolve with uh, our, um, our approach. And obviously you can see that welder is a good candidate because so we can predict surface velocities on the top and um, then M try to match it with observable and, well, kind of try to invert what are, for example, material parameters like in the eyes or a characteristic of the bedrock that would give us a better fit of those velocities. And that's called this inversion um, approaches. And yeah, so that this I talked like more yesterday in, in an hour workshop, but so the, as I said a bit in the introduction, so. The reason why we use Julia is that it's really, um, it allows us, empower us to, to do this like in a very, uh, on a high level, more high level fashion, in a more integrated thing. So let's say it's portability in many ways uh, because while well, it's portable, we, have a, we try to have a single code, it's portable, we can try to target different architecture, it's portable in the development because, well, we can, yeah, somehow do it, so it, it can become somehow a one-man activity kind of, um, because, yeah, it's all contained. And also performance portability, because all this becomes somehow portable and performant. So that's really, in a nutshell, why, why it's interesting. And the uh, Julia language now on top of that has this killer feature, which is differentiability of the entire stack. So Julia is mostly written in Julia, and Julia has these um, differentiable programming capabilities that would, yeah, since since the a, uh, automatic differentiation tool, like enzymes, zygot, uh, forward diff, et cetera, they know what to expect. They, they will get like to crunch Julia language that can be handled properly, which is very different from other languages where obviously there are AD tools that exist in for Fortran that exist maybe for C or C++, but obviously then if you have some um, kind of general purpose Python-based code that would call in compiled functions, you won't be able to differentiate that entire stack. So we'll be able maybe to differentiate the compiled code with a specific tool. So that's kind of the problem that you would hit with other kind of framework and that in Julia you don't have because, well, it's all consistent. Um, yeah, so maybe before I'll just show you kind of how kind of uh, vanilla workflow looks like, and then we can, I have a little demo on actually using automatic differentiation within Julia to make a, a joint-based inversion, so that's uh, one way of making optimization that's classically done in computational glaciology, computational geodynamics, let's put it computational earth sciences. So, but maybe to make it less dry, and I'm sorry for those who didn't want, who didn't come here to look at code, but I guess that's a uh, pretty uh, nice little piece of code. Um, thanks to Julia, thanks to the kind of work we tried to do to make it math close, so 
uh, I guess everyone recognizes here that we have some flux that we compute in the first function, and these flux, we balance them to update the quantity h. Uh, could be a shallow ice equation here where h is the integrated height, like the, the height that one measures, but it can be just heat diffusion or, or any other thing. Uh, and, and the approach we take and why Julia is interesting for us is that we, here we kind of work. There are several of these packages that try to uh, abstract a bit the back end, and that's what's done in Parallel Stencil, for example, a package that we're, uh, we're working on uh, with well, Sam, uh, myself, and others, uh, where we kind of can first, we can have, well, different precision support, different number of dimension. Here it's a 3D code, and maybe most interestingly, we can have like support for various back end so called, so it can target CPU threads, it can target a uh, any AMD GPUs, and also NVIDIA GPUs, and uh, well, metal and soon all, well, all what's available, for example, in the Julia GPU stack. And then basically we can write these functions that are backend agnostic uh, and uh, call them somehow in the main. And well, like, like Julia works, so just in time compile, we, there's optimi optimization passes by the languages, and we apply stencil uh, optimization on top of that, such that it's kind of hidden by the user, but there is some kind of some interesting thing going up in the, in the background um, uh, that makes the code performant and target like spe specific for different, for example, GPU architecture without putting the burden on the user to actually have to, to, to know about all that and write it and somehow um, I use those codes for I mean, the teaching I'm doing and like, well, code that fit in a single page. Uh, every student can somehow get what's going on. And on top of that, it runs at close to memory copy performance on, for example, latest GP. Um, and yeah, so for those who kind of have some knowledge on that, so I, Julia is actually going, doing good also in HPC, so well, for example, we benchmark the things versus like classical heap C++, so that, so that would be the, the, the standard AMD uh, GPU um, DSL to do things in C++, and we get like same performance. Doesn't mean that, uh, yeah, so that just means that for Julia, for us, it's really good that we perform at least as good as others. Um, yeah, and then, so, to scale up and to do more things with our little code. So for example, now this little code I showed before was like, would run on a single server, like on a single GPU on my laptop, for example. But now if I want to take that to kind of to scale out to supercomputer, I basically only need to add these couple of lines where that are highlighted in red. So I can use some package that's um, uh, handles this domain decomposition. So basically for those for which it rings a bell MPI in the background, and I can then, uh, well, initialize what's called a global grid, so how much time I want to replicate my local process, um, and just update Halo, so the thing how it works, stencil on distributed computing, so I have little local processes, but they, each sub process doesn't know about the other, but they talk, we are boundary conditioned, and either if you're on the edges, you have the global physics boundary condition, if you're internally, you exchange boundaries between neighboring process, that's done by the update halo and the tear down the thing. But still, little code fits in a page, and it's fairly understandable, which is the beauty of, I guess, of Julia. And then, yeah, with those little codes, we get very good parallel efficiency, so kind of trying to see how much how much we lose from going from one, one GPU to thousands of GPU, it's only a couple of percent, and that's also very, uh, very nice features. Um, and now the big thing, so actually the differ differentiable programming is actually not much more complicated in, in Julia, and that's really nice. Um, there are these, well, extraordinary tools that, that do it. Uh, we, well, there are many, um, or there are a couple of different. We use Enzyme because Enzyme is the only one that supports to actually differentiate, truly differentiate through GPU kernels. So GPU programming is a bit specific because the code that executes on the GPU has to be, well, statically typed, and then it kind of goes down another compilation path, and so it's kind of a bit tricky. And this, well, en what Enzyme does, it, it analyzes the, really the, the GPU kernels and actually would create yet another GPU kernel to do the uh, accumulation, the, the reverse kind of, um, the reverse functionality that we do with AD. And that's built in in Julia, and so we included it in our package, and 
yeah, so basically that's what called, uh, that's the forward model, and then if I had now an inverse model, it would just, yeah, basically need to add where I want to accumulate my gradients uh, with respect to, I can define if I want uh, which kind of mode I want, so if I want a gradient with respect to the residual, and that's done by default, and then I get by my gradient, which I can then use to make, uh, to make my, adjoint, um, my adjoint solutions. And um, performance-wise, it's super interesting because, uh, so the forward models, we, so how we measure here uh, is like memory throughput, so we are memory bound, so memory operations, or memory access is really what limits us. And so the forward model is really, well, we are not at memory throughput here with that example, but uh, with latest optimization, we can get very close. And still, we're more than about a terabyte per second here. And the inverse model, so the inverse, the AD-based call of the forward function is uh, get half of the throughput. For a function that does much more things, that's not written by me, but generated by at um, compile time, and that's actually super good. And it runs on the GPU, like with the same launch parameters, et cetera, so it's very, in that sense, it's very portable. And yeah, the cool thing though is that we need much less iteration for the, or we need to less, to call much less time the um, kind of um, um, uh, yeah, um, AD based function. So at the end of the day, we kind of, the, 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 the adjoint solve or the, in, the, the, the AD based thing we need to make the adjoint solve uh, goes much faster just because also we have less iteration. And the base performance isn't that bad uh, neither. So in the remaining, um, yeah, in the remaining two, three minutes, what I can uh, just kind of show you is uh, something we did at the workshop. So it's not on, uh, it's not on ice flow there. It was just to, uh, to, motivate the, to motivate the thing, but yeah. So that's a, that's a um, demo setup, for example, where here I have, um, so I have a solution where I have injection, so it's kind of underground operation. So I have diffusion, well, diffusi a diffusive process, and I have injection and extraction of um, fluid in a porous reservoir. And I have two wells, and this is my pressure distribution, and that's how my underground looks like. So I have a permeability or a, like diffusivity that's one, and that's very low in the middle where I have a barrier. and um, and that's the fluxes, and that would be the solution of my four model. So I run a steady state, and that's kind of my pump in, pump out setup. And now, what I want to do is I want to say, okay, I have observation, these uh, white dots, where I know I have a pressure sensor. And then I want to uh, actually uh, try to guess or invert for what, what, is, what needs the permeability to be such that, um, yeah, such that the with my new permeability guess, computed pressure field at those points, and I try to minimize that error. And uh, this, doing it with the adjoint approach, uh, what I need to do, so I would have to have basically um, one forward solver that I use to make my synthetic here, but that also would just solve the, uh, so that's this little thing here, where I just solve my fluxes, update my fluxes, uh, get my pressure residual, update my pressure, and, and that's it. And that's kind of, with this I can e evaluate a forward solution for, for a given uh, layout. And then I have the adjoint solution, which is nice in that iterative framework that we use. It's exactly the same structure, it's just now the kernel, they're kind of, uh, because it's the transpose, so they're shifted, but um, they, it's exactly the same structure, so it's very simple to change. And this code here, where I'll show you the result, is like all in all, uh, with visualization, 300 lines, and it does everything. It's kind of self-contained somehow, which makes it also very nice and easy to, to debug things. And if we go back so to our inversion setup, uh, we can go through the inversion steps. So we start from an initial solution, and this is with 50 steps of vanilla gradient descent, where the actually a joint solver, I didn't kind of derive anything. I just use AD to build my adjoint solution and use it in a gradient descent where I just update uh, with the adjoint solution and the forward solution. I use it to um, kind of build up my, 
to get my gradient, and then I use this gradient to try to find a better distribution of permeability. And then if I go along the lines, I see that, well, I converge somewhere, and at the very end, well, I found I reduced my, or my loss rate, or et cetera, uh, my error in the inversion procedure decreased two and a half order of magnitude, and I found a um, distribution of permeability that would make the pressure at the observation points uh, kind of minimize that, that thing. And, and that code here, the one that I show you in front of your eyes, that's kind of the code, if you remember, so it uses implicit global grid, parallel stencil, well, this one is in 2D, but it runs on GPU, so, well, I have no more time here, and it may be a bit just uh, not on this, uh, straight to the point right now, but that code is on GitHub, and, well, if you take it and run it on GPU server, then the entire set of computation is done in parallel with MPI, on different GPUs, and well, if you have access to a supercomputer, you can just scale it out as well. So yeah, well, I mean to um, kind of, I leave this as an outlook, and again, I'm kind of apologize for not being exactly the talk that you expect to have, but I hope that I could still cover a bit like GPU-based AD, and yeah, I'm really open to, well, if you have questions or want to discuss, then we can, uh, yeah, you can reach out to me. Thank you. Okay, uh, very interesting work, thank you. Um, you didn't say this explicitly, but I, wasn't, I was a little bit unsure about how you define the inverse problem, because don't you need a likelihood function, or maybe you, you just use the difference between your simulation that came out of the PD, yes. PDE to the data, or, or something like this, and then you assume that this is some least yes. square difference or something? Yes, yeah, so in that sense here, yeah, since I was, um, I didn't have time to get those technical slides, but um, so the inverse problem, we define it as, the, so the, the, the loss function here is just the um, L2 norm of the observed versus the, well, um, data, or model versus data, so it's, it would be, uh, can, well, I have it here, it's like, it would, it, it would, return this, so we have some observation, and then to evaluate the loss, we evaluate one forward solve, and then we take the, yeah, st just standard, standard thing. Hi, uh, so the capability of uh, doing AD through GPU code is uh, super interesting. I was wondering whether you need LLVM to do the AD in the GPU code, right? So suppose somebody writes a CUDA kernel and then goes through the NVCC path, then is it possible to do AD through that code? Because NVIDIA doesn't give you access to the uh, internals of the LLVM. So do you run into that problem? Because I hear that uh, generating kernels through NVCC might have performance advantages sometimes. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's a good question. So the um I guess it's, so it's based on, so Enzyme uses um, kind of, uh, it, it's done at LLVM level, so I, I'm unsure it would work with just plain, but let's say C, CUDA, and NVCC, so that's really a, a feature of having actually the access to the, uh, to it in, in Julia, yeah. and it works at the GPU, right, below GPU compiler level, so uh, I guess for technicalities, I guess you, if you find Valentine, Shravi, then sure, I, I can. But, clear but yeah, I mean, it's that's the cool thing. That's really kind of well now since a couple of months, I go. It's really the killer. Well, at least for us, it's really the killer feature of of yeah. Julia. One of the killer feature because well, it, it really allows to to differentiate well. Are like at least arbitrary uh, GPU code, meaning like at least CUDA, AMD GPU, and one API, I guess they will yeah. be differentiable, um, sure. yeah, and on a high performance yeah. um, kind I mean, of. This upgrade. will be a good uh, growth path to have. Uh, I will talk to Valentin. Super. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. All right, we're out of time, but let's thank him again a little week. Yeah, thank you. And next we have our last speaker for Tuesday morning, uh, Gajendra. And he talk is titled Free Musketeers, Sherlock Holmes, Mathematics, and Julia. So please take it away.
Good afternoon, everyone. So today I'll be presenting a talk on three musketeers, uh, Sherlock Holmes, mathematics, and Julia. So just uh, trying to draw, uh, trying to relate different concepts from different domains to solve the uh, crime scenes or cases. So in today's talk, we are going to discuss uh, what's a forensic investigation process, Dauber standard, and Julia, and uh, uh, real-world problems uh, like. Uh, uh, pressure of a shoe print on a soft ground and okay so then uh, digital forensics applications so let us see uh, the definition of uh, forensic science it's the use of scientific methods or expertise to investigate crimes or examine evidence that might be presented in a court of law. So that's the goal of forensic uh, investigation process. So you have to present your findings as an evidence in the court of law. So for that, you have to follow the scientific methodology. You have to follow the procedure led by the uh, court, procedure led by the um, government. So if you don't follow the procedure, then your evidence will not be admitted in the court. Then here, mathematics can be used to determine how crimes are committed, when they are committed, and who committed them. Then some of the mathematics concepts uh, which can be used are measurements, trigonometry, proportions, handling data, probability, and distributions. Of course, the list is endless. It depends on what kind of uh, crime you are solving. Then forensic scientists analyze the crime scene for possible clues pointing towards suspect and evidence. So we are going to use uh, languages like Julia or Julia to find out the evidence. So some of the forensic applications are lie detection, determining the time since death, then accident, uh, suicide or murder, then calculate the percentage of uh, concentrations, then compute uh, blood stain thickness, then ricochet analysis, and aspects of uh, ballistics, DNA analysis, and fingerprint analysis. Of course, these are some of the uh, examples. Then whenever we consider any forensic investigation process, so these are the six steps, identification, collection, validation, examination, preservation, and presentation. In the identification step, the investigation officer visits the crime scene location and tries to identify what are the objects he or she needs to take in his or her possession. Because there can be some devices which may look like toys, for example, toy USB. Right? So those should not be left out. And if there's a computer or a laptop, its state needs to be preserved. If it is off, then the uh, investigation officer needs to carry the system in the same state. If it is on, then he or she needs to just pull the plug so that it can retain the state. Because if you restart the system or if you start the system, the information stored in volatile memory will be lost. So there is an order in which the information should be collected. Always the order is you have to collect uh, least volatile information uh, the most volatile information first and least volatile information last. Right. Then after that, you have to validate the data. So you can't perform analysis on the original data. You need to make a copy of it. So when we say copy of it, we are speaking about disk to disk copy, not the physical file copy or folder copy. So we have to create system image. So there were some tools like uh, Norton Ghost, so, of course, there are some open source tools are also available which can help you to create the image of the entire system. Then next comes the examination. So in this step, actually, the investigation officer performs the analysis of the information, tries to find out the uh, pieces of evidences, and tries to correlate these different pieces. Then next is the preservation. Preservation is also very, very important. So it has to be stored in a locker at appropriate temperature and we have to ensure that no magnetic device or no other device is interfering with the evidence. If that happens again, the entire 
process has to be redone or and the most important thing is that the evidence will not be acceptable by the court then finally the presentation so this is most important because you are going to find present your findings in the court of law then there is something called as double standard so in united states federal law the double standard is a rule of uh, evidence regarding the admissibility of uh, expert witness testimony so a party may raise a dobert motion so it's a motion in limine raised before during trial to exclude the presentation of unqualified evidence to the jury so there are some illustrative factors defined by the court and they are part of scientific methodology so those factors are has the technique been tested in actual uh, field conditions and not just in laboratory has the technique been subject to peer review and publication what is the known or potential rate of error do standards exist for control of techniques operation and has the technique been generally accepted within the relevant scientific community so in 2003 brand carrier he published a paper exam and examine the rules of evidence standards including the dobert and he compared and contrasted the open source and closed source forensic tools and his conclusion was that using the guidelines of dobert tests we have shown that open source tools may more clearly and comprehensively meet the guidelines of requirements than would the closed source tools so julia is open source tool python is open source tool and both are known as scientific computing uh, languages so so no doubt so julia can be used here and when we apply these rules to julia language then we have to ask the questions in a different manner here so here we can ask like uh, can the programmer algorithm be explained so this explanation should also be in words not only in code then has enough information been provided such that thorough tests can be developed to test the program then have the error rates been calculated and validated independently has the program been studied and peer reviewed has the program been generally accepted by the community so julia satisfies these uh, illustrative factors so it can be used for forensic purposes so we'll see some real world problems so such as pressure of a shoe print on a soft ground then we'll try to decide whether uh, it's some suicide murder or accident then application of pythagoras theorem then resolution of human eye then finally the bank account analysis for many of the applications uh, just a simple formula will give the result just one or two lines code is enough so uh, that's why i don't have programs for many of these applications here for example consider this one so pressure of a shoe print on a soft ground so you can see the uh, image here so measurements are uh, taken of the length of the shoe prints and the depth and how far apart the prints are so based on this you can determine how tall the person is so the taller the person the longer the feet and the stride and the bigger the person the deeper the shoe print okay so based on that it gives you some idea regarding the suspect so formula which you can use here is p equal to mg by a so where g is approximately 10 meters per second square so m is the body mass and a is the contact area with the surface so the unit of measurement is in terms of pascals so just a simple formula will give the result just substitute the values and you will get the result the next is the suicide accident or a murder so consider here there is a building and from that building one dead body has fallen right so based on the distance right based on the launch angle you can decide whether it is a suicide murder or accidental fall so there is something called as launch angle so this launch angle is important indication if launch angle is 0 degrees then it is accidental fall if it is suicide then it is 21 to 38 degrees if it is murder then again it will be very low okay so that is because there will be initial force which is applied to the body so whenever uh, someone jumps or whenever some someone throws the body so for this you can use this formula y is equal to h plus tan theta of x 
minus g by 2 raised to mu square cos square theta into x square. So these are all just single line uh, formulas. You just need to substitute the values and you can determine the, you can get the result very easily. The next is the Pythagoras uh, theorem, which is very famous, right? So all of you know it. So the square of uh, hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. So that is a square plus b square is equal to c square. So let's see how it can be used. So it can be used to detect artifact smuggling. For example, uh, the authorities have a video evidence of a possible suspect in the museum break-in. So the suspect was seen carrying a briefcase measuring 20 inch long by 16 inch high by 3 inch wide. So one of the artifacts stolen was 24 inch long and 2 inch wide. So investigators are trying to determine if this artifact was possibly smuggled out of the museum in this suspect's briefcase. So here the Pythagoras theorem can be applied to the dimension of the briefcase. So here we get it is as 20 square plus 16 square is equal to 656 and the square root of 656 is 25.6 inch. So the length represents the widest space of the briefcase. Since it is greater than the length of the artifact, it is conceivable that the artifact was smuggled out of the museum in the briefcase. The next is the resolution of a human eye. So generally what happens is it is used for identification of an individual in the court. Right. So here consider an example of witness statement concerning the identification of an individual valid given that the suspect was some distance away at the time. So the fundamental result underlying this is that the unaided ideal human eye has the angular resolution limit of around one minute of arc which is equivalent to 0 0.0003 radians. Then such resolution limit means that any two distinct features in the in an object that subtend to an angle greater than this will be resolvable by the eye. So otherwise features will merge and appear blurred and indistinct. So if a particular feature is separated by dimension d lie at distance l from the observer then by the definition of radian we require the following condition to hold the object to be resolvable. That is d by l should be greater than 0 0.003 radians. So this is the problem here. So a witness with perfect eyesight who viewed the suspect from distance 200 meters in daylight claims that he was wearing the striped jumper with uh, stripes being around four centimeter wide. So is this statement scientifically reasonable? So here the condition for the image resolution becomes and it gives the result as 0 0.00 0 to radians. The next, uh, let's uh, move to the digital forensics part where most of the programming is involved and we may have to write more longer and more lengthier programs here and apply more advanced concepts also. So first important concept is the hash functions. So why do we compute hash functions? We compute the hash functions to ensure that the integrity, inform integrity of the information is maintained. So if someone modifies the information, then the hash code will definitely change. For example, consider this, here we have a message, hello world. And we have computed the hash code of hello world message and we have got some value. Now in the next example, what I have done is I have just added the extra space at the end of string hello world. So now you can notice here that the hash code changes. So even the small modification, if, if, if if you alter the evidence, so it's going to give you the different hash code. So the so that's why whenever the investigation officers they create the image, create the disk image of the hard disk, first thing they do is they compute the hash code and store it somewhere. Then they create the copy of it, and again for the copy also they compute the hash code. So both must match in all cases. So if there's a mismatch, then that's a prove that the evidence has been tampered. The next is the extracting metadata. So metadata is the information that is uh, data about data. For example, if you have a file, then we have information about a file. For example, when it is created, what's the size of the file, who created it, right? 
so when it was created and so on. So for this in Julia, you can make use of uh, file IO package along with specific other packages for extracting image information, for extracting audio information, for extracting video information, for extracting document information. So consider this here. You have to install these packages, that is file IO, then image magic, audio IO, and CSV files. Then you can import these packages by saying using statement, so using file IO, using image magic, then using audio IO, and using CSV files. Then next, the first thing you have to do is you have to set the path for e these different types of files. Then, then load the file, then use the package and get the information. Right? For example, if you want to get the information about an image, you have taken a photo. So in that case, the GPS location of the photo becomes very, very important. So that information is very vital, right? So similarly, with respect to audio, you can get the information about the audio length, audio type, what's the bit rate, and so on. Then similarly, with respect to CSV files. So these are just the examples, but this list can go on, and you may have to work with specific packages to extract the information about the files. The next is uh, forensic indexing and searching. Now, I have already uh, explained that investigation officers, they make the uh, image of the entire system, right? So that data will be in terms of gigabytes, right? So it is very difficult to search the information in that gigabytes of information. There will be thousands of files. So in that case, what you have to do is you have to build your own search engine for that particular data. So that is what we mean, forensic indexing and searching. So we are looking for specific information in the image, right? So once we get that inf information, then we can try to find out the links. So in this case, you can perform forensic indexing and searching using the packages called as light graphs and metagraphs. So metagraphs is the advanced version where you can have information in terms of graph. So, so you can add any information to the vertex. And you can have edges between th these vertices. So you can create a metadata graph by adding uh, the path here. So for example, you can see that there's a statement here, metadata is equal to dictionary. So dictionary key is defined as content, and that's the key, and the actual content is defined as the file content, you can also specify here the file path. And you are seeing here that we are adding it to the vertex. So likewise, we have to add all possible information which we want to index. Once the indexing is done, then we can go for search function. So you can write a function called as search evidence, which will basically does the graph search and gets you the matching vertices. The next is the logging package in Julia. Logging is, again, one of the very, very important aspects in Julia, right? Uh, not in Julia, in forensics, OK? So what happens is that whenever you perform forensic analysis and when you present the evidence in the court of law, your opposition lawyer may also question it, right? So if you have logging package, if you are logging everything, right? So which file you have selected? what columns you have selected, right? how you have performed the search, which algorithm you have used. Right? It has to record each and every step and create a document, so how, how it has done. So that if uh, the opposition lawyer or if any other person, if, re if he reproduces the results by following the steps mentioned, right, then that can be acceptable. Right? If it gives different results each time, then it's going to be problematic, and that evidence will not be accept accepted. So reproducibility is, again, very, very important aspect here. So this is how you can make use of logging uh, package. So basically, you can use it, and you can insert these different types of messages at various places of the program, so that it can record and it can print to a file, print to a log file, what is happening. So then next is the bank account analysis. So this is a pressing problem, uh, which I had also presented this as a lightning talk just uh, 
uh, half an hour ago. So in money laundering scenario, what happens is that, so there are three uh, stages. One is placement, then layering, then the integration. So whatever money you get, so that will be divided into several small chunks and it will be deposited into several bank accounts. And at the end, it will be integrated and it will reach the intended recipient. So now you can see here that the arrows which are shown in red color that depicts the uh, money laundering scenario, the arrows which depicts in uh, green color, that depicts the normal scenario. So basically we are going to follow this process. Uh, investigation officers are going to collect the information from various banks, right? And all of these statements will be having different formats. So first task will be to get all these statements into unified format. So once you get it into unified format, you can filter the bank statements uh, using Benford's law. So we'll see what is Benford's law. It's a first digit law or leading digit law. Basically, it's a distribution by which you can tell whether the money laundering has happened or no, basically. Again, it's, it gives you just a hint. Then import the suspicious accounts. Here you can import the data of PEP, that is politically exposed persons and relatives of politically exposed persons and also the sanctions data. Then generate a graph showing the links between the accounts and the transactions. This is very, very important. Then apply machine learning on the above graph then predict the possible money laundering, then also generate the chain of accounts with fraudulent transactions. But in all these uh, steps, you have to record the steps because it is very, very important for evidence verification and validation. Okay, so, so this is the Benford's law. So it's a f also called as leading digit law or first digit law. So you can see here, it shows what is the number of occurrence of each digit in the financial transactions. So one occurs at highest number of times, that is 30%, then two, 17%, three, 12%, four, 9%, and so on. So we have written a code in Julia, so which basically extracts the leading digits of credit and debit amount and plots uh, them in the Benford's distribution. So now you can see here that there is a blue bar, so which is the actual amount, and red one is the expected one. So there is a lot of deviation in the first case itself. So that means that there is a possible money laundering here. Whereas consider this, now your red dots are more aligned to the blue bars. So that means there is uh, no possible money laundering. Now when you... Uh, read the accounts, right? So you also need to generate a graph which shows the uh, relationship between different graphs. Now you can see here that in uh, between some vertices there's a dark line and between some vertices there is a blue line, uh, light line, right? So that means what? Uh, dark line means what? There have been more number of transactions between those accounts. There have been frequent uh, transactions between those accounts. So that gives a indication that there may be a possible uh, money laundering scenario there. Then in uh, conclusion, so forensic investigation is a highly scientific process. So since Julia is scientific computing language and conforms to double standard, it is one of the most suitable languages for developing forensic tools. And in forensics, accuracy of clues and evidence matters rather than the performance of the application. Thank you. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question about Benford's Law. Um, I know that many government institutions, although they don't admit it, they use Benford's Law to detect like uh, tax returns, frauds, and, and things like that. Uh, do you guys have some kind of metric to detect if, how much of a f possibility of fraud is happening when you look at this graph? Because you could also just take a look and visually try to decide if it's, there is a possibility of a fraud or not, but you guys have some kind of metric to numerically decide if 
there is a possibility of fraud or not. Yeah, correct. So Benford's law is just uh, one indicative tool. Uh, it doesn't mean that it just follows the Benford's law distribution. It doesn't mean that there's a possible money laundering or there is no possible money laundering. So it has to be combined with uh, more specific uh, machine learning algorithms and determine whether it is uh, money laundering or no. So it, it just gives you some indications. So generally what happens is the investigation officers, they need this data for various purposes. For example, whenever they are analyzing the bank statements, they want to know how much amount has been credited, how much amount has been debited in, uh, during a over a period of time. Right? How much money has been deb uh, debited from the ATM? How much money uh, the person has spent over POS? Right? How much money he has uh, uh, withdrawn from the ATM? Right? And they will also see what is his regular income and what is the match or mismatch. Right? So it is just one indication tools. Yeah. Okay. I have another question. Do we have time? Um, do you I, I imagine that you're coding most of your things, your tools, in Julia, right? And do you guys have to submit the code as an auditing procedure for the call when you guys are, I don't know, giving testimony? Yeah, we can submit. That's not a problem. But is it required? Yeah. Not necessarily, right? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Do we have any other questions? So I, I saw on your list of examples, you included a uh, ballistic analyst an analysis and a uh, list of examples mathematics can be used for. I know recently there's been news of ballistic matching um, to a certain gun being declared like a sort of a junk science in the Maryland Supreme Court um, that you can't match a gun, a bullet to being fired from a specific gun due to manufacturing tolerances would be over the whole batch. Do you have any comments about that or is that not really in your field? Uh, no, I don't have any comments. All right. Does anybody else have a question? If not, we can take a get our speaker and this is the end of our morning session. I'd like quickly remind uh, people who is part of the committee or who has been in the past and people who have served as, a, as chairs during this Juliacon that there's a lunch to discuss uh, the next Juliacon. So for people who has chaired and people who is part of the committee or, or has been pass part of the committee before, there's a lunch where we will discuss uh, the next Juliacon, so you're invited. We'll meet at the reception desk.
But um, I mean, there are a few, few possibilities that can go wrong. Sometimes just this works. You know. Yeah, it's all ready. Okay. This was it. Just two bottom things. Ah. And uh, we are doing a web test. Yeah. I had the camera trained on my podium. <coughs> and this is just the right thing. Yeah. The mic's already on. Perfect. Yeah. And if you could point out, if you need the point of this, if you need the point of this, you have a direct feed from the right hand. So this was. Ah, okay. Yeah, you're seeing this one. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Thank you for your support. I mean, it's way for the moderator. Yeah. <coughs>
everyone could take, please take your seats, please. We'll get started uh, on time. So my name is Mark Theosophical. I will be the session chair for this afternoon on last Friday. Um, I have the honor of introducing Stefan Som. Uh, Stefan is uh, the founder of Jordan IO, um, who I also point out is uh, one of the bronze sponsors for this conference, which is rather impressive given the, who else <laughs> has joined as a bronze sponsor. Um, I was quite impressed by that. Um, he's doing a lot of interesting things at Jordan IO, and today he's going to be talking to us about optical orientation for at macros. Um, so, Stefan, please. Thank you very much, Mark. It's a pleasure. I'm Stefan. You may know me from the Julia User Group Munich as well. I'm organizing this too, giving, yeah, inviting a speaker every other month and giving another introductory talk myself. And um, yeah, so you're invited to join us as well. We're going to stay online also for a bit while we also get some in person meetups in Munich. I'm going to speak to you about uh, some expression parsing. This is actually a, a quite old package of mine, um, which I used to build up the where trades package. <clears throat> so this will be the, the running example. Um, maybe short words about Jolin. So Jolin.io tries to kind of spread Julia really in, in Central Europe. I'm based in Munich in Germany. And I, I hope to get a broader community out in kind of mainstream industry, more focusing on data science. And you're welcome to check out cloud.jolin.io where this kind of first entry level product um, yeah, pass it on joland.io. Okay, so let's start. I have three little parts for today's outline. Um, the second one is a, like a really big overview slide. We'll go into detail. But first, some introduction to what this package of mine expression parses actually is about. And then we'll compare it to different ways how you actually can go on and yeah, do your little macro. There are a couple of ways by now in Julia, and I hope I, I yeah, build a really great little applied comparison. We will see some code on there. And the last remark kind of on some details that you can also kind of, if you go with the expression parsers route, <clears throat> you can also easily extend this. Okay, so what is expression parsers about? Um, so the idea is like, um, I, I have a goal in mind if I want to build my macro. And there it may come natural to you, it came to me, to first build a kind of parser, so de to define which kind of syntax you actually want to, to grasp. And yeah, and it's usually, if you build a macro, it's usually something different from normal Julia syntax. So it, yeah, it really makes sense kind of to have, in case, a really nested approach and, and build it on your own so that you really define what you, what you want to support. Then second step is you have this parser readily defined. You use this parse expression function and you get a parsed object back. So there's really kind of a distinction between parsers and parsed objects. You can mutate then everything which you get. Yeah, so it's a real, a real object which you can deal with. And if you're done, you use the, the second um, function to expression and you get a normal proper expression back. So this is the workflow I'm using, and yeah, so this is how this is built for. Let's take a look at some concrete code. So this is how it looks like. Let's um, take this little feature and zoom in a bit. Um, so yeah, uh, we start by, of course, using expression parsers. I, I skipped over this, apparently. <laughs> it gives you access to a little constant, the EP. I, I prefer this quite a lot because there are a lot of um, types which you use and um, yeah, coming from Python, this feels also natural to have kind of a short abbreviation and yeah, makes the code more concise. And this is really just there as soon as you type using expression parsers. Um, this abbreviation will be in your namespace. So we define then in this example a little parser which parses um, type ranges. They're the name. So um, they occur in where statements, and yeah, but you can also really just find them in normal Julia code. And yeah, you see we have kind of a little extra using the normal call. We can now kind of with all these parsers define the sub parsers, 
for, for the given parts. So in this case, we say a name should only be parsed if this is actually a symbol. Yeah, so um, we could take a look at the output. You see that um, it defaults actually to have a, a check on whether this is type of an any. So, yeah, it really, this is a type checks just whether it's, yeah an instance of the given type. And for our name, we now have our special check that we really only accept symbols. Okay, so then you parse this, you give in your, your expression, and you see that it will fail if, um, yeah, if the given part does not match. So in here, really one, two, three is not passed as a symbol, but this is a, a literal value, and hence it will fail. So this is a, conceived example, but you can imagine now you really have your custom support and you can build it right into the parser. Yeah, so this yeah, gives you a check. So what you get back then is really also a well-typed object. If it succeeds, you get the type range with the underscore parsed, and this is, yeah, every other parser follows the same pattern. They are defined always in this twin setup. You have a parser and you have the parsed object, and for simplicity, there's not another module collecting all the parsed objects, but it's really on the same namespace, simplifying access, but with this underscore parsed. And you see we get it and we kind of also get these extra parts and this is kind of the reason also why this is there. So um, I named the, this talk object orientation for macros and it is like you have in Julia many ways to kind of represent similar things. The most common which you think of as functions. Yeah, You have this um, multi-line function syntax and you have the one-liner and they are different syntax for the very same thing and also here having a type range yeah you we also have different syntax we have kind of the the smaller one yeah we have the bigger one we have kind of the real in between range and and they are all kind of the same as like a type range and and this is now yeah summarizing it for for this part so we get the lower bound which is then defaulting to union the, the empty union, as you know, and if we would have defined it the other way around, then the upper bound would default to any. Yeah, so this is there for your convenience. This is really a type range in a, in a semantic sense. You don't need to care about the precise syntax which was used. This is then passed for you. So this is yeah, the intention of this package to make this into a, a reusable component. We can also change it afterwards. So while the parser is actually immutable, uh, which makes sense for, for constructing a parser. To be safe, this is really the parser you want. The parsed object then is mutable. You can change it after the fact, which is usually also what you want to do, and then yeah, reconstruct whatever your macro wants to do. Okay, so this is um, my little intro to kind of what's the, the flair of the package. And now, um, yeah some more overview first bef before we get into one example comparing it with other approaches. So this is just an overview, um, what is all there. So yeah, we have some basics, like yeah, this is all object orientated, so we have kind of a little, an extra type for all of this, which is handy for then some um, dispatch, Julia dispatch, so, but there's kind of general support. If, some, if you only have a predicate, yeah, you can wrap it into satisfies predicate. We have this is a, which we used already, and some these two extra constants, anything or any symbol, used quite a lot in my code. But we have then also kind of these standard expressions, so like a function, and breaking down the function, there's this, um, a parser for signature, for call, for an argument. This is also a very complex thing in Julia. Yeah, there are quite a couple of ways to represent an argument in the um, expression tree. And yeah, we have assignment and, and so forth. So um, there may probably be something missing. Actually, having a co um, looking more into it, I already spot that the if else is currently not represented. It just didn't pop up um, for my case. So as usual, yeah, you forget about something. So this would be a natural addition, yeah. And there may be other parts in Julia. Um, yeah, but if else is probably going to be added soon here. There are some meta parsers which are quite neat. <laughs> the most important is probably the any of, so just the or concatenation of the parsers. The first one which passes correctly gets the hit and is returned. And because it's all kind of object oriented, you have this type information with, which captures which parser actually hit. 
So you then use just normal Julia dispatch and you're ready to go. So very handy, but for completeness there's all off OS. Yeah, similarly. And there's a special uh, macro because sometimes you have some complex thing and reuse kind of a, a type range for the one and for the other part. And there's a little um, wrapper named which you can give a tag. Um, just like, yeah, in Julia we can use this as part of the type. And so, yeah, this is just kind of a helper type surrounding it if you have some more complex stuff. And if the past result will then also be wrapped here so you can dispatch on your custom name tag. That was handy if you have kind of similar structures. A type range for the one and type range for the other, we're going to see that. There's a very special one for creating kind of really complex parsers. You have kind of a, a lot of nested parsers, or you may have, and then it's handy kind of to collect the, the key things which you are interested in at the top level. And this is what this meta parser is for. Yeah, it gives you a, an interface how you can easily define your nested structure while collecting the results on the top um, dictionary. So you see here this thing is constructed by using a do index with an anonymous function. And this dictionary is then really used kind of as the final one. And instead of just assigning the name, I now do a double assignment. I assign it to the name and I assign it to this um, anonymous dict dictionary. And yeah, this will then be used by the machinery to, to really give you access uh, on the parser itself, to access the parsers, the sub parsers. And if you parsed it, then you will, yeah, on the parsed object, you will also have the ability to access these sub parts. That's quite neat. You can also change it as you see it. So this is all taken care of, and oh, okay. So this was not so easy. That uh, and yeah, zooming a bit below, then this also works. Like it's really kind of taken care of that this sub-indexing um, works out well. So this is useful for constructing really complex parsers, and yeah, and makes it kind of also nicely complete. Okay, great. Then I want to go on to do some comparisons. And yeah, we have also enough time left. So there are by now a couple of packages out there. Macro Tools is the go-to package, which kind of most of you may know of if you did some, some macro stuff. Um, but there are also others. Um, Expronicon, there was a talk on the conference already about it. Um, with Expronicon or Expronicon Lite. This kind of a new kit on the block, far newer than actually expression parsers. I just haven't found the time to yeah, announce it in some way on JuliaCon. Um, yeah, but they are different. So a little tiny table comparison here. So Expronicon and ML style, we're going to see it. They are kind of related. They're building on top of the same yeah, pattern matching machinery where Expronicon just defines a, a couple of extra helpers. We're going to see them in action. I have first note um, the Expronicon and ML style. They have a far larger ecosystem on pattern matching in general, building on yeah, what is called algebraic data types. And I'm not going to go into the details here. I'm just focusing on um, yeah, what is related to expression parsing. Okay, the example I want to compare is um, actually and the syntax you find in another package of mine, the where traits. And this gives you access kind of to, yeah, let's say nested dispatch or yeah, traits like dispatch in a simple, simple way. And yeah, let's again zoom in here. So we have um, a function like this. We can annotate with the traits macro and then we can extend what we can write in the where part of it to really use function expressions. And yeah, and yeah, use actually arbitrary functions, but also like these um, interface functions. And there are now kind of three things which we want to extract. And yeah, so this patch on functions, which just returns some some value, like a boolean usually in this regard. This patch on function, which return anything. Then we have kind of this is a check here, whether it's of the subtype or we can check on upper bounds. These are three cases which actually are separately handled. And I show now this little example how you would kind of extract all these three cases 
uh, all these three cases from, from this example expression. So, yeah, tiny part, but we have some complexity in it. Yeah, we have a type variable here, which we reuse in one of the function calls. Yeah, we, we have also the type variable being, being reused as an upper bound. So, Julia actually allows for quite complex expressions. It's really, um, yeah, I think one of, th one of the reasons, or one of the design decisions Julia went with to not be a set of parentheses like Lisp, but support more natural syntax, but this then gets quite complex. Okay, so this is the, the main last slide in the sense, um, or yeah, so we're going to spend a little time here. These are the four uh, packages and how you would do it with them. So I have macro tools here first, probably then going to expression parsers and then looking at Extronicon light and ML style. So let's focus on macro tools. So if we do the, um, the standard way, we actually have a lot of support. If you have looked into it, um, yeah, we have a, a special function which is there to, to really get rid of this distinction between multi-line functions and the single-line function. It's the only support for something like this, but there is it, yeah, macrotools.splitdev is a specific function for exactly this use case. So here, yeah, that's just enough. We have then the function definition, which has per um, dictionary index, gives us access to kind of subparts of it. And here we, want, we are interested in the where statements. And then macro tools also has a nice capture macro, which um, is twofold. Yeah, it on the one side has this inline syntax, which you can use to extract information. We are actually not using this right now, but yeah, so a, a call variable would be defined now and an args variable would be defined now, which you can really access in here. Um, but we, we are actually only interested whether this matches or not, and this is kind of uh, given by capture returning a boolean, whether it was successful or not. And yeah, we do this, and if we match kind of one of these syntaxes, which I showed you, just the plain call, or the um, type check, or the subtype check, then we put it into the respective part, so it's really just a tiny example. We return them, and yeah, okay, we did it. So this is the way you would do it kind of with standard macro tools, which I find is actually pretty neat, but yeah, the support for more complex objects is actually really restricted to, to the function itself. And if you have other parts which you would like to abstract away, um, this is not so much um, your package, it really rather goes this functional style and with this macro to extract things given really standard Julia syntax, where you again need to be careful about getting all the different ways of writing it. Okay, so using the expression parser, uh, things look like this. We, I usually combine it with another tiny package of mine, the simple match. We're going to see it in a second. But the approach now is kind of to first define the parser. Yeah, this is kind of another uh, kind of mentality. And this is a bit of complex parser, so it combines a couple of ones. We have a call parser. We have a, a special type range, which, um, which checks that the, the actual thing which is there in the type range is, is really a call. And we have a normal type range, a type annotation, and type annotation and some fallback for yeah, just a, an arbitrary symbol. And as you see also, I'm using this special named meta macro to make my life simpler for the dispatch part. So because I, I now have used two type ranges here, I, I want to have a bit better um, type support. And what I do then is that I, I have my file Oops, this is the, the function definition. Uh, I already passed it, I, I skimmed over this. So I have two parses. I'm sorry for being too fast on this one. So the function definition I already passed with the plain function definition, and then I have an extra parser for the where statements. So really going into detail there. And I'm just moving over the where's and the function definitions. So you could kind of combine this together. Yeah, it's kind of a, like you want to do it. We could also have built a, uh, a big function definition parser, yeah, and do it that way. It's a bit like, yeah, depending on your case. 
and on your style, we can also kind of really just do it two steps and have one parser in the first step and the second uh, parser in the second step, and this is what we're doing here. Then looping over all the bears also rather matches the other example. And what we do now is that we use this little match here, which has an inline function dispatch, but it's really just a normal function dispatch where you just don't have to care about the function name. So we parse it, and then, um, yeah, for the different cases, we really just use normal type dispatch. So it's super simple. You can also put this into another function somewhere else. This might be a complex logic. You don't have to put it here. It's really just standard function dispatch. And we then have these cases separated and collect them. Yeah, and finally, in this case, we again call to expression because you have a more complex representation. And yeah, final goal might be to have some expressions. But of course, yeah, in between, you rather work on the object representation. Okay, let's check the time. Yep. Okay, so Expronicon um, comes to different flavors, but actually, so yeah, <laughs> summary the Expronicon Lite version, which is actually a real performant um, package, it does not give you much because it actually relies on the ML. Uh, style package later on. So what you see here actually that it gives you again a function parser in a sense or a thing to work with functions in an object way. And yeah, so we can extract this definition, but this is actually it already what we can use for this case. And all the other code is yes, actually in base. So this is nothing special to Expron Expronicon Lite, but this part here having the for loop over the um, where statements, this is really just standard base, which is also awesome. In meta dot is expression, you have a very common macro which you use. If you have, haven't seen this, this is kind of really standard, helpful to check that this is an expression with the respective head. And something with something like this, we can also kind of use standard base to get this. Again, here the difficulty lies in really kind of making sure that you have all the cases covered. Yeah all the different syntax options which Julia support, you also need to support in this macro. So that's always the disadvantage of going kind of the, the normal expression way instead of, yeah, or, yeah, that's the advantage of expression parsers that you have this object orientation thinking that you don't need to care about these details. Okay, last part, which is I think really interesting is to, to see ML style working if you haven't done so. So ML style is really basic, just there for pattern matching in a generic way and also you are supporting expressions. So there's an ML style, there's kind of no object part to represent a function. You really would make, have to make sure also on this layer that you do everything right. But of course you can combine it with others. That's kind of for exemplary purposes. This is how it works. We have an, a completely different match ex, uh, macro. This is really coming from ML style. And yeah, so we can then put in just standard expressions and extract things of it by having kind of an um, interpolation syntax as well. And with this little um, pair symbol, we have all the rules set up. But again, you need to make sure you're now really getting all the rules. So these are not all the rules how you can define functions, but yeah. So for example, curly braces are missing in the beginning, yeah. You could have a function call on a type with curly braces, and then this is not covered by these cases. So you really need to be cautious to cover all the cases. But yeah, otherwise the syntax is super flexible and super powerful. And we can do the same also for the wares, which you can now compare a bit more directly to the other examples. And we have this call syntax again and in different styles and push them to the different where statements. So I hope this kind of gives you an intuition. You have m several options, yeah, and they have different styles of how they um, sub yeah, encapsulate all this logic. And yeah, you have support for really going into the details and matching stuff independently. You have even different options for this. And you usually find good options to kind of parse function objects. But expression parses is kind of really good in having um, an object orientation access also to other parts of the Julia um, expression system, like type ranges or arguments, and yeah, a couple of more. 
Okay, so last part. Oh, I need to be a bit quick on this. So you can also define your own expression parsers. So this is a little example. You find it also in the documentation where um, you support this traitor syntax. You may have come across this kind of another approach to traits. You have one um, type information and a second type information bound after another. And yeah, special syntax, which can be supported. And this is just the way you would build it. You have a, an, an expression parser macro, which helps you in building this. And, oh, sorry. So this is, OK, now we have uh, it back. Um, and you have kind of a double, a double um, default syntax, which this supports. So I think this is the key part. If you want to define your own types of these parsers, parsed combinations, this is a helper macro for you. It will define both types on the same run, having the first default argument being the default parser and the second argument, default argument being the default parsed object. And yeah, that's super handy and all these other types are also defined in this way. And then you just need to define the parse expression and the two expression parts, and then everything is nicely wrapped. And yeah, you just rely on the defined type. Okay, great. So you've seen kind of the general flavor. You've seen a comparison to what other options you have in the ecosystem, how they compare, and you've also seen how you can extend this easily for your own approach. It's really simple, yeah simple approach to parsing and just wrapping it into the semantically meaningful parts, the, um, this object orientation. Last, I want to also again point you to cloud.jolin.io, try it out, um, deployment of Pluto, which I myself really love. Um, it's just there kind of since a couple of months, looking still for testers. You're more than highly welcome to kind of give feedback, but also if you can use it in, in companies, just reach out. I think Pluto is a perfect way to get Julia, get started with Julia, and also build really complex stuff like streaming online analysis. Okay, that's it from from my side. Thank you very much for being there. A couple of contact details. You can reach out to me. I'm here, and I will be also there tomorrow for the hackathon. And yeah, thank you. And I think we have some time for questions, only a few, but still. Okay, great. Um, any questions, frames? Please. I think the microphone should go. Oh, you want to bring it there, I see. Let me see if it's... Yeah. Okay, that's easy. Um. I don't really know much about object-oriented programming because I've been writing Julia for so long. Can you tell me what makes this object-oriented? It seems really cool, yeah. by the way. Uh, sorry. So the, yeah, thank you for the question. So it's really um, a different. Uh, so this is all Julia. Yeah. So we are still using multiple dispatch. We don't use inheritance in, in this kind of object-oriented way. But still, I think it's valuable to think of it in an object-oriented style because you're encapsulating the semantic units really in a in a type manner, which for me it's rather object oriented. So to compare what would be functional, yeah, the functional is that is now kind of more we have the given structures which we already have, yeah, and we now build some complex recursive tools which can work on this seamlessly. So then you construct all your parts kind of by building abstract functions, yeah, which then do what, what you want instead of kind of defining extra types for the semantic units which are of interest to you. Okay. Thank maybe you for the question. Uh, we have time for maybe one more question. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, uh, I'm just curious uh, if, uh, if you've done performance measurements or kind of where you see things, and if, and if not, kind of uh, where you see um, like what, what would you expect to be kind of fast and slow in particular in this package? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. So I was hoping something like this comes up. I haven't done performance um, benchmarks and that's because kind of from my point of view of using macros, they are really not performance critical. 
So yeah, this is why I, I really went kind of this flexible route, easy to understand package, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, but I, I definitely agree there will be some cases where you need performance. It, I guess it's very raw actually using macros because they will be pre-compiled anyway. And, but still, then I would definitely recommend going ML style and Expronicon Lite. They focus on performance. You just need to do some extra steps to get out some complexities. Yeah, more complex, but you get performance over there. Thank you for the question. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, thank you again. It's a great talk, and I look forward to actually trying to use it. So please, let's thank him again. Um, so our next speaker is Caleb Allen from the UK. Um, he's a founding engineer at Sirius Data Systems, and he's bringing to us experience from many different languages, I think uh, Kotlin and Java, and I think he really enjoys proving dev tools, so I'm really excited to hear about Win bindings for the Julia REPL, something I've been really wanting for a long time. So um, Caleb, take it away. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is uh, Caleb Allen. I'm uh, uh, founding engineer at Asiris Data Systems, and uh, my talk is entitled REPL Without a Pause, Bringing Vim Bindings to the Julia REPL. I'm uh, excited to share with you um, the journey that uh, Vim Bindings package has taken uh, from its inception until now. Um, part of my learning journey of Julia and uh, a, a lot of the interesting things I learned about the, the REPL. So, First thing to ask is uh, what is Vim bindings .jl. This is a package which emulates Vim directly in the Julia REPL. So uh, why would you want to do this is uh, maybe a question some people would have. I think there's a Stack Overflow post that is prescient uh, that many people who have used Vim might have seen before, which is this one. How do I exit Vim? It has uh, 5,000 upvotes uh, and says, I'm stuck and cannot escape. Uh, and when they try to escape, they, they can't. So I want to direct your attention to this phrase, I'm stuck and cannot escape, uh, and take it from a more philosophical view of, of Vim. You know, beyond just escaping the program itself, I think Vim users will find themselves unable to escape uh, Vim in every piece of software that they look at. They, they say, well, why would you exit Vim? Uh, why would you ever want to use a program that isn't Vim? So what is the infection vector for Vim? Uh, that's plugins. So if you're using IntelliJ, a very powerful piece of uh, uh, software, you want it to be Vim, right? So you install the IdeaVim uh, plugin, and suddenly it's Vim. Same thing with Google Chrome. That's not a text editor. Why would you ever, but, but I want it to be Vim. And so you run Vimium. Same thing with VS Code, which is, it is a text editor, but it's not Vim. You can make it Vim with the VS Code NeoVim text editor uh, 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 extension. And most insulting of all, you can even make Emacs Vim with uh, evil mode. So a question that has long persisted in the Julia community is, uh, why isn't the Julia REPL also Vim? And uh, my hope is to show you how vimbindings.jl maybe gives that answer, gives that question an answer. So here are a few uh, uh, posts over the years of community members asking for VI modes uh, as they are used to in, you know, Fish Shell or Bash or whatever. This one is uh, from 2014 from a, an Arch user, by the way, uh, who was trying to get Vim working on uh, Julia and, and wasn't able to. Another one from 2018 uh, and most recently 2022. Um, so I started learning Julia in the pandemic. It was kind of a coping mechanism of mine and uh, shortly after starting to learn Julia said, you know, set out to build uh, a, a Vim binding mode. And my first approach was to look at the REPL modes that already exist out there, right? You have the Julia mode that we're all familiar with, um, help mode, uh, which you access with the key binding question mark, package mode, shell mode, search mode. And what I want you to 
uh, to draw your attention to here is first, that, you know, that you're accessing these by key bindings, and second, that each mode has a, a vastly different behavior than any other mode, right? Uh, what you can do in the help mode is completely different from what you can do in uh, the Julia mode. So this extends to user packages as well. Uh, most recently, there are here, here are two examples. There's REPL GPT, where you can enter a GPT mode, where you can uh, converse with chat GPT, and SQL REPL, uh, a package which gives you a REPL mode for executing SQL uh, statements, so you never have to leave Julia. So uh, my, let, let's take a look at uh, what the mechanism uh, is for these uh, key bindings, right? So, for example, getting to help mode, you're going to want to uh, map the question mark. And so whenever you, when you run the question mark, you uh, uh, get to the help mode. Um, this is what the standard library looks like. As, as you can see, um, uh, it, it checks uh, to see if uh, there is any text in the prompt, and if there is no text, then moves uh, the user into help mode. Otherwise, it uh, inserts a question mark. So it's a pretty simple way to do it. Uh, it's a dictionary where the key is the character, uh, the key that you're trying to uh, map, and then the value of the dictionary is a function. Um, and so what happens when you press the question mark uh, on your keyboard? So the journey of that byte looks like this in, in the standard REPL right now. So you press the question mark. Uh, the REPL reads the byte uh, value of it, 3F in this case. Um, it matches the input, meaning it looks at the key map that it's got and says, okay, do I have any key binding uh, for this value? In the case of the question mark, we just saw the function is the help function. So it gets that function and it calls it. So pretty simple. Um, I wanted to try this approach to uh, implement the first kind of uh, versions of what you want to get with Vim bindings, which is HJKNL, what we uh, all are familiar with if, uh, if anyone who's tried to learn Vim. So this is what that looks like. Um, similarly, we're creating a dictionary where the key is uh, the, uh, the keyboard key that you want to press, and then the value is the, um, uh, is the function that gets called. So again, pretty straightforward. And similarly to the question mark, this is what that looks like. Uh, with these modifications which are in the uh, uh, startup.jl. So the user presses H, uh, the byte is read from, uh, from, uh, from the input. We look to see if there's a function that calls uh, that, uh, for this key, and indeed there is, the one we just defined uh, in the slide before. And so we call that function. So this is what that looks like in action. And this black box shows the key input as it's happening. So you can see when I press H and L, rather than typing H and L, it navigates back and forth. Uh, the problem is this, is now you can't write a hello world program, which is, uh, you know, you can't really write anything. So rather than uh, adding it to the main mode, uh, my next approach was to create a new mode, uh, a normal mode in this case. So this is the code that uh, that does that. Uh, you, you can see there's, I've implemented more keys uh, and, and trying out more uh, complex motions like E, which in Vim is, uh, goes to the end of a word, and uh, it creates a... Oh. Sorry about that. Let's see if we can get back. Okay. Okay. Um, Yes. Sorry. Okay, there we go. Um, so this adds more keys uh, to um, uh, to a new mode. Okay, so this is uh, what that looks like. And this is uh, actually with the package from uh, like two years ago. Um, 
You can see that I'm able to enter uh, text as normal. Uh, escape doesn't work, and we'll come back to that later. Um, and so instead, I'm using the back tick. Uh, but once I'm back in normal mode, which in is indicated by the prompt being changed to N, uh, we can move around uh, pretty well. You can see that you know, E didn't really go to the correct end of word, right? So it, there's still kinks to work out. But uh, the, 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 the main problem we're also having is that once we're in help mode, we can't go back into normal mode. So there, there's kind of this uh, problem where we want to be transitioning between modes. And that brings us to the escape problem. Uh, anybody who's used a terminal uh, application or tried to write one might be familiar with this. Um, in order to understand the escape problem, uh, we need to understand control sequences. So how does the, ha the, the REPL handle special characters? And so by special characters, I mean when you press a key on your keyboard that doesn't enter text, right? So the, the arrow keys, page up, page down, uh, escape, which we will come back to again. Um, and the way it does it, uh, uh, the way terminals encode that is with escape sequences. So you can see right arrow um, uh, is encoded with this sequence of letters. So uh, escape key and then an open bracket and then capital C. When that is sent to a terminal application, it should be interpreted as a pressing of the right arrow. And this is from uh, the standard REPL uh, library right now. So what happens when you have to read multiple bytes, right, rather than just one? Uh, the REPL handles it quite well. So you have the user pressing the left arrow key, and that's three bytes, not one. So we can only read one byte at a time. And so we read the first byte, which is the escape character. We match that. We see if that's in our, uh, key, uh, uh, in our key map. Once we do find that, it's not a function this time, but it's an additional uh, key map, a, a nested key map. And that is for every key that starts with uh, the escape key. So we recurse, and we call this matching function again. And we read another byte, in this case 5b, which is for the open uh, square bracket. We match that with the uh, key map that we have, and then uh, receive another key map. And so we recurse again, and we, we read that final byte. OK, so finally, uh, by the end of this, we get the function for, uh, for uh, the right key, for moving right. And, th and that, call, that is called, or move uh, left. Um, so let's go through the journey of the escape key. And this will demonstrate the problem that uh, that the escape key causes to a lot of applications. So you, the user presses the escape key, and that uh, gets sent to the terminal application as one byte escape. OK, so we read that in. We match the input, and we find the nested key map. OK, so we go and recurse, and we try to find the next byte. And we have another key. We're, we're waiting for a byte that's never going to come. And this is well known in, in a lot of uh, uh, applications. This is a little small, but it says a comment in the line edit.jl, which is in the REPL uh, source code, says it's difficult to bind escape itself. So how do you do that? The solution is kind of silly, but a lot of applications do it. So you, whenever you receive an escape ASCII value, you wait for a few short moments and uh, decide if you've gotten more bytes. Well, this probably is the beginning of an, uh, a control sequence. It's not, if, if there are no bytes, then the escape key was probably pressed. And that's exactly what Vim bindings does. Uh, it reads and says, OK, if we've got a bunch more characters coming in, then this is a control sequence. If there, if, uh, there, are, no bytes avail if there are no bytes available, then uh, it's probably the escape key. And surprisingly, there are a lot of applications that implement this. Um, Users of Vim uh, who have used Vim within Tmux will be familiar with this uh, because by default, Tmux has a 500 millisecond waiting period before they determine whether a key was a control sequence or whether it was uh, 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 an escape key. So this, uh, I started you know, modifying the REPL code, which I, I think uh, I... Um, it causes, you know, maybe isn't a good thing to do as a package, right? But uh, by the time I was doing it anyways, could I just start uh, intercepting more, right? So the answer is yes, that's what, I, that's what Vim binding does. Uh, 
So now uh, with the modifications of inbindings, this is what uh, a byte looks like. The user presses H, we read that in as normal, and we, ma we match our input to see if uh, uh, that we have a, a binding for H, and instead of uh, sending that directly to the default binding, um, if Vim is in normal mode, as, we've, as, as Vim, the Vim bindings package describes, then we send that to Vim. If it's, uh, uh, otherwise we send it to the default implementation. So then we call that function. So the benefit of this is that it's, Vim bindings is no longer a REPL mode. It separates Vim from the REPL modes. Uh, it acts on top and before, these, uh, before keys are delivered to the REPL modes. So um, that's kind of an overview of how uh, Vim bindings integrates with the REPL. And uh, I'm going to articulate some of the features that, uh, that, that, that have been built. So, uh, kind of in a somewhat random order. Um, the first one's kind of a slap in the face, uh, which I'm very not proud of, but uh, is the way it is. This is parsing the Vim commands with a bunch of really terrible, really ugly regular expression commands. And uh, the, the, the reason for this is uh, when I started, uh, the regular expressions were, you know, a couple characters, it wasn't so bad, and then uh, it has grown and grown and grown to the point where it looks like this. It's, it's really uh, unpleasant. I've tried to refactor it a couple times, and I'm close, but not quite there. So what happens is we take in uh, 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 characters as they come in, and then we match them to these regular expressions. Um, and once we've found a match, we pass it into these structs, these command structs. Um, and uh, there's a command uh, abstract type and then many subtypes. Um, and once we have that, we execute it. So this is what one of the execute uh, methods looks like. This is for the case of insert command. Um, the insert command uh, has a, there, there are a handful of different versions of it, right? You can use A to go to, to append, I to go to insert mode immediately, uh, O to create a new line. And um, there are uh, method implementations for all of the uh, command subtypes. So, one thing that was really helpful uh, during my development was some of the logging uh, solutions that, that uh, I put together. Um, one problem when developing the REPL is that output from the, uh, the, the, uh, of logs or whatever can't go to standard output anymore because you're using the REPL, right? You don't, you're, you're, if, if you press a key and you want to log something of how that's being handled, uh, that's uh, spat out into the um, standard output. So instead, uh, when I'm uh, in my development flow, uh, I log it out to a, a pipe uh, so that I can have this kind of side-by-side -side, uh, view, uh, which makes it much, much, e much easier. Uh, another uh, helpful tool that was uh, useful in, uh, in, in development was creating a, a, a wrapper type around uh, I.O. buffer, which uh, essentially helped to, ident to uh, create a bunch of movement, motion commands, text object commands, which are, you know, need to be uh, character perfect. Um, so as you can see with uh, this test buffer up here, um, I can say uh, hello world, and, and what this is doing is creating a, a, a buffer where the cursor is at this position. And uh, use, over uh, implementing the show method, uh, lets me have this nice output um, where the cursor is represented by these uh, two uh, uh, bar uh, characters. And so you can do that for insert mode as well. So when writing tests, uh, you can do something like this where uh, when I'm running, uh, let's say you had this text in a, in a Vim buffer and I run the command CFD, what this should do is change all of the uh, text until uh, uh, up through the first occurrence of a D. And so that's what this is testing for here. Uh, and it should also change to insert mode. So that's indicated by this uh, uh, pipe surrounding a, an I. So another tool that was very helpful was uh, during implementing uh, the undo and redo feature uh, was uh, implementing a, sh a show method for it, which uh, kind of showed me 
which uh, entry was the active entry, right? So you have a big long list and you want to go back and forth and uh, understanding where you are in that, uh, especially in development, is, uh, is important. So the resulting logs of that look like this, where um, the, the most recent uh, history entry is the one with the arrow, and if you press U to undo it, it would uh, go to the one before, and if you press Control R, it would uh, go back forward again. Um, uh, a final thing that really changed the package, especially in the last uh, six months or so, was pre-compilation. Uh, the user experience of it was really not good uh, for quite a long time because uh, as this kind of shows, uh, the first time you use a command, it uh, takes quite a while to execute. And that's you know, the time to first uh, X problem. Um, so going into normal mode, the first time you use a command, it's bad, and this one in particular, it, it takes almost half a second uh, on, on the first use of a command. So trying that again, right, the, the second time you use a command, it, it works just fine, but you know, that, once you leave your REPL session and come back, that's really unpleasant to have to try to use a bunch of uh, commands again to get it to speed up. So with uh, pre-compiled tools, uh, this is the user experience afterwards, so this is using uh, the, the previous was without uh, any pre-compilation. This is with pre-compilation. As you can see, the first uh, use does take a little bit longer to load. Uh, but this only happens on installation. Um, and then afterwards, everything is uh, essentially instant. So um, moving around and, and editing text uh, is, is quite fast. Uh, and, and good enough that I actually began using it as uh, uh, enabled by default uh, whenever I'm using uh, the Julia REPL, which I only did between the time that uh, this talk was accepted and right now. So I'm glad that uh, 1.9 came out because I had this great title, REPL without a pause, that my wife came up with. And, and so now it actually is without a pause. Um, and the last thing is um, changing the cursor style. This is kind of just a, des a design decision where, as you saw before, uh, the mode is indicated by uh, escape, uh, by a block cursor when in normal mode, and by a bar cursor when in insert mode. And the reason for that uh, is that it no longer breaks the copy-paste behavior of the REPL, which uh, relies on the um, the prompt, uh, the Julia and the uh, caret uh, uh, prompt line. Uh, and it also looks nicer, I think. Um, so. The features that vimbindings.jl has are these. Um, quite a, a few motions. Uh, we've got a decent amount of operators. Yank was just implemented uh, experimentally it, it, with, uh, just with the system clipboard, not with registers, but I think that one would be uh, pretty quick. Uh, some text objects, some insert commands, some delete commands, and undo and redo, which uh, fit the vim semantics uh, of um, undoing and redoing edits rather than specific character entries, right? So uh, when you uh, go, essentially what was the state of the buffer the last time you entered or exited uh, insert mode? So uh, my hope is that this would be enough to uh, add vimbindings.jl to this infection list uh, where vim has uh, kind of creeped out and now can be called, uh, uh, now, now uh, the Julia REPL can also be Vim, at least a, a subset of Vim. So as far as where this you know, goes in the future, um, I would really like to hear feedback. Uh, I really enjoy building tooling, uh, and I, I want to be hearing people's thoughts about, you know, is this useful? Uh, is there, um, uh, you know, Adding more features uh, may or may not be a, a great idea, right? Is time uh, of tooling development spent better with this or elsewhere or, or something like that? So one idea I've, uh, th that has floated around, uh, well, as I was saying, um, you know, we could implement more text objects, text objects pretty easily uh, because, uh, the, you know, the structure is all there. Um, but something like visual mode, I think, is just, you know, the complexity of that might not be worth trying. Um, but there is kind of a, an approach that's been floated where instead of 
just implementing all of these uh, in Julia, you just forward everything back and forth between an instance of NeoVim. And in that way, uh, you get the entire full feature set of uh, Vim um, without actually needing to implement it all. Uh, but it would also come with some design challenges of, of synchronizing those buffers and so forth. So um, thank you. Uh, if you would like to try Vim bindings, it's uh, up on the registry, so you can try it and install it that way. Uh, Miles Cramner uh, was uh, a, a great contributor, so I want to thank him. Uh, Christopher Carlson, uh, who wrote Oh My Repl. I've looked a lot at that code, uh, and, and uh, that's been great. And also Tim Holy for uh, pre-compilation or pre-compiled tools, which has totally changed the user experience of this package. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Caleb. Is there any questions? Hi, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, can you briefly talk about the second approach where you um, have like an instance of uh, NeoVim or Vim running in the background? Because one of the things I was interested in is instead of having to rewrite all the, let's say, plugin features, right, of Vim or NeoVim, or like ha if I want to have my custom uh, like Vim config uh, to work here, uh, I think it would be unwieldy to write all of that in Julia. So yeah, uh, yeah. is there like anything being implemented right now, or it's just in the idea phase? Um, that's a great question. Um, I agree that, yeah, you know, you're not going to get uh, full implementation, right, of, of Vim rewriting everything in Julia. That's uh, a little masochist, and maybe I'm a little masochist already for having done this. But, um, yeah, the, I, I did try an experiment of uh, synchronizing with NeoVim a couple years ago, and I think it's worth revisiting. I'm not sure if, if there are any initiatives of, of building that, but uh, I think... I, I would like to look into that. The, the, the design challenges that come out of that are unknown to me, right? Of, of the, the, the best example is NeoVim uh, VS Code integration, where there are certain features that don't work totally correctly because of some fundamental way that uh, their buffers can't synchronize. And, and I'm not exactly sure of the details of that, but I think it's worth looking into. Any other questions? and tell me how much exercise this would be. <laughs> so first of all, thank you. Um, especially for the large amount of work you put into getting escape working. So <laughs> yeah, sure. can I modify it to not be escape? <laughs> to be what instead? Uh, I use JJ, for instance, to exit in Sure, mode. yeah, you file a request. And uh, I, I just implemented preferences.jl, so you know, the, the structure is there for adding some, a little bit of customization right now. So yeah, file a request and I'll, uh, I think that would be pretty straightforward to get implemented. All right, excellent, thank you. Sure. Okay, um, any further questions? Hi, uh, you've said that you like to implement uh, tooling mm -hmm. um, and this reminds me of a dream of mine that I had uh, in the past of having a Pluto mode for the REPL to, to sort of, instead of having Pluto in the browser, having Pluto in the REPL. That might, it might be a nice project for, uh, since you've already... What, what do you mean by that? Like, uh... Instead of editing uh, the, um, the, the Pluto notebook in, in the browser, you, you will have it's the REPL mode acting as a notebook. Where you can kind of go between cells, yeah, something exactly. like that. And That's have, interesting. Yeah. And well, and, and the, um, some of the learnings from this are that a, a lot of the text operations aren't really specific to Vim, right? You could uh, use this with, with just a standard yeah, text yeah. editing system. But yeah, that's, that's an interesting idea. I, I think maybe we would talk very, afterwards a little bit. Yeah. It would be very cool. Yeah. OK. One more question, or are we up, up there? It's just more of a comment, but um, there is a package out there for doing that with, with um, Pluto uh, it, for NeoVim as a plugin. And it wraps Dino. You can do something like that. It's kind of neat. Uh, and then also there's a extension that does uh, in NeoVim called Magma that uses Jupiter's REPL, so something to check out. So maybe it's already available, yeah. yeah. I mean, NeoVim is an incredible thing. You can do anything in there, so 
Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's thank uh, Caleb again, please. Um, so our next speaker is Jun Tian. He's going to be talking to us about open telemetry. Okay. Oh, oh, we're short on time, so I'll let you go ahead, please. Okay. So I'm Jun Tian, and today we will talk about open telemetry.gl, collecting logs, traces, and the metrics together. My talk will first give a basic introduction to open telemetry and then we will go through the implementation details of open telemetry.gl, including logs, traces, and metrics. And then I will show you a typical example with http.gl. And last, we will talk about best practices and the real world challenges. So open telemetry is a whole ecosystem. It is focused on creating data, collecting data, and also transformation of the telemetry data. By creating and generating data, the data may come from microservices and also may come from the shared infrastructure like the Kubernetes and also the cloud services. And by transforming and collecting, we mean open telemetry collector is a standalone executor and it can be execute as an independent service. Uh, it will collect data from a macro service and also the infrastructure. And beyond that, it can also be used to filter and uh, compression of the telemetry data. And then it will can send the data to several different databases like ClickHouse, Elasticsearch, et cetera. So today we'll focus on the open telemetry.gl it, it is a Julia implementation, and I will mainly focus on the microservices part. So when should you consider OpenTelemetry.gl? Um, usually you will already have a distributed system, and probably with many different programming, programming languages included. And you also want to avoid vendor lock-in. Third, obviously, you would like to collect the data in Julia and uh, across logs, tracing, and metrics. If you only need to collect logs, the best choice would to just go with logging extras, .gl or something like this. But if you would like to uh, collect the different, three different kinds of logs, then OpenTelemetry.gl is a better choice. The main benefits of using open telemetry is, first, it allows you to own the data that you generate rather than be stuck with a appropriate data format or tool. Second, it allows you to learn a single set of APIs and conventions. And the third, most importantly, is that open telemetry is now quite stable. The logs, traces, and metrics path specifications are all stable, and the Open Territory Collector protocol at version one is also released. Now, let's talk about the Julia implementation. The Open Territory.gl itself is a mono repo, so it contains several different sub packages. The fundamental one is the API.gl. And based on it, we built several concrete implementations, and the implementation are all included in the SDK layer. By combining SDK.gl and the OpenTelemetry Proto.gl, we have provided many different exporters, like the, like the HTTP layer exporter and also the gRPC layer exporter. Beyond that, we also have independent promises exporter. Um, also, we use the newest feature of package extension in this package. So we have several uh, extensions, like download extensions and HTTP extensions, 
over the API.gl. And also we have a term extension to help us uh, visualize the data structures in SDK.gl. From a functional view, we can see that uh, first, the API layer defines the whole interface, and then the SDK layer implements the specification. Third, the proto.gl encodes all the concrete types defined in the SDK, and uh, we use proto, uh, proto buff to encode the data into binary. Note that the proto.gl is automatically generated based on the proto files from the official open telemetry specification. And the last step is to emit the data. Um, for now, we have only the latest version only support emitting data through the HTTP, and the gRPC part is currently unavailable. So how to collect logs with OpenTermetry.gl? Uh, here I provide a simple example. So first step is by using OpenTermetry. Um, by default, it will initialize the OpenTermetry logger and then update the global logger. And then we set up the default exporter. The second line, we can use the term. So this line is optional. It is only for better display, and we, we, it will trigger the package ex extension here. And the rest are just straightforward. So you log, and you want to print the error message. We can take a deep look into what's happening under the line. So when we are printing the info message, First, it will be applied to a log transformer and transformed into a log record in the left picture. And then the log record will be applied to a log exporter and sent to an I.O. So if you are familiar with logging extra.gl, you can think that the log transformer is just a concrete implementation of a transformer and the log, different logger exporters are just the things. Uh, if you are not familiar with logging extra, uh, that's OK, because the next talk, Cassie will give it an uh, introduction in detail. Note that the logger in OpenTermetry.gl can also be used in conjunction with other loggers provided in logging extras. So uh, I highlighted several important fields here. The body field is the content of our logging message. And also, we have a trace ID and span ID. By default, they are all zero, and we'll come to it later. For the attributes field, if we provide some extra key value pairs and after the hello world string, they will also appear here. So in the attributes here, they are all empty. For the traces, to collect, to collect traces with open telemetry, we can simply call the with span function. The variable in the, the first variable providing the with span function is the span name. And here we you can use the dual syntax to wrap the call logic here. So um, as you can see, the span can be left in a um, parent span. And uh, also note that if you wish, we can also create many parallel spans here. So when we execute the with span, it will first call the create span. And it will try to find a span context from the current task. If it is fine, then it will inherit it from it and create a new span ID. But if it is not found, then we will create a fresh new span context. At the end of each span, we will update the end time and trigger the span processor. Within each span, we can also do a lot of things, like up update the attributes of the span, or add links or events to the span. Okay. 
some advanced usage are like we can also do some tree sampling. For example, by default, we will use uh, ratio based sampling, and the default ratio is 1. Dot zero, which means we will always sample the trees, but you can also implement your own customized sampling methods. And uh, you can also customize ID generation, and by now it is random number, and you can also try to generate a specific uh, trees ID based on your business logic. The third part is collecting metrics in open telemetry. Um, to collect metrics, usually we will create a meter first, and then we create different kinds of instruments like a counter and associated counter to the meter. Usually we will create many different meaningful similar um, instruments so that they can bundle together into a meter for better management. And then we have the counter now, we can just execute it. By providing key value pairs, key value arguments, we can specify the attributes of this counter. And finally, we can call the metric reader to read the latest value of those instruments. Um, here is a detailed explanation of the metric data structure. The most important one are the name of the fruit counter, and also there are many data points. So it is a hierarchical structure. The, the top list layer is a meter provider, and then for each meter provider, we have several different metrics. And each metrics is just a pair of instrument and aggregation. And, uh, by default, we have implemented three kinds of uh, aggregations, like sum, the latest value, or the histogram aggregation. And each aggregation also have many different data points. And as you can see, the data points are distinguished by their key value pairs, the attributes we specified before. So, Also, you, we have several advanced usages with metrics, like we can define the views. Um, the reason we need views is that uh, if you are in a large project and you have a lot of dependencies included, then each dependency may have provide many different kinds of metrics. But um, for, the, for a specification, specific application, you will only need several kinds of metrics you are interested in, so that in that case, you can specify the views and the filter metrics by instrument type or the instrument name or the meter type and name and also the version. Also, you can filter uh, metrics by attributes so that some extra attributes are not included. Beyond that, you can also customize your own data points. Like you can specify the histogram bounds, or even you create your own data point type. Okay, so we have talked logs and traces and metrics, but how they are correlated? Here, um, in a standalone Julia process, they are correlated with the trace ID, span ID, for logging, we have dedicated fields of trace ID and standard ID, span ID. And for the tracing part, the whole span context is included in each tree, in each span. And for metrics, the span ID and the trace ID are included in the exemplar. But how they are correlated across services, like we have service A, and it may be written in Python. And we have another service named service B, which, were, which is implemented in Julia. To pass the information from service A to service B, first of all, we will have to extract the current context from the 
coronal service, and then deserialize it in through some kind of approach. And then once service B received the data, it will try to deserialize and inject the convey contact info into the current task. For HTTP, we, we can try to pass the trace context information through the specific trace context header. And if we are using gRPC, we can put the contact info through the metadata. In some event, uh, async event messages, we can pass, uh, for example, the cloud event uh, format, we can pass the context through key value pairs and inject them in them to the message. But if you are, unfortunately, if the, for example, in distributed.gl, it doesn't provide such kind of metadata to allow you to convey uh, the context info, then you have no choice but to implement your custom data structure. Now we can go through a typical example with HTTP.gl. Uh, the left part are the common code in both the client side and the server side. So it first we set up the global logger, a global tracer provider, and also a global meter provider explicitly here. And we, for the meet, for the metric reader, we use the periodic metric reader here so that the reader will uh, periodically send the data to the open telemetry collector here. Now let's look at the client side of uh, the example. It's simply first using HTTP and then instrument the HTTP. Note that the, this feature, the, this function will be, since we already have the package extension, of HTTP extension.gl. So the instrument.gl will know how to instrument the HTTP service. And then we can try to send several HTTP requests at here. For the server side, we similarly, we're also using HTTP and then we instrument the HTTP. Then we set up the handler, sleep for a random time, and also print an info message. Then we set up the router and also register router and bind the handler to the root path. And finally, we serve the actual start of the service. Now, um, since I have already run the service before, we can try to take a look into Here for the logs, since I already have run it in the background, let's see the result correctly. And uh, set the exporter. And uh, so here we can see the uh, log messages here. And uh, we can also check the traces. Search. Um, not sure. It seems it is already. Uh, let's try the promises first. Okay, the promises seems okay. And the uh, tempo. Well, I'm not sure why it now exists. Okay, let's skip this part. And in theory, you should, if you follow the tutorial at the website, you should also see the traces. So, um, I will talk more about the best practice on using OpenTemperature.gl. Um, in production, we will use we will try to leverage the environment variables because in OpenTrace.jl, we have made 
exposing most of the configurations through the environment of variables. And it is best suited in the Kubernetes environments so that you can configure those environments to variables through either through the configuration file, the deployment YAML, or through the Helm configurations. Several common configurations include the, whether to enable or disable the open territory. And you can also specify the endpoints and uh, configure the optional parameters like the sampler or the timeout parameters. Besides, in production, you will usually want to avoid using open territory directly because by default it will set up the it will set up several default providers and uh, those might not be necessary in production. And it is recommended to always set up the provider in production explicitly. Some best practices on extending OpenTemu.gl. Um, people usually would like to contribute code first through adding package extensions. So extensions should only depend on OpenTemu API.gl. Um, it is not because that it is lightweight and with only minimal dependencies. It is also because that the Open Telemetry API follows a official specification and uh, it is uh, quite stable. Also, um, you might also want to distinguish the sync and async cases. For async cases, you, would, uh, you usually you would like to um, enter the span immediately and let the uh, um, the other service to decide when to send a, when to end a, a new child span and send the span messages. Um, several real world challenges, challenges I met. Uh, the first is we lack a gRPC server, and also the gRPC client doesn't support the protobuf.gl at version 1.0 yet. And the second one is writing extensions for existing packages are not that easy because the hook related functionalities are always missing. Sometimes you have to manually do the injection and unfortunately we will encounter a type piracy here. The third issue is, well, and although I have used it in production before, but the newest version is not uh, fully tested in production yet. And uh, since I only use a fraction of the features in the, newest, in, the latest pack, in the latest version, so I'm not sure if there are bugs in there. And also, a very important part is the exemplar related are not important. Um, this part, I think in Python, it is also not implemented yet. Um, another important one is that we need a better approach to pass the contact information across tasks in Julia. Currently, we are still using type policy again. Um, ideally, it should be passed like the log state in a task, in a task uh, local storage but uh, we do not have a better choice here until now. And uh, also the performance bottleneck lies in the transportation layer instead of the extraction layer. And based on my benchmark results, the extraction and the serialization part is quite fast, and it's much faster compared to both the Golang and also the Python implementation. And this credit goes to the protobuf, especially the uh, version one of the protobuf.gl. So how do we use OpenTemetry.gl at Jigsaw? Jigsaw is still a working um, project aimed to help developers deploy scientific computing applications right in Julia and the Python. So here we first receive a request from a client side, then we have a gateway written in the Python, and then the messages 
were passed to the AWS SNS and SQL through the DARPA, and the, the DARPA helps to forward the message to the specific applications. And uh, uh, for all these components, the open temperature data were collected to a centralized place. Uh, place. Okay, thank you. This is my talk today. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Um, actually, I did have a question, and okay. I think I'm going to put, pose this to frames as well. Um, one thing I noticed that we need is compilation logging uh, during pre-compilation. Uh, and I was wondering if you have any thoughts about how we might accomplish that. Uh, could you be more specific? Um, so uh, oh, how would we do logging during pre-compilation? Um, as noticed, that's a problem that... Oh, uh, you mean compilation? Uh, you mean combine what? When we're pre-compiling a package. Oh, okay. Pre-compiling package. Um, for the pre-compiling, I think currently isn't, um, we do not have, we haven't considered that part yet. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, so I saw that you had um, Prometheus in your Grafana instance uh, as well. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, in the event that you don't want to implement an endpoint or so, you could potentially you would push Gateway. Um, and if there would be a way to use open telemetry to gather the metrics and then push them in some way to push Gateway. I think the functionality is not there yet, but I was wondering how difficult that would be. Uh, currently, the, this package implementation is uh, it is a pool base, I guess. So that we open a port in our service and so that you can use promises to connect to this endpoint. But also you, can, you have other choices. For example, here, um, you can send the data without a promises library and then you pass the data to the open character. So this is a push method and then from the open tree collector side, you can use both push and pull approach in, to collect with the promises. Yeah, they are both supported. Okay, uh, here. Hi. Uh, regarding the thing about um, moving data between different tasks, I know there's a pull request open to the Julia repository for something called context variables, which is exactly about that. I was just curious if you try that out and if you have any ideas about that. Uh, I haven't tried all of that yet, but I will definitely give it a try later. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any further questions for a speaker? Oh, there we go. You mentioned uh, doing like performance benchmarks. Uh, I wonder, have you uh, published those anywhere? Is there a way we can compare performance? Yeah, it is contained in the original repo and we have a benchmark subfolder there. Cool, yeah. thanks. Yeah. And also I've thought about the CICD to run the benchmark. Okay, last chance for questions. If not, let's give June another round of applause. Sorry. We're gonna continue our discussion of logging. Um, Frames Catherine Wright. Frames has been a long time contributor to Julia. Um, I think since point four, is it? Or maybe earlier? When did you start using Julia? Version? Uh, point three. Point point three. One, two, maybe? <laughs> And so Frames has been with us for a very long time, and um, I think currently uh, she's on contract with now Julia Hub, I understand, uh, working on auto diff. Um, but today she's gonna be discussing locking extras uh, with us. And
Okay. 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 Thank you. Welcome, Frames, please. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Frames. Um, I'm an EDA and compiler engineer at Julia Hub. Um, so, yeah, I'm here today to talk about logging in Julia, in particular about the logging extras package. Uh, before I start, can you choose a more difficult and remote location for a conference? It's literally the opposite side of the world from places that are good, like Perth. Um, yeah, it took me a casual 42 hours to get here. It's about 170 degrees around the circle. Um, so, yeah, you could have gone like a few hundred Ks worse if you really tried. Um, but yeah, next time I suggest like Australia, maybe New Zealand, good countries. Uh, so to talk about the long extras package. Uh, so it was initially created in 2018, shortly after Julia 1.0 and the new logging standard library. Uh, basically, I just finished my PhD. I was waiting for my visa to clear. And someone was like, I need a thing to do X. And I was like, I can make that thing. And I am very bored. Um, yeah, so it hasn't changed much since 2018, but we've just tagged version 1.0, so I thought it was time to like, tell people about it since it's considered stable uh, and ready to use. Um, so the Julia 1.0 logging standard library was largely created by Claire. Um, thanks, Claire. It's great, and I'm basically just using the features and intended there. Um, I also want to thank other contributors, in particular Frederick and Jacob. Um, yeah. So what does logging in Julia look like? Uh, it looks something like this. So we say at info or at debug or at warn, etc. Uh, some message, which might include an interpolated string if you like. And then a list of arguments, either just by their name, or you can give them a new name in like a keyword argument kind of style. Um, you can even just stick expressions here, and it will name it according to the expression. And we can see out gets printed an info level warning. Hello, in is inserted by interpolated value. I can see my variable with the name and the value, similar for my named uh, kind of keyword argument style one and for the expression. So that's logging in Julia. It's pretty similar to other logging. The use of the um, arguments is a bit more unique. That's not quite as common, um, but nothing too special, which is good. We don't want to be super weird and fancy for everything. We want saying plain easy to use. Um, so I guess talking about logging versus printing. So we can think of printing as kind of the low-level uh, primitive for writing to text stream. In particular, it, by default, it outputs to the standard out stream. In contrast, we can think of logging as a much higher level abstraction. Uh, so by default, we get this fancy styling. This is done by the console logger. Uh, it's routable, which I will talk about most of this talk. Um, which you can use logging extras for or an otherwise customized logger. Um, and at least if you're using the console logger, it's always printed to standard error, which is important if you're building some command line tool designed to like pipe things between each other because you don't want it to be on standard out or it'll like mess up your piping. Um, so mostly logging should be preferred when it's the appropriate tool, which is not surprising. That's almost in the definition of appropriate tool, I guess. Um, so who is logging for? Uh, so logging needs to serve the needs of many different users. Um, so we can imagine an operations team who is monitoring a production environment. Um, this is the kind of thing I did when on call at Invenia. So you've got like some system, you need to make sure that system keeps on running. Uh, so you're probably using some tool that's like for indexing logs, like CloudWatch, Sumo Logic. I guess OpenTelemetry would be another tool that's kind of in this space. But logging is also for the developer. So print layer logging is kind of the classic Julia debugging technique. It works in every language. It's not slow. It's great. Um, so you can basically replace all of your print line statements, all of your show statements with at info instead. Um, and finally, logging is useful for communicating with the end user on like a local interactive session. Um, so what is log plumbing or log routing? So this diagram, uh, I use a lot to kind of explain the concept. We can imagine uh, all of our log messages come into the system. Um, they go into like a T logger, which splits it out and sends some all the way over to a console logger. And they go send some others through a filter. And that goes to another T logger, which breaks it out into other different files. So we can imagine that everything gets printed to the console logger 
But then we also make a separate file for all errors, all warnings, all other messages, which might go to different people to examine it later or understand what's happening in thing. So our goal here is to direct the right content to the right places. Uh, so compositional logging. So the core idea behind logging actually is what I call compositional logging. We're going to break down logging into a, into a collection of single function building blocks, which we stack together uh, to do more complicated things. Each of the components is simple, but by combining them, we can do something complex. Uh, and then the end user would configure a logger to meet their needs uh, by composing these parts together, as I described, uh, which might be different to their needs when doing other tasks. Um, so to break down the parts of an abstract logger, if you want to implement abstract logger, there are four methods you have to implement. Uh, so the first is handle message. Um, it takes some logger, takes some arguments. It, it logs the thing. So this is where if you're a file log, you'd write to file. Um, it's used by what I call syncs, uh, which I'll get into later, as well as by several other components of the system. The other like, primary method is should log. This decides if we're going to log it or not. Um, so when I showed those positional and keyword arguments at the start, some of those are expressions. Some of those expressions could be like quite expensive to compute. You could be, say, uh, computing the condition number of a matrix, uh, which you might want to stick in your logs, because then you can be like, oh, that's why my thing isn't converging. Um, so if the log message is disabled, you don't want to actually spend the time evaluating them. So should log decides whether or not we're going to log it before actually doing the work to produce those arguments. Um, and that's used by the early filtered logger, which I will talk about shortly. Um, the other two parts I feel like a bit more minor. There's the min enabled level, um, which is an even earlier filter that just filters on the level of the logger with no other information. Uh, we have a min level logger for that, and catch exceptions. So catch exceptions isn't really related to the logger, but right now it is part of the logger interface. Um, it's related to the global need of the end user. So if during the preparation of your log message you get an exception thrown, say you'd put in an expression that was wrong or maybe there's a bug in the logger itself, should Julia capture that, ex that exception? Um, probably good if you're running in production. We don't want the logging system to itself crash our application. Or uh, should it not? Which is probably good when you develop here. We don't want to like, not catch the fact we screwed up our log messages. Um, yeah. So uh, for these different functions, we have different information available to them. Um, so as I mentioned, we have the level, um, which is available to everything, including the min, uh, the min level logger. Um, so that's the at info, warn, et cetera, things like that, which is both a category as named. It's also a severity integer. Um, so when you come to filters, you can do something like filter all things of one or above, or you could say filter all things of 2,000 or above. Um, then available to the uh, should log method, and thus the early filter logger, we have the group, which is a way you can, a user extendable way of categorizing messages. Um, so you might want to put things into a group being like pager group, where if one of these things is logged, the someone on call gets a pager and needs to go and fix something. Uh, we've got an ID, which is a unique number for every instance of the uh, log thing, which you can use to detect if you're getting the same message thrown in a loop, and maybe you want to stop printing those, uh, as well as the module. Um, then finally, we have the handle message can see everything. Um, so it can also see the file where the logging uh, function was called, as well as the line, the actual message, and all of the keyword arguments that you passed in. Um, so logging extras exposes three filters. The min level logger, which allows just, you can set this and just disable, say, everything that isn't an error or everything that isn't a warning. Uh, the early filtered logger, um, which, as I mentioned, stop messages before we have to go and compute their arguments. Or the active filter logger, which has all the control um, because it's actually intercepting the handle message rather than the should log. Um, but it's already too late to avoid computing any methods. But you have full control, which is good. So we can imagine that I'm using some package, and that package gives a, gives a warning, but I know that, that warning doesn't apply to me for some reason. Then I don't want the end user to get spammed by this message that I already know is not actually a problem. Um, so to do that, I might wrap the current logger with a early filtered logger that filters on the module. Um, so with logger sets the logger for a, a block of code. Um, 
and then we give it an early filtered logger, which it takes a function, and that function gives you uh, access to all of the things that is known that I showed before. And we'll say, is the module not the foo module? Say foo is the one that has the thing. Um, and then we'll ask it to have the current logger so that that's the logger we wrap. Uh, and if we do that, call the method that's giving us the problem, we can mute the method down and it's all nice and quiet. Um, or if we're a bit more worried about uh, muting something we shouldn't, we might want to use an active filter logger that we can actually check the message. So with the active filter logger, to do the same thing, we can pass in a function to filter on that's like contains, message, some regular expression. Um, and then we can know that unless they change the log message beyond our regular expression, we're only going to filter out the thing that we want to. Um, and it's used exactly the same as the early filtered logger. Uh, then we have the level override logger. So the level override logger is the opposite of min level logger. Um, so by default, Julia has min level set to info. It, all, it never shows you debug logs, but maybe you'd like to show debug logs for some bit. Uh, so uh, logging extra.wid level is a um, helper that just uses the level, uh, level override logger um, in order to override the level setting. Um, so you can do that, and we can see that here it actually does print the debug logs just inside this block, um, which can be useful. So then we have the transformer. So the transformer is, it takes the log message and it transforms it to be a different log message. Um, so it's pretty useful because, um, well, you can use it to transform the log message, uh, which you can do things like, I can add some global state to all of my messages. So I might want to stick a timestamp on every single log message because I want to know when they came out. Um, I might want to set some configuration details so that if the operations person wants to know which of our systems is throwing this, every single log message might have the system name in it, which is good for debugging things fast, even if it is rather redundant. Um, we might want to truncate over long messages if it's just something spamming you with messages too long, but you don't want to completely discard them. It's a bit, a bit hacky, I guess, because you are losing information, which is a bit of a worry. Um, the other neat thing we might want to do is add context data from the logging declaration site. So we could imagine that my system was maybe looping over a number of models. I could say with logger and then use a transform logger that will insert the model name into every log message that's passed inside this loop. And then I could go to the next model and it would be different. Um, so that's a transformer logger. Uh, so one particularly useful use case of this is we can use it to add a stack trace to everything. Um, so the way we go about doing that is we declare a transformer logger that takes a function as its first argument here written with a do block. Uh, we'd pull out the stack trace with the stack trace function. Uh, for brevity, uh, I just happen to know that the first four frames are the logging system. Probably you'd want to do something a little bit cleaner than this, but um, we just keep the frames from number five till the end, and um, then we can do some pretty printing on them, and then we're just going to uh, add those to the keyword arguments and merge that all into the log message so that we return the message with the extra info added. And you can see printed out here. It's not the nicest pre-printing, I guess, but uh, we can now see this method called uh, quarks, then bar, then foo, which is the one we called. And then we can see all the normal stuff that appears at the bottom of your stack trace. Um, so that's pretty handy. Uh, knowing exactly where your log message is coming from is useful for like, debugging why this thing is happening. Um, so the T logger. Um, I mentioned right at the start. So this sends the same content to multiple loggers. So we can use it together with filters to apply a different transform to some of our inputs, but not to the others. Um, or we could use it to send a copy of our log messages to files or split the log messages up, maybe filter a group on data science, and then we have a list of data science problems that we've seen in production to give to our data science team, um, something like that. Uh, but um, yeah, that's what the T logger is. It just splits things up and creates duplicates. Um, I will mention there's no join logger, um, which will hopefully become apparent why. Um, we just don't need one. Um, so yeah, if we wanted to use the T logger together with the transform logger for all, we can imagine doing something like this. In come all of our messages, goes into a T logger, splits out two streams. Uh, one which filters on this is dep1, which is defined as checking if the group is dep1, uh, which then goes to the transform logger to add a stack trace, and then to our current logger, 
And the other one, which filters in the other one, which just goes straight to the current logger without adding the transform logger. So this is the notion of compositionality. Rather than defining one logger to do all these things, we're just going to find these each in turn, and we can plug the blocks together to do whatever we need. Um, so this is pretty useful. Like I always want the stack trace when I'm getting a deprecation error, because otherwise I can't tell where it's coming from. Um, yeah, so it looks like this. T logger with an early filtered logger, filter on dep one, and then calling the stack trace logger we defined on the previous slide. Otherwise, uh, yeah, early filter logger not is dep one, just going straight to the current logger. So you can see that we didn't need a join because we just used the current logger twice, uh, which happened before we overread the logger by setting the Google log argument. Uh, so the final kind of thing I want to talk about is syncs. Um, so the sync is where the log message ends up. Um, so conceptually, we have the idea of a pure sync. Uh, all it does is handle should message. It just always says true for should log. It always says below min level when you ask what minimum label, min enabled level is. It's pure. It just does the like, handling of the message. Um, because we want to use compositionality to do all the other filtering. Basically, all of the syncs in the wild, give or take a few, are impure. But that's completely fine, because we just set them to have very accepting settings. And it still works fine. Um, I guess it's worth thinking a little bit about the transform logger versus syncs. So the transform logger semantically changes the content of the log message. Uh, whereas the sync is ultimately responsible for how to present it to the user. So we can imagine things like writing to file versus adding some colors versus encoding in JSON. Um, you technically can do all that in the transform logger by just transforming the log message, but it's not really the uh, use as intended. Um, so there are three syncs, basically, in the standard library for logging. There's the console logger, which we all know and love. Um, which has all the fancy features, nice, pretty coloring. Um, there's the null logger, which uh, it just eats everything, gives nothing in return. Um, it's a black hole. Um, so when you want to turn off log messages entirely, you just say with logger, null logger, and it's all gone. Everything's gone. Um, finally, there's the simple logger. It's nowhere near as pretty as the console logger, but it is very simple. Um, all right, Claire says not to use simple logger, and I kind of agree. There's no particular reason to use simple logger over console logger. It's just better. Um, and simple logger still does some formatting, so it's not like you're getting something particularly pure. Uh, but yeah. Um, then we have some syncs and logging extras. So logging extras is not really about syncs, but we've accumulated a few over time because people are like, I want to put this somewhere. And they're like, this is somewhere. Um, they're not bad. Uh, so the file logger just wraps simple logger, and it just takes a file name. And the only thing it does special is forces immediate flushing after every message, just in case your whole system crashes. Um, I don't particularly see a reason to use this, because it's very short. But people seem to really like it. People don't like writing open to open a file stream. But you can just open a file stream and give that to console logger instead. Uh, we have the format logger, which takes a function to control how to render messages, um, which is useful if you want to change the formatting of the logger a little bit. Um, there's also a mini loggers.jl package, which has a broadly speaking similar idea, which is kind of cool. Um, and we have the date time rotating file logger, uh, which is a log that periodically rolls over to be in a new file, uh, which is useful if you've got a very long running process that you need to kind of keep track of. Um, there's also the log rollers.jl package, which accomplishes something fairly similar. Uh, finally, here's some other syncs. There are like a fair few of these, which is pretty cool. Um, there's the TensorBoard logger, which is a project I'm also involved in. It's kind of a competitor to TensorBoard X in Python. The idea is TensorFlow, eh, but TensorBoard, very nice. Um, so we can think of TensorBoard as being a logger which can accept numbers, which it can plot, or like vectors, which it can display as a histogram, or it can even accept sounds and all kinds of other things, like images to display. It's very rich, and the TensorBoard logger in Julia supports, I think, most of it. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, there's the terminal loggers, which is kind of um, an attempt to make something that's very similar to the console logger, but even richer. So it supports markdown. It supports progress logging. Um, it's nice. 
Uh, and then syslog.gel is a sync that uses the Unix syslog, which is where people expect logs to end up sometimes when they expect that. Um, yeah, so I showed a couple of examples there. There is a lot of examples in the logging extras readme. Um, I have stuff for truncating long messages, throttling messages based on time. Is that a good idea? I don't know, but you can do it. Uh, adding timestamps to every log message. There's a pile there. There's also uh, a pile more on the um, logging, Julia logging website, which Frederick made. Very good website, very useful. Um, you should, yeah, configure loggers. Um, so onto future work for logging extras and logging standard library. I have a lot of things here, but I'm not going to cover all of them because they're not that important. Um, so one question I have that I would like to get opinions on is uh, we have all these examples in the documentation of logging extras, and they just kind of live there. They could be in a package. Um, putting it in a package would be kind of useful because they're useful. Um, in particular, they us write tests, which is nice. On the other hand, they're very configurable, and someone might want to be saying it's similar but not quite the same, and configuring things that are that configurable is kind of annoying, unclear, like I have to expose all these options, that maybe it's better to just let people write the code to do the thing. Um, but yeah, so that is a saying I'm considering and would happily take people's opinions of later. Um, other things, we have no solution for deprecation warnings in Julia. It's an actual problem. Um, so in Julia 1.5, we made deprecation silent by default. This is because they're adding too much performance overhead. They added 10 microseconds, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but then it turned out that there was um, some deprecation from data structure at gel that was being used in like, the most core inner loop of jump. and. Yeah, that's really bad because it calls that thing like a billion times and it made jump unusable. Um, the other problem with having them was uh, the deprecation warnings often came from dependencies of dependencies. So it wasn't a mistake that I had made by using a deprecated method. It was some other package that I depended on had made a mistake by using a deprecated method. So often for the end user, uh, or someone relatively close to the end user, they don't want to have to go and fork some package they've never even heard of to fix these things. So we shouldn't really be displaying these things unless it was like my fault that it's wrong. Um, but how do we do that? So the first idea would be uh, to look at the stack trace. And then we can't check the top of the stack trace or the module field because that's where the DEPROM was declared. So that's no good. We need to go down a level or so on the stack trace to find where it was called from. Um, I have code for this in an issue somewhere. Um, but this has a huge problem. Calling stack trace takes 40 milliseconds, which is like definitely a long time. So we can't use that inside a filter. Even if we're like caching it, we still really don't want to use that. Um, maybe there's something smart we can do. The best alternative I've come up with so far is we only throw a deprecation warning if the module of the deprecation is something that you do depend on directly. This only takes 10 nanoseconds to check. However, it has false positives. I depend on this thing, but it could be that my dependency also depends on this thing, and I didn't call the deprecated method, but my dependency did. Um, maybe we're willing to accept some false positives in order to not silence all deprecation warnings. After all, up until 1.5, we accepted all of the false positives. So this could be like a good compromise to allow us to bring back deprecation warnings on by default that aren't completely gone. Or maybe someone has some brilliant idea that I haven't thought of that will let us have deprecation warnings back at no cost. Um, yeah, please uh, come talk to me if you do. Um, we can work on it tomorrow. Uh, other things, so group is a single value. So I mentioned before, we might want to use group to say, send something to the data science team. We might want to use group to say, decide if we should send her a pager alert. Um, but we might want to use group to say, actually, yes, send it to the data science team, but also send a pager alert. Uh, because group is just a single value, and a lot of the code expects group to be a single value, uh, we can't do that, because it's, that's two values, too many values. Um, furthermore, uh, logging extras has verbosity macros that I haven't talked about today, um, but they saw the verbosity in the group because the group is one of the only things available to the early filtered logger. 
Uh, so you can't use group at all if you're using verbosity macros. The group has already been set to how verbose to be. Um, so it's a problem that we only have one group, and we should think about how to change that without breaking everything. Um, other things, there's no distinction between data and metadata. Um, so often we want to talk to the logging system itself at the call site. We want to pass some metadata about what should be logged um, to the call site. So this has uh, emergently been done by setting keys. So the console logger takes a max log keyword to control uh, how many times a message should be logged. And then it filters that out before it prints anything. But if you use any other logger that doesn't have the max log keyword special case, doesn't special case filter it out, it will just print that in all your logs, even though it's metadata. Um, there has been a discussion that maybe anything prefixed with an underscore should be considered metadata and it will print it. Um, or maybe you can use a type for that. Uh, nothing has been decided that I've seen, um, and that seems bad. Uh, I think my last point, we have no tables.jail logging sync. We should definitely have a tables.jail logging sync, um, which would be something like if I have lots of values um, and I'm logging out some, like, imagine I'm Optum, for example, and I'm logging out, this is the current gradient, next iteration, this is the new gradient, this is how, uh, how much it's changed between the two steps. Um, it'd be great to like, stick those in a logger that's backed by the tables.jl interface, and um, then we can call uh, like csv.jl or arrow.jl to dump that into a file, or if you want to print it, we can use pre-tables.jl. Uh, pre Everything can be nice and lovely. Um, it'd be kind of a natural compa companion to TensorBoard Logger, which does the same kind of thing, but visually. Uh, I might work on this tomorrow, or maybe someone else wants to work on it, and I would be happy to help someone work on this tomorrow. Um, yeah, so to wrap things up, logging in Julia is pretty powerful, it's pretty configurable. You should use logging extras to configure the log plumbing for your system to meet your needs. Uh, logging in Julia could be better. Maybe you want to work on that. If that's interesting to you, that would be cool. Um, yeah, that's all I have. I believe I have time for questions now. Thank you, Frames. Um, we have about three minutes for questions. Anyone out there? Ian's going to point out something I've done wrong. <laughs> uh, great talk, thanks. Um, I was just wondering, would, would, it, would the ecosystem benefit from the logging standard library being an upgradable standard library? Yes, it would. <laughs> Claire says it would, and I'm inclined to agree with Claire. Um, in particular, like, we've had the discussion that maybe we should just stick logging extras straight into that standard library. Right. Um, yeah, terminal loggers probably wouldn't exist if we could have upgraded the console logger more easily. Um, um, while well, I'm walking to Nathan, I'll repose my question. Um, what, I, I think. Uh, logging during pre-compilation could be improved, and the reason I'm thinking about this more is because I'm using pre-compiled tools to pre-compile more code, which has more chances to break. How do you think we could maybe do something to log um, errors during pre-compilation in a way that would be accessible to the user and not we completely? We could do something like that. We could do some abstract interpretation to go and find out where all the log calls are. Um, and then remember that so we didn't have to compute that at runtime. One quick follow up. Do you think we should integrate that into precompiled tools or would that be uh, better as a separate logging library? I'd be inclined to just always do it. If it worked, I'd be inclined to just always do it any time a deprecation warning occurred. It's very complicated. I don't know how will I be in the presence of dynamic dispatch. Um, that's one to ask Shuhei about, I guess. Yeah. So I was wondering what happens with logging and distributed? So like if a worker kind of logs a message, is there any way to control how that gets plumbed in with all the other logs? I don't really know. Claire? <laughs> Sorry, I just come up here since I seem to be answering questions about logging. Um, 
Uh, yeah, so uh, probably blame me, because I think Simon Byrne did a bunch of work on this. I um, mean, for distributed, we should probably forward the logs, but we may want to do filtering on the nodes so that we don't overwhelm the master. Um, I think Simon did a bunch of work, and then I <coughs> failed to review it. So yeah, I don't know. That, that was, I think, the answer. <laughs> Okay. I mean, does that make sense? You think that's what we want to end up having, the logging coming back to the master? Do we yeah. send standard out back to the master? Do we send start a standard out back to the master? Uh, I don't know the answer. I think we do. Yeah. Um, the other option is, I mean, if you're doing a high volume of logging from nodes, um, you may want to write that directly somewhere, because otherwise you'll overwhelm the master process. So yeah, there's a few different options for that. We, I think we should have a standard way to send it back to the master process, though. OK, thank you. OK, thank you for these two talks on, on logging. Um, we're going to now change themes here to a series of lightning talks on quantum computing. Uh, <laughs> it's a little bit of a, a change. Um, so our first speaker in these quantum lightning talks um, is Fl uh, Fleming Haltorf, who is, I believe, a PhD student at the uh, Julia Lab here at MIT. Um, he's going to be talking about convex optimization for quantum control in Julia. Um, Fleming. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, today, as, I, as introduced, I'm Fleming, and today I want to talk a little bit about our recent work on using convex optimization to quantify the limits of quantum control and kind of how Julia played a unique role or a uniquely useful role in bringing that to practice. So I know there's probably a few experts in the room, but to those that don't really know much about quantum control, um, let me try to introduce at least the idea for as to why quantum control uh, and the limits of uh, the performance of quantum control matter uh, in the world. So I, I think the easiest way to recognize that is to uh, recognize that quantum control lies at the heart of a lot of quantum information technologies. So uh, think. Take, for example, quantum computing. One way to view a quantum computation is as a, as a very carefully designed, deliberately controlled evolution of a quantum state. And as a consequence, the, uh, you know, the speed and accuracy with which we can control quantum space, uh, states put a limit on the capabilities of these technologies. And if we want to evaluate those uh, potentials adequately, it ought to be useful to study and quantify the limitations of uh, quantum control. So that motivated us to build a convex optimization-based framework, specifically some of Square's programming-based framework, um, that allows us to put hard limits um, on the, or compute hard limits for the performance of uh, quantum control uh, for quite a wide range uh, of problems. So, and uh, if you're familiar, those really extend, in a sense, the, the uh, you know, known quantum speed limits by incorporating into addition, in addition to uh, fundamental physics, also technological constraints and, uh, you know, spe system-specific information because in practice, the last thing that we're really being limited by is fundamental physics. Um, and also from a practical perspective, these bounds uh, can be useful because they uh, can serve as witnesses of fundamental limitations. Um, they can certify optimality of heuristically derived control policies or control sequences, um, say, obtained via local optimization or machine learning, um, or even flat out serve as uh, performance targets. So here, uh, what's shown here is an example of the type of problems that we uh, wanted to look at, and that is a qubit in a cavity that is subjected to a continuous measurement setup, in this case, homodyne detection. Um, then this is hooked up to a quantum filter that allows us to kind of get the state uh, conditioned on our measurements, and then there's a feedback controller that actuates this uh, qubit here to do uh, what we want to do. And in this case, that's to kind of maximize the average fidelity, which means in this cartoon here, to have the state be as close as possible to the North Pole. Um, and what we want to ask is, can we put a limit on how close we can keep this um, if all the stars align to the North Pole? Um, right. So on a more abstract level, we consider quantum systems that are described by the Belovkin or quantum filtering equation. Um, so we do allow for continuous measurement, as in this example here. Um, uh, so to that enable feedback control, but if you like open loop control, that's no problem. You just drop the measurement, and then this equation just 
simplifies or degenerates to the familiar von Neumann or Louisville master equation. Um, we also assume a quite uh, prototypical uh, actuated Hamiltonian form of our control system. Um, and what I should mention also is that we allow for uh, technological constraints such as bounds on the control drives with which we can actuate our system, or even more complicated constraints such as constraints on the state. Uh, think of uh, a certain, uh, a limited amount of, of probability mass that can escape out of the logical subspace of a qubit, for example. Uh, we can constrain that as well. So in here again, in a, in a formal setting, uh, what we want to do is put a bound on what is the, the best possible performance that we can achieve, which is characterized by this optimal control problem. It actually turns out we can combine ideas from dynamic programming and uh, sort of uh, uh, convex optimization to do quite that. And the key insight that we leverage here is that the optimal control function, which is of course encodes the solution to this control problem and therefore is really hard to compute, um, is characterized as a infinite dimensional linear program, so a convex optimization problem. Um, and what this convex optimization problem seeks to do is kind of find a smooth function which underestimates this value function everywhere and is as close as possible to the true value function at the initial time of that control problem. And of course the value function encodes the optimal value of the control problem at its initial time, so therefore you get by construction a lower bound. And the key thing is you can kind of do this without knowing what the actual value function is. So what is relevant here is that um, this is a convex problem, but it's infinite dimensional. So we can't actually solve it directly. Um, what we take advantage of then is the nice structure of the quantum control problem. So we can apply the moment sum of squares hierarchy and instead, in, instead of looking for any smooth function that underestimates this value function, we can just look for a polynomial uh, up to some fixed degree d to underestimate this value function. And actually that turns out using sum of squares techniques uh, to be equivalent to a semi-definite program. And that has several advantages. On the one hand, we have a range of semi-definite programming solvers available um, to solve these types of problems. And on the other hand, we not only get a bound on the control performance uh, by solving these problems, but also we get, a, as a byproduct, a polynomial function that kind of looks and talks like a value function because it, the idea is for it to approximate the value function well from below. Uh, and that can inform controller design, and I, I'll show you a manifestation of that later. Um, another nice thing is this is kind of by construction a hierarchical, uh, has a hierarchical structure. Um, so that means I can just increase the degree of my uh, polynomial uh, and get a better bound. Of course, the problems then become harder and more expensive to solve, but at the end of the day, um, that is in practice desirable because I can trade off more computation for higher quality bounds. And you can even show under certain regularity conditions, this is consistent in the sense that you get arbitrarily good bounds uh, in the limit. So how is Julia uniquely useful for this? Um, I would say the main reason is it's really rich uh, optimization ecosystem, which is perfectly suited for this kind of thing. In particular, SummerSquares.jl deserves a lot of credit, which allows very easy setup of these SummerSquares programs and then translates them automatically in the equivalent sem semi-definite programs, which then can be pushed to your solver of choice through the MathHub interface. So all we had to do is write kind of or expose a high level interface that allows us to uh, specify our control problems um, in a symbolic form on the back of these like nice symbolic modeling tools in Julia. Um, and then all these bounding problems can be generated automatically uh, without understanding much uh, that's going on. So, and the last thing I want to show you is uh, how that can be useful in practice. So here, I want to go back to this qubit example I showed in the beginning, um, where we want to compare two different measurement setups. So you can either do feedback with photon counting or homodyne detection, which are two different technologies. And you can comp compute the bounds on the per best performance uh, that you could expect from a controller using these measurement setups. And there's three points I want to make. The first one is even for low degrees of this polynomial, you get non-trivial bounds. So the trivial bound here is one, um, but even for low degrees, they are you know, meaningfully removed from one. And the second point I want to make is as we go through the hierarchy of these uh, bounding problems here, the bounds turn out to be extremely informative. In particular, we constructed a, a heuristic controller um, actually based on these approximate value functions, which achieves a fidelity of 77.5%, and 
and this bound certifies that kind of God can't do better than 78.5%. Um, and yeah, so, so that's uh, of course a strong statement if you go to your boss and say, I have a good controller. Um, and the last point I want to make is that this is actually kind of a computational proof that homodyne detection in this setup is strictly su superior to photon counting because we have a controller that achieves 77.5%, whereas photon counting, we can at best hope to do something like 68%. Um, and yeah, with okay. that, I'd like to thank you. Um, for I think we have time for one question, um, maybe as we transition to the next speaker. Uh, Emmanuel, if you're here, you could start getting set up. Um, Yeah, I want to follow up on that one too, but I'm not. I'm just going to ask, um, you might have said this at the beginning, but how does this scale with like the dimensionality of the underlying system? Uh, not as well. I mean, it, it's tied to dynamic programming. So as such, uh, it's, it's really limited to smaller problems. I think the biggest one that we have done is like state preparation for two qubit systems. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, is our next speaker here? Okay. Please. Um, we could do maybe one more question while we're getting set up. Oh, okay, follow up. Did you try any other optimal control solvers for getting these fidelities or just this method? I mean, the, the, the point, uh, first of all, this is closed loop. So like optimal, I, actually you can do this for, for, you know, local optimal control if you wanted to, um, like open loop stuff. Um, and the, the point here is to just quantify or certify global optimality. And everything out there is just like, okay, I, I do like gradient based optimization, which is like, gives you no certificates on what you get. So uh, no, because that wasn't really the, the point of this uh, endeavor. Well, I might have something that could uh, to challenge your god on this one, so we could talk afterwards. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker uh, is Emmanuel. Um, I believe you are a postdoctoral associate, um, also in the Julia Lab here at MIT, and uh, I guess you're going to be giving us another quantum talk. Uh, the title is Automating the Composition of Machine Learning Interatomic Potentials in Julia. And also, since this is a lightning talk, if the next speaker is here, please come down and um, get ready to go. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the composition of machine learning the atomic potentials in Julia. Uh, this work is part of the Seismix uh, project uh, that seeks to advance the state of the art in predictive simulations connecting the quantum world and the machine learning world and the molecular dynamic world with the state of the art programming uh, languages, compilers, uh, HPC abstractions, and certain modification, so on. Thank you. Um, in material science, there are problems that require a large amount of computations, like the hypersonic uh, flows mentioned in the slide. This um, kind of simulation can take several months to complete, and within the simulations, the computation of the interatomic forces are a bottleneck. So accelerating force calculations is a must if you want to address large systems. We can use first principle physics to do this, but it's very expensive. So there are surrogate models that provide accurate and fast approximations uh, to these uh, force calculations. These are called interatomic potentials, or in the recent years, machine learning interatomic potentials. One way of describing these potentials is through uh, these elements here. On the one hand, we have the data, and we are talking about the atoms' positions, the atoms' type, uh, the geometrical parameters, the energy of each, each system, the forces associated to each atom, uh, and this data will be used to fit the model. And on the other hand, we have uh, the model itself that is composed by a set of descriptor functions that are uh, based on the configura at atomic configurations and how we link these descriptors to compute the energy of a system and through the energy, the forces. 
uh, in the atomic cluster expansion, for example, a linear combination of these descriptors is used to compute the energy of a system, but also we can use uh, another approaches, non-linear approaches. We can use a, a feedforward neural network, a graph neural network, et cetera. From all this complexity emerge a plethora of combinations that, uh, uh, between data, between descriptors, uh, how we link those descriptors, the hyperparameters of the models, etc. And we are interested in finding these combinations that exceed the state of the art in terms of accuracy and performance. So we are developing software for facilitating this task, for automating this task, and at the end of the workflow, provide a model can, that can be used in Julia, but also in other platforms. Julia can help in this task uh, in many ways, uh, among them, facilitating the development of um, software abstractions uh, by providing automatic differentiation for the computation of the gradients, the computation of the forces, by providing the machine learning abstractions that we need to define those models and the high performance uh, abstractions that we need to define to accelerate uh, the training and to compute the forces. Uh, among the software abstractions that we are developing, we are trying to develop uh, interfaces that simplifies this process of composing uh, classical um, descriptors like the ones of the uh, atomic cluster expansion with novel uh, nonlinear formulations. Uh, from fifth forward neural networks, very simple things to more complex like uh, graph neural networks. So the idea is to reduce the complexity of developing this, uh, these potentials. I also mentioned that uh, automatic differentiation is critical here because every time we need to change uh, a, a model, we need to compute the gradients of the model to compute the forces. So we need good uh, tools for doing that. Uh, and Julia provides very uh, interesting tools for that, like Zygote, like <clears throat> like enzyme that I are integrated uh, to machine learning frameworks, also in Julia, like Flux or Lux. Uh, we need to be careful if we want to uh, compute the energies, um, the gradients uh, analytically, because sometimes um, using automatic differentiation can uh, meet or exceed the performance performance of analytical versions. And by the way, uh, anal uh, computing analytical uh, solutions of these gradients is not an option here. Uh, when you need to change the model, uh, it's impossible in terms of productivity uh, uh, calculate the gradients each time you, you need to uh, evaluate a new model. Um, we are developing these uh, workflows that allow us to define these uh, potentials uh, define the parameters of the descriptors that we are going to use, uh, compute these descriptors based on the input data, uh, define the, um, the model that we are going to use, the, the neural network model here, define the loss function, and then perform the training in an easy manner. Uh, one focus of this work is reduce the complexity for that. We have also uh, another version with uh, GNS convolutional neural networks using graph neural networks, JL, that uh, we are experimenting with. The next uh, level is to automate uh, this process. And here we are defining the space of different combinations. We want to define the hyperparameters of uh, in this case, A's, we, we want to know which values can take the body order, the polynomial degree, the cutoff radius. We want to um, define which models are we going to evaluate, how many epochs, the size of the batches, which optimizer are we going to use. And uh, if we are going to perform data transformations, if we're going to reduce the redundancy of the data set, uh, which algorithm we, we are going to use. If we are going to generate more data, which algorithm we are going to use. If we uh, are going to use different optimization solvers, like random sample, Bayesian optimization solvers, uh, which are uh, those solvers? And after that, <coughs> many experiments will be executed in parallel. And at the end of the experimentation, uh, 
we will decide which is the best experiment based on the accuracy that was provided <clears throat> and based on the performance of the uh, interatomic uh, forces calculations. <clears throat> we hope this work help us uh, accelerate the development in material science by providing new, optimal, interesting, fast, and accurate potentials. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you. Um, again, as we switch speakers, um, is, we have time for one question. Are there any questions? Anyone? Last call for questions. OK, well, let's thank Emmanuel again for his talk. Thank you. Um, our next speaker, our next speaker is uh, Kangbo Lee. Uh, you are a CS student uh, at Cornell, I believe. Um, mm. And uh, I think I saw in your uh, description you like tacos and curry. Uh, so um, without further ado, um, he's going to talk about uh, WTP.jl, a library for readable electronic structure code. Great. Right. Thank you for the introduction. Um, the room is a lot more sparse than it was on the first day, but this, that's OK. Um, so I'm Combo. I'm a PhD student from Cornell. And uh, today I'm presenting this library for um, making readable and simple electronic structure libraries. Um, the story behind this is that uh, when I started my PhD, my advisor gave me two options for a project. Um, one of them is um, community detection, and the other one is this Consham density functional theory. And uh, for some reason, I thought density functional theory is easier. And so I, I think the reason was that uh, the formula that describes the theory um, is very simple. It's just two lines of formula. Um, but of course, it's not very easy to implement in practice. And I think the reason for that is because a lot of the complexity are hidden in the indices here. So here there's k and uh, there's r. And um, so if you are familiar with condensed matter, um, k is a k point in the first Brillouin zone, and r is a point in the unit cell. It doesn't matter exactly what they are, but uh, they are not integers. And that makes this, this uh, two lines of formula quite difficult to implement. And so later on, I, I, focused, on, I focused my research on this thing called uh, localized one-year functions. And there, I encountered the same problem. You have um, two lines of formulas that, uh, that looks very simple, but then you have this shenanigan of k and r and b that uh, there's a lot of headache to deal with. And so I, I learned a bit more about electronic structure later on in condensed matter. And it seems that this is a, a, a recurring theme. Um, it's a problem that happens all the time. And for example, if you look at barrier phase and barrier curvature in, uh, in the context of electronic structure, it's the same problem. Um, very simple formula, but uh, complicated to implement. And uh, that happens even for simple spin models as well. Um, so if you have a nearest, nearest neighbor coupling uh, Hubble model, you still have this uh, difficulty with implementation. And in, I think that's part of the reason why people like 1D chain of spins, because once you, you, you have a general uh, higher dimensional model, you have to deal with these indices, and, and they're quite difficult. So that's the motivation behind this work. Um, the, the subscript in the theory is, um, is a very complicated part. Um, but if we were to imagine that uh, uh, these indices k and r were just integers, uh, then you have the objects such as u and k r. Um, it would just be a simple tensor. And within Julia, you have excellent packages like itensor and Tulio and the tensor operations. And um, at that point, the problem is a lot easier. So that, that, that motivates this package. Uh, so that's WTP.jl. Um, it provides an attraction for a point on a non-orthogonal and periodic grid. And uh, what this, uh, this basically describes what sort of object K and R are. Um, 
And uh, to give you some example of uh, non-orthogonal and periodic grid without explaining uh, the details because of time, um, if you're familiar with the brilliant zone, that is a non-orthogonal and periodic grid, and uh, also the crystal lattice. So if you uh, if you did material science, then you have this crystal, crystal lattice that's also non-orthogonal and periodic. And then if you look at the unit cell, and uh, if you define a wave function on the unit cell and in, uh, with some sort of discretization is also an instance of this type of grid. And then there is the reciprocal lattice. Um, uh, and so the, the, the first two, so uh, th these are for different uh, grids that are commonly used in electronic structure, but uh, uh, the abstraction that describes them uh, can be exactly the same. And in fact, the first two grids and the second two grids, they, they contain exactly the same information, just in different, uh, uh, different, uh, different form. Um, so to deal with this, WTP provides some abstraction. Um, so we, 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 want to have, uh, we want to have this point on a grid to, to behave like a subscript so that you can write down expressions like this, right? You, you have some sort of uh, wave function and you can index it with, uh, with K and R. And simultaneously it has to behave like a, a vector in 2D or 3D and, or more, um, so that you can do things like finding the nearest neighbor. And then uh, you also have to support this periodic boundary condition uh, to have the right physics in electronic structure for example, this ohm-class scattering in the context of uh, in, if you're in the momentum space. Um, and in the end, it also has to support uh, non-orthogonal basis so that you are not restricted to uh, uh, cubic unit cells or square unit cells. Um, so- Are you speaking directly into the mic, please? Yeah. Um, so here is a, a little demo of uh, the, how we, what these abstractions look like. So if you are starting with, uh, uh, so this is the, uh, the, uh, the lattice for graphene. It's a hexagonal lattice. So each gray box is a unit cell. And uh, these A1, A2, they are the, uh, the, unit, the, the basis vectors. And so you can create the grid given these two, given A1, A, A2, these are the, the basis vectors. And then you tell it how many replication you want for the unit cell. And so that gives you this crystal lattice. And because the crystal lattice describes the same information as the brilliant zone, we have a procedure that gives you the brilliant zone from the, uh, the crystal lattice. And um, so a, a grid is really a collection of grid points. So you, it should support, uh, it is basically iterable. Uh, it supports the iterable interface. So you can get a grid point by indexing a grid to get this, uh, to get a K point. And because it's iterable, you can also map something on it so that you, you have a function or a tensor defined on a grid. And here is really where the, the abstraction is. So if you have this sort of a function on a grid, you can use a grid point directly as the index. And uh, this sort of notation allows you to abstract away the, uh, the fact that k is not an integer. And underneath what it's doing is just, it has a, there, there's a procedure that converts this uh, grid point to an integer and they just index the underlying array with it. And, um, and um, so the other abstraction is that uh, the grid point also has to be um, a vector, so it should support uh, basic arithmetics so that you can do things like finding your nearest neighbor if you want nearest neighbor coupling. And then you have this, uh, you should be able to find the Cartesian coordinates and, uh, of, the grid, of the grid point. You should also be able to get a grid point from the Cartesian coordinate given the brilliant zone, uh, given the grid as the context. And the last thing is that uh, uh, it should support periodicity. So if you have, if your arithmetic takes you to a point outside the grid, it should be able to detect that it's overflowing and uh, you can reset the overflow to fold it back into the, let's say, first brilliant zone. Um, so that's 
uh, test the package. And uh, so what we did after that is that uh, we implement this as cdm.jl. And that's our localization uh, package. And uh, he basically, so this is a code snippet from that package that implements these two lines of central equations in the theory of localized one-year functions. And you can see it's basically five lines of code. And this used to be uh, 300 plus lines of Fortran code um, in this famous package called one-year 90. Um, so the take home message is that uh, um, uh, electronic structure code can be simple if you have the right, uh, can be greatly simplified if you have the right abstraction for the subscripts. Um, and uh, so this is my email, and any feedback on this is very welcome. Uh, that's, that, that's everything. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Kangvo. Um, is there a question? Uh, um, to my best knowledge, this one year function is usually not unique, right? Uh, so, how do you solve this uniqueness of your uh, one year functions? And did you try to reproduce those uh, one year function results back into? Uh, into a Fourier transformation and compare with DFT results? Um, so the uniqueness is something called the, the maximally localized one year function and it's called maximally, but it's not really maximally localized. There is no proof for that. Um, but basically you, you define objective function and you minimize that objective function with respect to the non-uniqueness you have to make it unique. and. Uh, that's what one year ninety does, roughly speaking, and that's what uh, what we are doing. Okay, thank you. Right, thanks. Okay, and uh, we have our last speaker of this session before the closing ceremony. Um, this is uh, Haina Wang. Um, Haina is uh, coming to us um, from Princeton, where she is a graduate student in chemistry. Um, she previously had a bachelor's degree. Um, Chemistry and Mathematics from uh, oh, the National University of Singapore. She's going to be talking to us about inverse stat mech, um, extracting interactions from materials spectra. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you. Okay. Oh, um, I'm a grad student at Princeton University. I do theoretical chemistry. Oh, I basically do molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo simulations, but I also do the inverse problem. So um, we will look and uh, we'll see in a second what that means. So this is my GitHub handle. Cool. So firstly, I'd like to acknowledge my advisor, Sal Tokato, and our collaborator, Frank Schlinger, and everyone in the Tokato lab, as well as NSF, IES, and, Ju and Julia, yay. Uh, I mm, started to program in Julia since last year. I immediately fell in love with it. Uh, so it's, uh, as we say, it, you, it works like Python, but it runs like C. So it's perfect for molecular simulations. So the motivation of this package and my work in general is that in chemistry, we want to design structures at will. So statistical mechanics is the bridge between microscopic and macroscopic worlds. So in the microscopic world, you have microscopic interactions, how the mo molecules are repelling or attracting each other. And in the macroscopic side, we have pressure or number density or average energy and so on. So StatMac goes from microscopic to macroscopic because we have the interaction and we want to know the pressure, we just do a simulation. And uh, what I'm doing is the reverse prob inverse problem where we have a desired pressure, a desired mechanical strength, a desired conductivity. So how do we get to know what the particles are doing microscopically? So the main characterizer that I'm looking at is called the pair correlation function. And that's commonly used to describe microstructures. It just means how two particles, if you look at each two particles, how they are correlated. So for example, in this picture, um, we have a lot of particles. 
And for every two particles, we can ask what is your distance? What's the distance between these two particles? And after we have asked all the pairs of particles, we can do a histogram. And we add a bunch of, oh, sorry, we multiply by a bunch of constants, and then we get this G2. It means correlation on the two body level. And you can see it has um, an exclusion region where no particle get that close. But after that, it has a peak. It means a lot of particles are on the first coordination shell. And then it has another peak. That's the second coordination shell. So this G2 function tells us how particles are correlated on the two-body level. It's computationally simple. It's experimentally available via scattering. Uh, so that's in the Fourier space. And it's important in liquid models. For example, if we integrate the pair correlation function, we get like, how many particles are in my, uh, are my neighbors at that distance. And we can also get the pressure from that. So the G2, the doppelganger in Fourier space, if you just do a Fourier transform of this thing, the H tilde is the Fourier transform of HR, and HR is G2 minus 1. So if you just do that, you get the scattering pattern. That's what we call the structure factor. So the structure factor is what we see when we shine X-ray onto the material. On the left-hand side, we have the structure factor of a square lattice. So everyone is sitting on integer places, I and J. And the second picture is the structure factor for triangular lattice. And then the third is a quasi-crystal. So it has rotational symmetry, but no translation symmetry. And lastly, we have a structural factor for a liquid. So that's all smeared out. There's no black peaks. So some key questions in StatMac. Uh, how to improve the forward simulation and inverse StatMac to achieve more accurate results? And self-assembly is what we call inverse StatMac, because we want to. Uh, we, we want to achieve a certain pair correlation, and how do we get the intermolecular interactions? So realizability. So that's like, suppose I just doodle some function, and I say this is the pair correlation function of some material. So why do you believe me? Can you realize that doodled pair correlation? And next, degeneracy. So can different physical systems have the same pair correlation? For example, if they have the same density, they definitely don't have the same other structures. So what if they have the same pair correlation? Can they have different three-body correlations? So this, uh, our package, inverse.mac.jl, provides tools to help researchers answer these questions. Right. Well, explanation on the logo. <laughs> so, uh, I think everyone, if you know some StatMac, you have seen this formula a million times. So KB is the Boltzmann factor, T is temperature. And this factor is, uh, it appears frequently in StatMac to make energies dimensionless. So this thing has a dimension of 1 over energy. And uh, it also, it's also an inverse formula, so that echoes the theme inverse StatMac. So why using Julia? Because it's so easy to write. So in Julia, uh, in any molecular dynamics, we want to simulate particles in periodic boundary conditions. And we want to know the distance between particles in a periodic boundary condition. For example, if the US is in a periodic boundary condition, then California will be close to New York, because it's on the other side. If you go to the left-hand side, it will come from the right-hand side. So this thing is, I used Java before, and it took 10 lines at least. And in Julia, it's a two-liner. And also for another example, uh, in simulations, we want to know what neighbors of a particle is uh, are. So we assign um, to each particle a cell, the cell where the particle resides in. So that's a little simulation region. And if I write in Fortran or Java, it's like 50 lines of code. And you have to write a separate code for each dimension. And in Julia, because we have the function broadcasting, and we can add this dot, dot, dot to be in 2D is I and J, in 3D is I, J, K, in 4D is I, J, K, L. So you don't have to worry about dimensionality. So this code is just uh, in five lines. I can implement the cell list. Oh, great. And package features, they are on the documentation. So uh, the main overview is we have equations that help us to take in 
target G2 or target structure factor, and it helps you to approximate what kind of interactions are behind these structures. An uh, austin zenic equation I will explain later. It's an uh, uh, approximation. But then we have other precise algorithms to help us find the precise interactions behind these pair correlation functions. Also, if you don't want to know what the interaction is behind, you just want to see a configuration corresponding to the desired structure factor or desired pair correlation, you can also do that. And I think I can go to the tutorial. So as a precursor, I don't know if I have much time, you can do Monte Carlo simulations. That's the forward problem of StatMac using the inverse StatMac uh, package. So we can create a box that's random at first. We can compute pair correlation function. Because it's a random box, the particles are random. There's no correlation between the particles. So G2 is fluctuating around 1. It's fluctuating because it's a finite size system. So there's always some noise. If you do the Fourier transform, you can get the structure factor. And then we can do a simulation under the Lena Jones potential. We can define it with the parameters. Then we visualize the box again. The particles become much more ordered. Okay. Then we can also create an ensemble of 300 boxes in a canonical ensemble. And we average over their G2. It's look like this. And S of K, like this. So now the inverse stat map is if you just know this G2, you know this structure factor, how to get back to the Lena Jones potential. So the flagship algorithm is what we have published last year. Its uh, idea is quite simple. We start to simulate under a gas potential with an initial gas parameter A. So for example, in the Lena Jones, we can say the potential is Lena Jones, so 1 over 12. 1 over r to the 12 minus 1 over r to the 6. But we want to determine the best parameters to parameterize this thing. So we do a simulation to obtain the simulated G2 and S under the initial gas parameters. Then we can compute the loss function. So what is the difference between desired and simulated G2 as well as the structure factor? Then we can do the automatic differenti differentiation to the, of the loss function on the potential parameters. So, uh, you, you may wonder, because this psi is a stochastic function, it, you have to do simulation to get G2 simu and S simu. So how can you easily do automatic differentiation? Well, that's where some theory comes in. So it, because we already had the configuration, the previous configuration, so a lot of snapshots of our systems. So we can actually estimate the loss function at some different parameter, are different but close to the previous guess, by reviewing those configurations by a Boltzmann factor. So that's how we predict that the pair correlation function will evolve as we change the potential parameters a little bit. So for example, the next G2 simu at that perturbed par potential parameters will be in the previous G2 at each configuration, but given a different weight according to the energy change before and after the parameter change. So now this loss function is defined as a deterministic function to the parameters. And we can do BFGS to optimize the parameters. But at some point, the noise of the G2 will become too large that the loss function becomes large again. So that's when you know you have to do another round of simulation to get another round of boxes to do the automatic differentiation again. So here's the documentation of this function, optim parameterized spot. So it has some compulsory parameters, my initial guess, my potential form, dimensionality, number density, and your target G2, target S. And all the others are simulation details that we have default values for you, but you can change them by yourself. So here's an example. So we start by defining our target G2 right here and target structure factor. And we define some initial guess. And we run the program, optimize. So it's simulating. Firstly, it wants to simulate, to, and then it samples your configurations to generate an ensemble. And this is the first step. Guess G2, guess S. 
and then it's doing automatic differentiation and uh, uh, BFGS to, to optimize the parameters. So we start with, I think, two and three. And now, uh, just with first iteration, it's already getting to the true values for closer to the true values four and four. So we do another round, and it's getting closer to four and four. And just in three rounds, in four rounds, we get to 3.8, 3.8. So that's pretty close. So this is mm, by the fastest inverse algorithm for liquids so far. So we are proud of it. And uh, note that it captures both short-range correlations in G2 and long-range correlations in the structural factor. However, caveats, it does not apply to states near phase boundaries because we have a little theory about reviewing the configurations with the Boltzmann factor. And this approximation kind of breaks down near the phase boundaries. And also some programming detail. The default BFGS in optimum.gl does not work if the first, in the first step the gradient is too large. So we will try to fix this problem in future releases. Now, if you don't want to do simulation, we just want an approximation of the potentials. How do we do that? Well, we have another theory for that. They are called austin zenick equations. They are integral equations that relate the pair statistics to pair potentials. And with some proper closures, you can choose from these four. It gives you the potential given your target G2 and structural factor. So we can run this function, Austin Zenic v, v, with different closures. Okay. And as we can see, with the previous G2 and S given to the Austin Zenic V, we can, uh, for some closures, we get pretty close to the actual Lena Jones. So, for example, for the hypernetic chain HNC, it looks really like a Lena Jones potential already. So once you get that, you can get your initial parameters, and then you can run the previous Toccato one to get the precise parameters. And next, there's another algorithm called iterative Boltzmann inversion. It doesn't use parametrized potentials. It uses bin-wise potentials. So for each uh, distance value, you give it a different potential value. And this is commonly used in the polymer and the biology community. So I have implemented that algorithm too. So the idea is also simple. Start simulating with the initial being the potential. And you compute the ensemble average G2. And the next guess potential will be the previous one plus the difference between the potentials of mean force. That means the log of G2 so before and after the first simulation and we repeat until convergence is reached. So I was running this program, and it's still waiting, and gave me an error message because I messed up with, <laughs> with the positions of the arguments. So this one doesn't count, and I will give you another example on my GitHub. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, this one, so iterative Boltzmann, you start with your initial gas potential, and dimensionality, number density, and this uh, your target pair correlation function. Okay. And it's running simulations. Do, 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 do. Gives you G2. And it gives you, it prints out the initial potential. The initial potential is just a zero everywhere. And it tells you what's the arrow between the target and the, between your simulated and your target. And that's uh, next round. That's G2. And now the potential is much closer to the Lena Jones. You can see it's very big at small distances. It means the particles are repelling there. And then it attracts at intermediate distances. So particles are attracting there. That's why the energies are negative. OK, so the, for the next round, the arrow is only 0.3. So it gets lower and lower. Then I interrupt it, so <laughs> it gives me a huge error message. Advantage is fast, and limitations, it only targets G2 and doesn't target uh, the long-range correlations embedded in the structural factor. And also, it uses bin potentials. It's prone to noise if you have simulation noise in your G2. So that may get transferred into the optimized potential, and it gets propagated. 
But both are fixable, although they are not in this package yet. I will add the fixes to the future releases. So to fix the first one, we just use a parameterized potential, but we use the same idea of iterative Boltzmann. And for the second thing, you can yeah, embed both G2 and S. We just use other closures than the potentials of main force. So for example, yeah, we have many other closures. So the potential of main force only depends on G2, but the other ones, they depend on the structure factors too. So as long as we embed bo both of them, we should get a better result. So this is actually called Iterative Austin Zenic Inversion, published by Michael Heinen in 2018. Okay. So, yeah. so finally, if you don't want to care about the interactions between our particles, we just want to see what the configuration looks like given a G2 target, then we can use this reverse Monte Carlo algorithm. That's uh, very, very simple. You just do a simulated annealing optimization to find configurations that matches the target. So start with a random configuration, and you have a fictitious energy. So uh, in each temp at each temperature, you move randomly the particles, but you throw out the uh, you throw out part of the moves where the energy gets larger. So the fictitious energy is the distance between your target and the current G2. Yeah. Okay, and then you decrease the energy to throw out more and more of the unfavorable upper energy moves, except only the lower energy moves, and it will get to the target. So it has, you can also try to tune Dimensionality, number of particles, and number density, and target G2. Uh, it should give you something. So I, I can only show you um, a part of how this program runs, because it's simulated annually. The slower, the better, always. So, so I just can I just show you two steps. So it gets an initial G2. That's just random. And at this temperature. And and it has an initial energy that's a bit higher. And after some equilibration, you throw out the up energy. The higher energy moves, you get a lower energy. So this one takes about 10 hours to <laughs> get to your target G2. But the good thing about it is you don't have to worry about whether my configuration, my G2 is physical. I just want to see if there are some point process that realize my G2. So future works, as I said, I will implement other closures for the Austin Zenic inversion. And I will also try multi-component systems and anisotropic potentials. So currently, the potentials are isotropic only. And they work only for a single component. But what if you have different species in your system? And I want to optimize that too. And lastly, that's my dream. You know? I don't want the particles at all. <laughs> if I just want to see how the pair statistic move as I change a little bit the energy, the potential energy between the particles. So can I just forget about implementing the particles themselves and just tweak the pair statistics? So that's about my package. And here is a paper just published last year where we implemented the Toccato one algorithm. So in that paper, we wanted to study the realizability problem. So given a doodled G2, can you find a potential that, such that under equilibrium, you get that target G2? So we considered the unit step G2. So no, no particle go between this exclusion shell. We, are, we have hard cores. But after that hard core, there's no correlation between our particles. So at zero density, this G2 is the G2 for the hard sphere potential. So infinite energy between the inside the hard core and no energy beyond the hard core. However, if you are at positive density and you still only have the hard core potential, then as we can see, it has a twiggly decaying tail in its G2. So we wanted to know whether this unit step G2 is realizable even at packing fractions greater than zero. 
Uh, and here's our result. We were able to find effective potentials using the inverse technique. And as you increase the density, the potential gets bigger and bigger. And we could get to packing fraction 1 over 4 in 2D and 1 over 8 in 3D. So that's it about my package. And I welcome any PR, any suggestions. And this is my GitHub. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, and in perfect time. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any questions? OK, so this works if your atoms, so to say, react only in terms of Leonard Jones potentials or some kind of similar potentials. But if you have like strong bonding, mm -hmm. um, you couldn't describe it like in terms of a classical um, multi-particle simulation. So could you extend this that you somehow take into account the electronic interactions like building in DFT and also doing AD on this or are there any plans? And the second question is, like for some materials you might have strong, also some other strong quantum effects. You could just, I don't know, do quantum Monte Carlo or something. Um, with this, but then using the same idea and getting to G2 and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. So for the first question, I think uh, we can implement also long-range interactions. So those are interactions in that whose volume integral blows up as you go to longer and longer distances. So we, were in, we implemented the e summation technique to treat those long-range interactions. And uh, you can also define your own forms of interactions instead of Leonard Jones. It can be anything. Uh, and for a second question, I uh, don't think we have that uh, the quantum effects at this time. So we are considering classical systems, but we could find the. Like if you give me a quantum G2, we can find the classical uh, system that mimics that G2. So that's one of our projects right now. Uh, Thank you. Are there any further questions for Heine? Thank you for the nice talk. <laughs> I have a uh, quite general question. So you mentioned that your model doesn't work well when you know near the phase boundary. Could you do a reverse engineering of your inverse problem that to say detect uh, phase transitions, or do you need a real defined G two for your model to work? Thank you. Uh, thank you for a question. I think what hap what's happening is our, all our. Uh, liquid, mod liquid theory models, such as you can reveal the configurations based on the Boltzmann factor, they kind of break down at the phase boundary. So that's, that is to say you tweak the potential a little bit, the G2 change completely when you are going from a, a liquid to a crystal. So uh, in that case, I would look into uh, theories just tuned for phase boundaries. So uh, they are native in, tre in treating uh, the huge sensitivity of the pair statistics on pair potentials. So this package cannot do that yet, but uh, I, be I certainly believe that there are good theories for phase boundaries. And, and we can use the same idea of like, par automatic differentiation to optimize the parameters. Right. Right. Thank you. OK, any further questions for Heine? We have a few more minutes left. Thank you. So this is like a static G2, but if you'd like take into account phononic contributions, could you just time resolve um, or do, do also do a free transform in time and get the frequency resolved, um, so to say, optimized um, correlation function? And uh, this is static G2 for yeah. this time, yeah. yeah. Uh, but like, would it be an idea to do the yeah, frequency so resolved. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, certainly. So, okay, and, and my first question actually was like if you have a singlet state, you can reduce the energy like of two atoms even though the distance stays the same. So this is something you cannot capture with a potential. So if you take into account entanglement, um, uh, yeah. it's like it, um, you cannot replicate it with a classical potential. That's what I wanted uh, yeah, to say. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a classical system. Oh. Uh, okay, anyone else? Uh -huh. 
for it. Okay, well, I want to congratulate you on being the last talk of the conference. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so hey. you handled that very well, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> And we'll move to the closing ceremony in a few minutes here. Thank you. Hey, ev hey everyone, we'll begin the closing ceremony in a few moments as the hall fills up.
is it? Hey everyone. Let's get let's get started or let's get things finished. Uh, thank you so much for coming to JuliaCon. We hope you enjoyed it. So the fun isn't over yet. We have a hackathon tomorrow, and we have social events tomorrow. So uh, for the hackathon, uh, it'll happen on the fourth floor of the Strata Center. So where the, the Kiva and the Star Rooms were, uh, and all that space in between, you know, that's where the hackathon will be. Uh, we, uh, you know, we, we set a tentative starting time of, actually not tentative, a final starting time of 9.30. So please don't be here earlier than that, because the committee needs to sleep. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, and yeah, so please please do come at 9:30. All of the Julia, you know, the core contributors and the core package developers will be will be there. They're happy to answer your questions, help you get into the Julia ecosystem, help you start using Julia packages. There'll be plenty of help and support around. There'll be little groups of people working on different ecosystems. Feel free to join those. I, every ecosystem, you know, is is you know would appreciate new contributors. Um, so that, the hackathon will be a lot of fun. And I, I remember at my first hackathon back when, I, I, I learned a ton. So please uh, do consider this. E and even if it's not just Julia, right, you can learn a ton about numerical algorithms and you know, other, all sorts of other expertise and, and discipline, um, disciplines at the, at the hackathon. So I'd encourage you to do that. Tomorrow, uh, we also have two social events. Uh, so. One social event takes you to the Museum of Science. Uh, is Torkel around in the, in the room by any chance? Torkel? OK, awesome. So Torkel is, is, your, is your point of reference. Uh, so uh, the, yeah, the tall Swedish guy. Torkel, just stand up. Yes, yes. So he, he's been organizing all of you into groups to take you to bars and restaurants in the area, you know, and. Uh, Talkle has sort of added a new dimension to JuliaCon, I think. Uh, so that's, that, that's awesome. Um, so anyway, Talkle will be, to, you know, uh, will coordinate groups going to either the Museum of Science. You, you need to pay for your own ticket, of course. Uh, and there's, in, there's another group organized by Katie Hyatt, Talkle, and Steve Kelly going on a bike trip of the local area. So if you like biking, then uh, Katie Hyatt, Again, Torkel, Torkel, of course, is the primary point of contact. And, uh, and Steve Kelly will take you on, on these bike tours. So look out for that as well. So that, that'll happen tomorrow. There, there is, what's that? Small carrier, yeah, yeah. there is rain. Yes, so, so we may or may not do something you want to take a account if you want to go by. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There, there, there's a threat of, a st there's threat of rain tomorrow. So please, please be aware that you know, the, the, you know, we might not be able to do the, the, the cycling event. But you know, again, for the latest updates, Torkel will actually will actually update a Google Doc, which I've been sending every day, by the way, uh, you know, to you know, to everybody register on Eventbrite. So if you just check that Google Doc, you'll get up to date information there. I think that might be the easiest way to communicate with everyone. Um, okay. So, what's the next thing? Uh, T-shirts. Yes. So T-shirts. Uh, 
we got a new batch of shipment, you know, new shipment of t-shirts today. If you haven't gotten a t-shirt yet, please do come see us. I mean, we've gotten extra mediums and larges. So if you haven't gotten a t-shirt, you know, please come and, uh, you know, obviously you guys, uh, you know, will get a t-shirt. Um, and uh, come here, come here, Tiffany. Yeah, okay. So the next and perhaps uh, one of the most important parts is the Julia Khan Community Prizes. And for that, I would like... So uh, if, uh, if, if Tim and, uh, and Curtis could come onto the stage to announce the winners, please. So this is really fun because there are so many amazing contributions in the community. It's fantastic to be rec able to recognize uh, a token of, uh, of, of these, a small subset of them with a small uh, uh, award, but it, it, it's one that really is a very meaningful thing to me to give out. And my only regret is that we you know, can't recognize all of the amazing contributions that happen every year. So, but. We always have outstanding nominations, uh, and I'm incredibly enthusiastic about the, about the winners this year. Um, we just heard a lecture on differentiation and why it's important and interesting. Um, the Julie ecosystem has uh, a long history of people who've contributed to automatic differentiation in the community and some really legendary contributions used by you know, probably a large fraction of the people in the room. Um, we had to make some choices, and one of the uh, sort of, let's say, uh, um, uh, new ones that emerged in the last several years has really, I think, taken the community by storm. And there was very, very broad consensus among the people submitting nominations. And so it pleases me greatly to recognize the work of William Moses and Valentin Chiravi on Enzyme. <laughs> Billy is sadly not here. Um, he is off in Hawaii talking to ICML. I will hand that over and convey the warm wishes. Thank you. All right, uh, for our next community prize, uh, something near and dear to our hearts uh, is uh, pkg.jl. We uh, all know that the Julia's package manager is probably one of the best out there in the language ecosystem. And yeah, we want to award uh, Ian Butterworth and Christopher Carlson for their work on PKG and package extensions. You'll see the two of us in the same picture now. And then for our final prize of the evening, we're giving it to someone who's worked tirelessly to contribute on so many different areas and in some very complicated uh, code to the Julia machine learning ecosystem. Um, uh, we award, give this award to Yingbo Ma. Boom.
thank you to Professor Tim Holy, Professor Alan Edelman, and Curtis Vogt for, um, yeah, for, for being judges for the community over year, year after year, of course. Um, what's the next thing? Um, uh, there are a few, you know, few people to thank. Uh, you know, so you should start, You should definitely thank them. So first thing is uh, the first set of people. Actually, I want to thank uh, every organization at MIT. So MIT ca Campus Activities Center, MIT AV, uh, mm, MIT, MIT Copy Tech, uh, uh, C Sale. All of these, all of these entities work together seamlessly. And actually, to be fair, the uh, the person who deserves a shout out for coordinating with all these entities. Because according to MIT, there's only one person who's organizing this entire conference, and that is Ray Kimmerer. Yeah, so I'd actually, on that note, I'd ask the entire committee to come up, please. Um, is everyone in the committee here? Please, please do come up onto the stage, and let's thank the committee. Please come. Avik. Avik. Come, come. Okay, we, we, we forgot to thank MIT Production. TIG. TIG. Facilities. Facilities. <laughs> awesome. Any other note? I think just announced the Julia Con like local. Yeah, okay. So, uh, the, yeah, and the very last thing, yes, please go now. <laughs> okay, the, the, I guess the, uh, you asked me? Go for it, go for it. So, so uh, um, I also want to thank uh, you know, Raj Rao, um, Ivana, and uh, Bernie Wang for uh, hosting ASC60, ASC 60, yes. uh, you know, co-locating it with Julia Khan. So, th thank you for putting up with all the confusion of, of putting these two events together, and not to mention. Uh, uh, yeah, Oscar. Uh, where, yeah, Oscar, Oscar Dow, yeah. uh, yes, Oscar. Oscar, and then the Simel uh, crew for co-hosting, uh, you know, the, their respective tracks at Julia Con. So this is this is actually four conferences uh, under one roof, and uh, that has been uh, you know, phenomenal. And the uh, very last thing we're about to say is, you know, what's better than one JuliaCon this year? Two JuliaCons. <laughs> so. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, everybody, and uh, and yeah, do keep a, keep a note on the date for the JuliaCon local Eindhoven, and uh, hopefully see a bunch of you there. What's that? Oh, the, the, the CFP for this is already open. Well, it's, it's relentless in the Julia world, isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah, so please do submit uh, your proposals to the Julia Korn local Eindhoven. Thank you. Okay, pull requests everywhere. Yay, pull requests. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did announce the hackathon details, didn't I? Okay, fine, another repeat. Yeah, let's repeat the hackathon. Let's repeat the hackathon details. Hack Please charge your laptops. Uh, and um, okay, so the hackathon will be on the fourth floor of the Stata Center, and uh, you know we'll have we'll have uh, charging ports and everything. But please make sure your laptops are charged so that you're at least through the beginning of the hackathon. Uh, please show up at 9:30, 9:30 on the fourth floor of the Stata Center for the hackathon. All right, thank you very much.